Good morning, everyone. I welcome to the second day of the conference. Um, we had a really, really good day yesterday on the first day of the conference. Um, we discussed a, a lot of important questions and uh, learned a lot of things uh, where we had discussions uh, about climate and health and how to connect that. Um, we also had a really good dinner, the ones that went to that one. Uh, we enjoyed good food and good company and good dancing. <laughs> So, uh, welcoming you to the second day, um, we will be looking forward to the first keynote panel um, section today on progress in health and adaptation across scales. So, I'm going to leave over to Catherine Bowen from University of Melbourne, who's going to share this session. You're most welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Henrik. Um, it's lovely to be here. I'm disappointed I missed the fantastic dinner last night. It's wonderful to see so many of you here so early. And we've got a terrific day lined up. Um, and it's just fantastic to be able to start with uh, such an incredible panel this morning. And we'll be focusing on progress in health adaptation in this morning's panel, and particularly looking at how this differs across different scales. So we have three wonderful women presenting this morning and what I will do is I'll introduce each speaker and all together and then we'll um, hear from each speaker immediately after one another and then we will open for Q&A. So we have until 10.30 this morning. I will keep strictly to time so we have enough time for our morning tea. So I'll firstly introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Halshka Gracik is a technical specialist on occupational health and sa occupational safety and health at the UN specialised agency, the International Labour Organisation, the ILO, in Geneva, Switzerland. So in this role, Halshka manages the ILA hazardous substances portfolio, which spans across all work sectors and occupations worldwide and assesses toxics, chemicals and waste along the life cycle of global supply chains. In addition, she supports a number of technical areas, including OHS risk assessment and prevention strategies, including those related to climate change adaptation and mitigation, and the promotion of a safe and healthy just transition for all workers. So a lot of different integrated components to focus on Halshka. Halshka also holds a master's in public health from the Johns Hopkins University and a PhD with a specialization in occupational safety and health, focused on the evaluation of novel and emerging OSH risks and hazards. And so it's just a wonderful um, to have you here, Halshka, with all of your um, specializations. So welcome, Halshka. Nextly, we have um, Dr. Alexandra Kashmirchak, and, and she coordinates the European Climate and Health Observatory at the European Environment Agency, the EEA. Alexandra has a particular interest in social inequalities in relation to exposure to climate change hazards and social justice in adaptation responses. She has a long experience in urban adaptation to climate change. Before joining the EAA, EEA in 2017, Alexandra carried out research at the University of Manchester and Cardiff University in the UK, focusing on assessing social vulnerability to climate change and the role of green infrastructure for human health and wellbeing. So welcome, Alexandra. And our third speaker today is Ida Knudsen, uh, who is an analyst in environmental health at the Public Health Agency of Sweden. So I don't think Ida travelled very far to be here today. Ida's area of responsibility include working with health in relation to the Swedish environmental objectives, conducting surveys to monitor environmental exposures and health outcomes in the population, and also to build knowledge on the impacts of climate change on health. In particular, Ida has worked with the health consequences from heat waves and took a leading part when developing the Swedish guidelines to heat health action plans. Since 2014, she's Sweden's representative in the WHO's working group, Health in Climate Change. Prior, Ida has been a research coordinator at Umeå University in the project 
socioeconomic analyses of the effects of heat waves on health as a basis for effective policy making in the public health field. So can I join can you join with me in welcoming our three speakers this morning? <clears throat> And I'd firstly like to welcome Halshka. Thanks, Halshka. You okay with this? Yeah, thank okay. you so much. Okay, thank you for the introductions. Good morning, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, thank you so much for the org to the organizers and especially to the wonderful host Hans, who taught us how to eat and dance last night. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you in Stockholm. Uh, so today I'll give you the perspective from the International Labour Organization and what we're doing across scales when it comes to adaptation to climate change. Um, so first, just to give you a brief introduction to the ILO, I think maybe some of you are not familiar with the ILO. It's a UN agency that is one of the oldest, in fact, the oldest UN agencies created in 1919. And the whole aim of the creation of the ILO was that there was a rapid period of industrialization in 1919 where workers were being exposed to horrific conditions, being killed, being maimed in factories, um, starting to produce globally. And so there was this organization that was created in order to ensure that there would be some kind of global entity looking after the social justice of all workers around the world. And to do that, the ILO has a very unique tripartite structure. So we're not like other UN agencies that only works with government ministries. We work with governments, so ministries of labor, but also with global workers unions, as well as employers organizations. And so bringing these three stakeholders together, we can really have a validated and balanced approach to standards for the world of work. So our mission is to create this decent work opportunities and also social justice around the world. And we really do that through the creation of international labor standards. So labor standards are legally binding global conventions that are ratified by our member states, our employers and workers to create this legislative framework for how to govern the world of work. A lot of it has to do with safety and health. Um, but we also expand to all other areas of world of work issues, the creation of enterprises, maternity protection, social protection, anything related to the importance of social justice in the world of work. So now moving on to climate change and specifically the impact of workers. So I'll be speaking about this vulnerable population. Um, and a few years ago, maybe we saw some of the headlines that started far away, Middle East and Qatar during the FIFA World Cup of workers dying. Over the years, though, it's gotten closer to home. So this year, the UPS incidents of workers dying during deliveries and the changes that were made in those policy areas. But even a few weeks ago, before coming here very close to home in Geneva, um, a few workers died during the heat wave in French vineyards. And so this is really coming to our doorstep and we see it now happening at a very fast rate. And so this is what's quite shocking uh, at the global level and especially where we sit in Geneva where we're trying to make these global policies. So before I get into more of the issues of heat stress, I just want to emphasize to everyone that when it comes to climate change, uh, and occupational safety and health, this is a multi-dimensional issue. It is not only related to heat stress, even though a lot of our adaptations are right now about heat stress. So in fact, the very first issue that brought us to climate change at the ILO was the impacts to workers that were being exposed to asbestos following the cyclone in Mozambique. Um, so that was um, a situation where there was a lot of debris and in the cleanup effort, workers were being exposed to asbestos without understanding that they were being exposed to asbestos. So we see that there's really a multi-dimensional threat and it's not only the heat stress that we need to focus on, even though today we'll be talking about that. So something that I think is really important to talk about is why workers are most at risk. So yesterday we talked a lot about different vulnerable groups and workers are very unique when we talk about vulnerabilities to climate change. We know that workers are exposed for longer durations and to greater intensities of heat and to different climate change impacts. They have increased metabolic heat from really physically demanding conditions. You saw, the, whoever saw the video yesterday um, from La Isla to see the really physically demanding conditions that many of these workers are working in. A lot of them are wearing insulated or impermeable clothing if they're working with pesticides, if they're 
these are images that we took in our field work, if they're working with dismantling toxic substances like the lead acid batteries you see at the bottom, there is a need for personal protective equipment, which is not always permeable and allows for breathability. Now, I think the most important is the fact that workers are in conditions that the general public can choose to avoid. So we talk about cooling baths or moving into air conditioned spaces, these kinds of things. Workers do not have that ability in many cases. I mean, we're talking about the real workforce around the world, the workforce that upholds our global economy. And 60% of those people are in informal conditions. They have no formalized uh, conditions of work. And therefore, they do not have the ability to say, it's too hot, I need to take a break, I need to go get an ice pack, I need to stop working. It's not a possibility for so many people. And that really lends itself to the fact that uh, they lack those frameworks of social protection and of safe and healthy working conditions. And it's important as well to recognize what we've seen from the, our research is that many workers don't um, specifically understand if they're undergoing heat strain until it's too late. And so that's something to really um, be cognizant of when we're talking about workers is that they often lack just the ability to understand that they may be very quickly in a dangerous situation by going from heat strain to active heat stress to heat stroke to heat exhaustion, et cetera. So I'll talk a little bit about the adaptation strategies that the ILO has been working on. And we work on three different levels at the international level, which trickles down, of course, to national policies and government implemented policies, which hopefully then also trickle down to ensuring that we have the management systems at the workplace level. And throughout all of the adaptation strategies, we always focus on the importance of social dialogue, bringing together those tripartite constituents to have a balanced approach to interventions uh, at these different levels. So let's start at the international level. I already mentioned a little bit about international labor standards. So these standards are created in this tripartite structure. So in Geneva, with 187 government representatives, uh, coming from all of the government representatives that, that you represent here today, they are in the room in Geneva with the workers, with the employers, creating these legally binding standards. They have a very strong supervisory system. That means when a country ratifies a convention, an international labor standard, they are supervised. So when they are not able to meet those aims, they are brought back to the ILO and said, and it's, it's shared then that you have not uh, upheld the requirements of the convention. So there is a strong mechanism for ensuring that labor standards are implemented. Now here it's important to emphasize that we have very specific conventions that um, lend themselves to adaptation strategies. We have uh, conventions about hazardous air quality when it comes to air pollution linked with climate change, measures to heat with uh, measures to cope with heat stress, as well as general conventions on occupational safety and health, which really highlight what workers' rights are when it comes to hazardous work environments. Um, there was a big change in the paradigm of international labor standards that happened last summer in 2022 during our international labor conference, where all of the global stakeholders uh, recognized that a safe and healthy working environment should be within the framework of fundamental principles and rights at work. So this means now that our two fundamental OSH conventions, Convention 155 and 187, are considered to be fundamental. This means that all governments around the world are obliged to ensure that workers have safe and healthy working conditions, whether or not they have ratified these conventions. So this is really critical because we've now moved, we have a paradigm shift now. We see that we now have a rights-based approach to safety and health. It's no longer a principle that we should aim to. It is an obligation to member states and it is something that can really assist us in making sure that workers are safe and healthy when it comes to climate change risks. Uh, another important outcome from this summer, from this summer's International Labor Conference, uh, where we had a general discussion on the just transition, there was a tripartite agreed decision to move towards um, some kind of standard on climate change. So this is really essential and we know that 
we have this global agreement that we need to focus on the health impacts. So the one concrete area that came out of this discussion uh, was that there should be a meeting, a tripartite meeting of experts to look at climate change and extreme weather events and their impact on the health of workers. So this is really a signal to the global community that we're moving towards global policy on climate change when it comes to the world of work. So now let's move to the national level, so how the international labor standards and the work that we do in Geneva trickles down uh, to national policies. We conducted a global review of OSH policies related to climate change to understand what ministries of labor are doing, what OSH institutes are doing to try to ensure health and safety working populations. We found that most national policies are concentrated in the European region and 70% have been identified in the last five years. So we really see this really quick move to national policies. And this is what really begs the question and why it's so important that I'm here with you and the research community is making sure that we have the evidence base to develop those national policies and make sure that we're moving in an evidence-based way. Um, we found that more than half of the national efforts were usually related to things like practical tools, risk assessment guides to climate change and workers, or things like strategies, and in certain cases, legal provisions. Uh, more than half looked at heat stress as the main impact of climate change for workers. And what was curious for us too is that we found a lot of examples of reactive policies. So for example, we had in Uruguay a situation where a worker was killed during a, natu um, a weather event working in, in, in the fields. And there was then a policy created to make sure that workers in the agricultural sector are protected from extreme weather events and that work stops when there's some kind of climate related weather event. And so we see a lot of these policies are in fact reactive to tragedies that occur. And we're hoping also with the awareness raising efforts we're working on that more of the strategies can be of preventative nature. So one uh, area of work that many national policies look at is the setting of maximum temperature thresholds and then changing how work can be conducted based on those temperatures. So here you see a different, the different types uh, of restrictions based on the temperature and what kind of work is then available to be done, whether that's high intensity work or lower intensity work, or if work needs to completely stop. So here I'll give you a specific example of what was done with the ILO um, following uh, workers' deaths in, uh, in Qatar during the hot working days. Uh, the ILO conducted an evidence-based investigation where we had one of the world's leading researchers on heat physiology, um, Dr. Andreas Globus, uh, sorry, Andreas Flores and his FAME lab, um, where they collected more than 5,000 hours of work-related data on workers' health and safety as well as their intensity of work. Uh, and the results from this investigation, from this very intensive investigation, led to a new government uh, decree, a ministerial decree in 2021, which prohibited summer work hours outdoors during the day. So there was stop, full stoppage of working hours during the hottest part of the day. That's one important outcome from the ministerial decree. But even more so was the awareness raising that came behind that investigation and also the movement towards the development of national policies. With the end of the daytime summer working hours, we also saw the need for, work, for employers to implement a risk assessment for their specific work site, for the specific work tasks. Uh, also the importance of health checkups for workers. And then a, um, a need for the employers also to provide certain things to the workers, things like cool drinking water, shaded rest areas, appropriate personal protective equipment that was reflective of the work that they were doing um, in regards to making sure that it wasn't also too bulky and impermeable. So now let's move to the workplace level and some of the adaptation strategies that we're working on with employers directly at the enterprise level, at the workplace level. Um, so yesterday we had a nice discussion during one of the, one of the sessions in the afternoon uh, about simple actions that, that work at the workplace level. And the truth is, is that when it comes down to it, there are very simple things that can be done to protect workers directly in the face of heat stress. And there's four things that we'd like to highlight. The first one is about 
yes, is about work-rest ratios, the importance of self-pacing when that's possible. It's not always possible. We see that in uh, sectors like construction, it's very difficult because you're working with a team and you have a specific amount of work that needs to be done. Um, but in certain sectors and in tasks, it is possible to have self-pacing and also the importance of having rest breaks, the minimum being 10 minutes per 15-minute increments. Hydration, very simple, very clear, but it's the most economically feasible and effective intervention strategy that we have, um, followed by mechanization and the importance of having also assistive tools when it comes to things like picking and agriculture and making sure that workers aren't just manually carrying everything, and the importance of clothing, light, breathable clothing, um, and making sure that there's a balance between the hazardous exposures that might be faced in the workplace versus the heat stress that might also uh, be impacting the worker during that task. Um, I'll go over quickly what we're doing in Mexico and Vietnam just to show you the heat adaptation strategies specifically that we're working on and to highlight here that we're not only looking at heat stress and the importance of training of course is essential but then we found here from uh, heat adaptation strategies in vietnam specifically the importance also of looking at psychosocial health of workers and knowing that climate change can directly impact the mental health of workers and increase their stress levels and increase different mental health outcomes and therefore looking at those specific areas can really help promote um, uh, behavioral change, but also working on mental health can help workers then promote their own physical health. So it's really an integrated strategy here. Okay, getting to my last points, um, the importance of social dialogue. Here, I really wanted to have this slide here to show you that, you know, for the last 10 minutes or so, I've been talking about the health and safety of workers. This is not just a question of health and safety for the workers. It's not just a question of human rights of workers. It's a huge question for the other part of our constituent group, which is the employers. Here you see the reduction in productivity that has been modeled by the, by the ILO. And we know that heat stress will lead to an equivalent uh, loss of 800 million full-time jobs by 2030. I mean, this is a huge risk for employers. What happens when they need to shut down a workplace for the day? What happens if they need to outfit a huge factory with air conditioning? Who is responsible for this? Who are the stakeholders that will really step up and make these changes? So here is where we see that heat stress and climate change is really a unique global challenge when it comes to safety and health and that it's going to bring those stakeholders to the table to discuss and to urgently develop the global policies that we really need. Um, so we see that this is really something that will shake up the world of work and will cause really urgent um, changes in, in the next, hopefully, very short future. Okay, so the last slide, just sort of wrapping up of what we talked about, that urgency to implement policy measures, but at the same time, not starting from zero, using the international labor standards that we've created over 100 years of work in terms of general protections of workers and responsibilities of employers, et cetera, to develop uh, frameworks that are really appropriate for climate change. We talked about the rights-based approach and making sure workers have those critical rights in the workplace, um, but also an integrated approach. I mean, here I'm talking about occupational safety and health, but it is part of health. It is part of this conference. And so we need to make sure that labor issues are also mainstreamed in those public health policies. Um, social dialogue provides that foundation, so making sure we bring all the actors to the table so we really have a balanced view to the policies that we're creating. And finally, that, that multi-sectoral approach. So coming here from the ILO, from ministries of labor, from workers' unions, employers' organizations, how do we make sure that we can work also with the environmental sector and with the health sector to make sure that we really have this integrated approach to making sure that um, there is a consideration of all vulnerable groups, whether they're vulnerable groups that are part of public health domains or vulnerable groups in the workers' sphere. Uh, there is really a need for us to be all talking together and integrating your research into global policies, such as those by the ILO. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Hauschka. Thanks, Alexandra. Good morning, everyone. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Many thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation. 
Uh, I would like to apologize in advance if I start coughing into the microphone. I'm recovering from a cold and I'm really conscious of this little guy here and <clears throat> I'll do my best not to deafen you with uh, my cough. Uh, what I would like to talk about is the progress in addressing climate change impacts on health in the European context. Both the progress that has been made, but also the progress that we are aiming towards, mainly through the lens of the European Climate and Health Observatory. If we look at the policy and political landscape in the last year and a half, two years, we can see really a flurry of activity that is pushing the climate change impacts on health really higher up the political agenda. Uh, we have, for example, the regulation on uh, <clears throat> serious cross-border threats to health, which is also including environmental threats, also those coming from climate change in its remit. We had last year a uh, communique from the G7 health ministers, really emphasizing the need for climate neutral and climate resilient health systems. And finally, we also had the uh, Budapest Declaration uh, from July this year with a strong commitment on action on climate change and health. So there's a lot happening. There's a lot of commitment from professional associations, then International Association of National Public Health Institutes, for example, the Standing Committee of Medical Doctors and so on, all emphasizing the need for working on climate change and health. But I am not a politician, I'm not a policymaker. I'm working at the European Environment Agency, which is an EU agency uh, committed to providing robust and independent knowledge about environment to the decision makers at the European level, at the national level as well. So what I'm the most interested in and what I assume would be really interesting for the research community gathered here is really the role of knowledge in propelling the action on climate change and health. We have done uh, EU adaptation strategy, adaptation to climate change strategy from 2021. But before it was published, there was a previous adaptation strategy from 2013. And what happened, it was evaluated in 2018. And one of the main points was that despite some investment into research and knowledge creation, there is still not enough knowledge about climate change impacts on human health and that we know even less about the solutions that could be adopted. So the new strategy from 2021 is really making the point that we need to increase our understanding to increase our capacity to address those impacts because the threats are increasing and they are happening across the borders. So in this context, the Commission committed itself to setting up the European Climate and Health Observatory within the boundaries of the existing uh, climate change adaptation platform, Climate Adapt. So here we are. The European Climate and Health Observatory is a partnership is a partnership of the European Commission, mainly involving the DG Climate Action and the DG uh, Climate Health and Food Safety, European Environment Agency, but also a host of other institutions and organizations, either working on climate change, working on health, or working on other aspects that are relevant to climate change impacts on health. So the ECDC, European Food Safety Agency, Copernicus, WHO Europe, Lancet Countdown uh, in Europe, providing the scientific knowledge, but also the Association of the Schools of Public Health in the European region and the International Association of National Public Health Institutes as the sort of uh, professional organizations that can take the knowledge and bring it into the practitioner sphere. When we started working together on the observatory, it was pretty organic. We set up a work plan. We decided to first focus on heat and infectious diseases as the main uh, climate impacts on human health. Now we are moving more towards water and theme and capacity building. But we decided to, to stop and reflect and come up with some sort of strategic vision where we would like to be in 10 years or so. So we thought that it would be good if people could monitor where we actually are in terms of the risks we are facing, but also in terms of the responses to those. 
that the national and also sub-national health policies can integrate the adaptation to climate change more systematically than it's done now, that the relevant public authorities have a capacity to anticipate and prevent the climate-related threats to health, that the health community is climate literate, and also vice versa, that the climate community is health literate and they know what to do to address the climate risks to health. And finally, that we know what works, what can be adopted, um, and how can we make the best informed decisions to prevent those threats. So I'm going to run through those objectives now to show you what we already have in the observatory, where do we stand and where is still some progress to be made. So on the monitoring of risks, we are, for example, working with the Copernicus Climate Change Service, looking at the projections of the climatic variables that are relevant to human health. But we are also looking at the aspects of vulnerability and exposure. So with the colleagues from the uh, Lancet countdown in Europe, um, we were able to, or they were able to assess the growing vulnerability of the European population to heat stress because of the aging population, because of the increasing urbanization, because of the prevalence of disease. Drawing on data from Eurostat and from European Environment Agents, we were able to assess that 11% of healthcare facilities in Europe might be located in potential flood prone areas. Every ninth hospital scene might be at risk of flooding. We also are working with reinsurance companies, so they provide the data about the um, uh, damages and losses associated with extreme weather events, but also about the fatalities. So we have information about uh, fatalities associated with wildfires, with flooding. And again, Lancet Countdown in Europe, as presented yesterday by Catherine Town, are doing a great job on assessing the change in uh, mortality associated with heat waves. Where we have a bit of a weak spot, maybe it's on the response side. We don't really know what works and how well it works. So we are looking for some proxies and information such as, for example, the uh, greening of European cities, the greening around hospitals and schools and so on, the provision of uh, heat health action plans in various countries. The second objective is about the greater integration of climate change adaptation into, into uh, health policies. What we did a couple of years ago, we looked into the national adaptation policies and national health strategies uh, in Europe. Uh, what you see in this graph is that um, it's I would like to draw your attention to, to two things. The first thing is that the blue bars are consistently longer than the green bars. It means that uh, in the case of national adaptation strategies, there seem to be a much bigger coverage of climate change impacts on health and also the measure plans than in the case of national health strategies. So that sort of suggests that the national health strategies might be somewhat lagging a bit behind in the recognition of climate change impacts on health. And that was a signal for us to sort of change tax slightly and actually address the public health and health community with uh, the knowledge that is being developed and our communication a bit more. The second uh, thing I would like you to draw your attention to that for the top three, uh, uh, three issues, um, knowledge and data and information is really essential. So monitoring and surveillance to be able to set up effective early warning systems, awareness raising, more research about climate change impacts on health are really the top measures that are being planned in the national adaptation policies and national health strategies. This is followed by, for example, setting new governance structures. And here we see some progress as well. For example, in Germany and in Ireland, there are specific climate health units set up uh, in within the health ministries, which is really showing that this issue is top on the agenda. Looking at the subnational level, um, cities reporting to CDP, previously the Carbon Disclosure proje Project, where they um, say what they do about climate change mitigation and adaptation, they really recognize climate change threats to public health with the heat and then um, too much water, too little water, infectious diseases being at the top. But what they also report is really strong barriers to addressing public health threats from climate change. 
Of course, the budgetary limits are being mentioned. What is also being mentioned is the lack of knowledge and technical expertise of, of staff, low political priority, and also that at the local level, there is, in some cases, no direct responsibility for healthcare. So what we see here is that they, at the European level, we are really doing our best to sort of break down the silos and make sure that we work across various themes to address this topic. We can see the increasing integration at the national level, but at the local level, actually, there is still a very strong separation between climate change adaptation agenda and the health agenda. And uh, that's really worrying because in the majority of the national adaptation strategies uh, in Europe, there is a very strong point being made that because of the local character of the climate change impacts, climate change adaptation is the responsibility of subnational level. And we see that so far, um, stakeholders or departments dealing with health or dealing with social care have not really been involved so much in adaptation making. It sort of remains very much the, the, the remit of environmental departments, spatial planning departments, urban design departments, rather than being the, the issue of the health and well-being of the society. The third objective and where we would like to be in about uh, 10 years time is having the capacity to anticipate and prevent climate related threats in a timely manner. So here we are drawing, for example, the forecasts uh, from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service on air pollution, which of course, when combined with high temperatures can pose additional threats to human health. We also work with um, ECDC uh, and um, bringing together, um, for example, the, uh, the tools such as the viewer showing them risks associated with uh, Vibrio, but also trying to be the um, gateway uh, for early warning systems across Europe. But it's, of course, much more than that. It's about understanding the the trends is un about understanding the patterns, both temporal and geographical. So here, you as the research community really come into play, helping to understand what sort of conditions are leading to what sort of threats. The fourth objective is that the climate community across Europe should be climate literate and more involved into adaptation decision making. Um, a year and a half ago, The Economist and Johnson & Johnson ran a survey with 150 uh, doctors and nurses from the UK, Germany and France. What they found out was that 13% 30 13 of them already were on a weekly basis faced with patients suffering uh, from some impacts of climate change. Another finding of the survey was that 60% of the doctors and nurses were expecting that the problem will get worse in the future. So how are we actually prepared for that? <clears throat> a, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to colleagues from the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, and they mentioned a survey that they uh, ran a few years ago. And uh, that indicated that among the nearly 600 uh, medical schools in the European region, uh, about a quarter have some sort of formal education on climate change. And in about uh, a fifth, there is a sort of grassroots bottom-up movement of the students themselves to learn about climate change. So if you want to be a pessimist, you can look at the left bar and say, well, only in a quarter of schools there is something happening. But if you want to be an optimist, look at the right bar. In one fifth of the schools, the students are actually organizing themselves and learning and teaching others about climate change. So I think there is really some hope for the future and we should really do our best to equip those young people with the resources that they can use in learning and in teaching others. The situation seems a bit better in the schools of uh, public health. So that's according to the survey by ASFA, it's about uh, three quarters of the schools that integrate climate change in their curricula. And I only have about one minute left, so I'm going to go very quickly. Uh, 
But uh, there is also some professional training already taking place. So, for example, the WHO Europe have the uh, Bond School on Environment and Health. We have also other examples from Germany, or a really nice initiative by the Healthcare Without Harm on nurses becoming the champions for climate change. So we are really on the lookout for initiatives like that so we can put them in the observatory and make sure that others can learn from them, can be inspired by them. So I would like to finish uh, with a call for case studies, for good examples. We already have some of them within the portal, looking, for example, at um, subnational and national heat health action plans and how they address the vulnerable groups. Examples of greening around vulnerable facilities, such as schools. Um, these sort of reactive examples that uh, Halshka was talking about, about uh, developing uh, regulations protecting the health of workers against heat, action uh, controlling vectors, as well as some initiatives trying to tackle the really important subject of climate anxiety that many people are facing, being uncertain about their future. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you if you know of any good initiatives that could help, can help others to learn and be inspired by them. So please just do get in touch and I will finish thing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you, Ida. Yes, thank you. And first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me for this conference. It's been very interesting listening to all the talks. Um, as you heard, my name is Ida Knutsson, and I work as an analyst at the Unit of Environmental Health at the Public Health Agency of Sweden. And we have one uh, office here in Stockholm and another one further up north in the country, in Östersund. And I'm going to give you a Swedish perspective on including health and climate change adaptation. In June uh, 2018, the Swedish parliament adopted a new national public health policy that has uh, a public health goal and eight target areas. And this public health policy now has a clear focus on equity in health. And uh, it has an overarching objective to avoid uh, health inequalities within one generation and eliminate avoidable health inequalities within one generation. And climate change is one of the factors that highlight the need for long-term and cross-sectorial uh, public health work. And uh, to have a good health is probably the most important thing in life for most people. And from an international perspective, Sweden has um, the Public health in Sweden has ranks very highly and has improved over time. But we have differences between groups that are increasing. And therefore, our agency pays special attention to the groups that suffer uh, from the greatest risk of suffering from ill health. And our vision is uh, public health that strengthens the positive developments of society. And to protect and improve the public health um, is probably one of the strongest arguments uh, for doing action on climate change. And according to the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, it is clear that the climate in Sweden is also changing towards a warmer climate. And uh, if this, this development continues, according to the RCP 8.5 scenario, the average temperature in Sweden will increase by five degrees for the period 2071 to 2100. So in fact, the countries in the Northern Hemisphere will experience a higher temperature rise uh, than the global average. And the largest temperature increase will occur during December to February, where we have the winter season. So it will affect the number of days that we have a snow coverage. And climate change will primarily exacerbate already existing vulnerabilities and enhance the burden of uh, disease from the most prevalent non-communicable diseases. 
as well as changing the abundance of infectious disease. And it may also contribute to new illnesses and disease and uh, increase the stress on water and food security. And also, climate change will increase the, the health inequalities that we already see today. And uh, like uh, other parts of the world, over the last years, also in Sweden, we've seen unprecedented extreme weather events. And in 2018, we experienced a very long uh, and severe heat wave. And at the same time, we had widespread forest fires that lasted for weeks. And uh, this summer, heavy floods has caused problems for uh, communities and ecosystems and humans. Um, the Public Health Agency of Sweden, we are appointed by the government to be a focal point in, for the WHIO's environmental and health process, as we heard about yesterday from Dr. Vladimir Kindrovsky. And we want to echo what has been stated by the Working Group on Health and Climate Change, HIC, in the Sokoko Zero Regrets paper. Uh, and that is that climate change is a public health crisis and that it's urgent that we work together across countries, organizations and sectors with transformative actions. And in order to strengthen the health arguments for action on climate change in the national context, we've translated this uh, Zero Regrets paper into Swedish. So let's talk about the policy framework that's been launched in Sweden in recent years. In 2017, the government launched a policy framework for climate change adaptation. And the overarching national target is to achieve a net zero emission by 2045. And this framework also consists of a climate act that imposes an obligation on the current and future government to address climate change in its policies. And this is to make climate change less sensitive to political changes and also to make the actions more long term. And uh, the government has to perform yearly evaluation of the actions they take. And in 2019, 18, the government also launched a national strategy for climate change adaptation. And the goal is to develop a society that is sustainable and robust in the long term. And that actively deals with climate change by reducing vulnerabilities and taking advantage of opportunities. And this strategy will be updated every five years. And we're expecting a new version this autumn. In 2019, the government also uh, adopted an ordinance on climate change adaptation, on, on climate adaptation work on the part of the government agencies. And this ordinance applies for 32 government agencies in Sweden, and including the Public Health Agency of Sweden. And it stipulates that the agency has to, within its area of responsibility and within its Mit of its mandate, it should initiate, support, and evaluate climate adaptation work. And this work has to be based on, on climate and vulnerability analysis that also should be updated every five years. And we also have a responsibility to develop uh, agency objectives for public health and an action plan that also should be updated every five years. And then we have to do follow-ups and report yearly to the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, who has the coordinating responsibility for climate change adaptation in Sweden. So uh, the Public Health Agency, we started off by doing this climate and vulnerability analysis in 2019. And first we collected data on how climate change will affect Sweden. And also, we collected data on demographics and on uh, the current health status in the population. 
Then uh, we, in 2019, we performed a two-day workshop, a uh, star workshop, together with the WHIO and together with national experts from the academy and from national authorities. And STAR stands for Strategic Tool Kit for Assessing Risks. And in our work, we actually piloted this tool for climate change. And we have continued to work together with the WHIO to develop this even further for climate change. And the purpose of the workshop was to jointly analyze how much climate change will affect the disease burden in Sweden in a given climate scenario. And after working through the tools systematically, together with the experts, we came up with this matrix, risk matrix. And uh, prior to the workshop, we had identified 17 uh, different risks through a literature review. And we assessed these 17 risks during the workshop. And we won't have time to go through all of them. But um, in summary, the results show that the greatest hazard to health, both in relation to severity and probability in Sweden, is heat waves and tick-borne infections. And then with a high probability, climate change will also lead to changes in pollen allergies, an increase in floods, and a negative impact on drinking water quality and water and foodborne infections. And we published these results in 2021. And you can find the publication through our website. And it's written in Swedish, but it has an English summary. And we're happy to tell you more about it as well. <laughs> uh, and this uh, was an assessment of the current level of knowledge about how climate change will affect health in Sweden. Uh, and it will be also be revised every five years. And we're just starting on a second cycle. And this climate and vulnerability analysis has been the basis for our action plan, as I said, uh, that is called Public Health in a Changing Climate. And in this action plan, we've set five goals for the agency's work on climate change adaptation, and it's valid until 2024. And firstly, climate change adaptation should be integrated into all of the public health agency's work. And these goals mean that we will work continuously and generally work more with climate change and how it affects public health in Sweden. And the other goals deal more specifically, specifically with the heat waves, indoor environment, water and food, born, water, food and vector-borne infections agents, and also that we should compile knowledge about how climate change in other countries will affect the health risks in Sweden. And this publication is also available through our website. Uh, heat waves, we've heard that this is the, considered to be the greatest risk in Sweden in relation to climate change. And in 2017, we published a guideline to heat health action plans together with uh, special information sheets and uh, this builds on the work from WHIO on heat health action plans. And this guideline is uh, aimed for municipalities, regions, and private caregivers. And it gives advice uh, for different professions and different uh, risk groups. And after the record setting uh, heat wave in 2018, the evaluations that we did afterwards show that those who had implemented these heat health action plans actually felt they were much more prepared in dealing with the negative health effects from heat. And then after, I don't have a slide that supports this, but after hearing about co-benefits yesterday, um, I wanted to tell you about an initiative that we just started. And in Sweden, we have 16 environmental quality objectives that uh, show the status of the environment that we want to achieve. And this is th these environmental quality objectives guide the work of society as a whole when it comes to environment. And um, 
The Public Health Agency has just started a joint working program together with 10 other agencies uh, about the environmental quality job objectives. And we want to create a network between different sectors and different agencies in order to show how health can be a driver as for environmental quality objectives and also for sustainable development and hoping that this will lead that we can see synergies and co-benefits better between our, the different sectors. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to all our speakers this morning uh, for such interesting perspectives, really showing us the importance of looking at different scales of our actions, so international, regional and the national level as well. We've got time now, um, about half an hour for question and answer sh session. Um, taking the chair's prerogative, I think I'll, I'll kick it off with a question. You're all talking about the importance of knowledge um, for the work that you do. And I think we do have a large research contingent in the audience. However, we also heard very sobering accounts in terms of what we know the impacts are already. So the importance of solutions and really you know, rapidly transforming the way that we are working together. So with that balance in mind and knowing that we already have a lot of the information and the knowledge to act, and it's largely about experimenting with the solutions, space, and really, oops, that was your timer. You, you saved us <laughs> yeah. lots of time, you were quite sure. Um, so just acknowledging that often tension, because researchers can often come up with research questions. We're very good at asking why, not necessarily so good at coming up with practical solutions. So acknowledging that tension between the importance of knowledge, but the importance of, importance of focusing on what can we do now, where would you each see the critical knowledge gaps for your areas of work? Mm. So I'll start with you, Helshka. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think one thing that we're really seeing is the ability to monitor and evaluate the national policies that are implemented. So that's something that we get questions a lot from ministries of labor when they approach us asking for what are the best practices? Should we be using this maximum temperature level? Should we be implementing these workplace risk assessments? It just has everything has happened so quickly that we don't have that ability yet to properly monitor and evaluate what works and what doesn't and how much we're actually protecting workers, how much we're reducing hospitalizations, how much we're reducing the burden of disease from occupational heat stress and occupational heat injuries. So this is something that we really need to work on and we're trying to do that with a team of researchers. Um, but knowing that every national situation is so different, depending on the economic sectors that are there, depending on the workers that are in the most vulnerable situations, uh, it's really something that, that we need to, to ramp up. So that monitoring, evaluation and learning yeah. from what the interventions are exactly. that are being trialled. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Thanks, Halshka. Alexandra, do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I think I can only, only support the notion of looking at the effectiveness of solutions. And as, as I presented, you know, the, the people who are making decisions about what to do and really pressed for time. They're not the experts and they're really desperate for knowing what works. What should they invest the public money in? Because it's mainly the interventions and in many cases done by public sector. Mm -hmm. So looking, for example, at the local level, should the municipalities be investing into green spaces or into cool islands uh, to protect the uh, population from from heat. So, so these are the sort of questions that, that people are faced with and, and having mechanisms that would evaluate the effectiveness of the solutions, the cost effectiveness of the solutions, as well as the investment needed, the cost efficiency of the, of the solutions would be, would be really welcome. Yeah, and I think that often as, as researchers, we don't actually um, have a lot of scope in our research funding um, or funders to include strong monitoring and evaluation and learning components. Yeah. So that's something that we may need to advocate for, a greater focus on ME and L. So thanks, Alexandra. And do you have a 
Nada yeah, de I, I would agree with the previous speakers that uh, it's uh, crucial that we, we know a lot about the risks and um, <clears throat> we have a lot of evidence on how climate change will affect health. And the problem is that we, we have to find effective policies and make this into action. And that is, uh, we need more knowledge about what works and what doesn't. Um, so I can only agree. <laughs> and research is, uh, it's effective when it's come into practice. And uh, when it, um, so we need more uh, knowledge about what works and the good examples. And, uh, but I can also say that uh, we've also seen in the, the risk analysis, as I showed, that uh, the area of mental health also could uh, be looked at further, mm -hmm. that uh, we have a lot of soft values or <laughs> and we need to know more about how this will affect the mental health and be able to show that as well. Mm. And we were able to, and I say Jan Semenso is a fellow um, lead author from the IPCC's sixth assessment report. And in this sixth assessment report, we were able to, for the first time, really talk more about the mental health impacts of, of climate change. And so definitely more research in that area. I agree. Wonderful. So now that's given you some time to think of your own questions. I think that there's a, a roving mic um, for questions, but any questions? Up the back there, thank you. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, you're just your name and where you're from. Olivier Briette from uh, ECDC. Um, I have a question about the mental health, and maybe a very ignorant one because I'm not at all uh, familiar with it. And maybe, maybe um, uh, Halshka could uh, answer it because it came up in your mm -hmm. site. And uh, so, uh, of course, in Europe, we have a, a large proportion of people that are not necessarily working outside, but uh, office workers. And I understand that um, mental health in an office environment is particularly important for you know, safety at work. Uh, is you know, things like protection from bullying and, and feeling, you know, mental stress and, and, and that uh, uh, aspect. So maybe uh, to inform you, what would be an example of um, mental health related to c climate change, particularly in in like the European context? Because uh, uh, of course we have climate anxiety, but that's not necessarily in a work context. So, so what, what would you think of just, just for me to sort of place that somewhere? Mm -hmm. um, and then also I, I noticed so vector-borne diseases often come up as well, malaria. Uh, uh, but you know, malaria is, is uh, transmitted by a mosquito that bites at night. So how is that then uh, related to uh, in, 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 a, in a sort of work uh, environment? Thank you. Okay, I'll jump on the first one about, <laughs> about psychosocial health um, at the workplace. So what we're really seeing is that global workers, um, I'm talking more about in the global south and developing economies, there's really a heavy mental burden on the risk of livelihood loss because of climate change. And this is really front and center and it's not acknowledged enough. We talk about heat stress and, and mosquito and infectious disease risks. Um, but what we really saw in the interventions at the workplace level was that fear of having floods, having, I don't know if you saw on the slide from Vietnam, salinity increases in the crops so that you don't have the proper yield, uh, where we're going to get more chemical pesticides from because the crops are just not doing as well. And so there is a really heav heavy mental health burden on this, and it's linked not only to the physical impacts of the heat stress of the actual things that are happening, but it's about livelihood loss and the potential for having to migrate and change and move location because of the real threats that are happening to agriculture uh, and to the different subsistence livelihoods that really make up a majority of the workforce of the world. Uh, and so it's really linked to this. And when it comes to the European perspective, maybe my European colleagues can talk more about the regional and the national approaches to that. Um, but in addition to climate anxiety, we really see that real risk of the threat of loss of livelihoods and the th threat of loss of jobs, as I showed in one of my slides. Yes, Alexandra. So, so maybe if I could uh, add to that, one of the possibly um, maybe not, not so well recognized uh, risks in Europe is the uh, mental uh, pressure of uh, especially droughts on farmers. 
so far this issue has been mainly uh, re relevant to Australia or Asia or, or parts of the USA. But with the last few years consistently affecting the um, agriculture in Europe, we can expect that uh, the, the levels of uh, depression and other mental health and well-being issues can rise among the farmer community from what i understand it's an it's a it's a group of or it's an occupational group that is uh, particularly prone to, to to mental health issues because of the dependence on on weather which they cannot control because of the uh, often isolation from services in many countries also the sort of the the, the macho culture and not giving up and being an, a, a strong uh, man or a person plowing through difficulties this all really adds up i think in the in the office setting then the heat and overheating can can also be a, a bit of a problem uh, lancet countdown have this really interesting indicator linking heat waves to uh, the angry tweets being sent or the sort of uh, the, 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 the balance between the negative and, and positive presence on social media. And we know that people become much more irritable when they are affected by heat. So, you know, if you can imagine a sort of an, a group of uh, angry office workers uh, sweating together, I think that, you know, the issues of, of, of mobbing, mobbing and, you know, office relations probably might, might increase also affecting the, the mental well-being. Any comment, yeah. Ida? Yeah, I'd like to comment on uh, the fact that young people often fe feel very anxious about the climate change. And uh, in uh, Sweden, we conduct a national survey every fourth year. Uh, and uh, the environmental health report from uh, the last one for children showed that almost 20% of the children are very anxious about the um, um, climate change and that this is a growing problem and that um, yeah looking into the future and what's ahead of for them that this affects their whole uh, perception of the future mm. Yeah, and I think that um, the issue of climate anxiety, particularly amongst our younger generation, is one that's coming up and up again. And again, I think what we're seeing in the research community is a balance between uh, understanding and respecting this climate anxiety that is strongly appearing in our young population, but also um, focusing on strengths and what sort of capacities young people have. And there's some really um, fantastic projects that really focus on that, um, those capitals, you know, the strengths and the um, abilities of young people to respond to that. And I think that's the flip side of that climate anxiety. So, um, yeah, there's a fantastic project that um, is called climatesuperpowers.org. So if you want to have a look at that, that's a bit of a plug for that project, but it's for young people and it's to really focus on what they can actually do in light of a changing environment and in light of the fact that all the burden is now really put on our younger generations, which is an issue, again, of equity. And that issue of equity, each of you also brought up as well. Mm -hmm. So um, great discussions. Um, Miriam, you have a question. Hello. Yes, we have some questions from the online audience, oh, yeah. actually, that we want to bring up. And uh, one of them is focusing around mental health as well. And uh, a couple, two questions together for Ida. Uh, first is how Sweden, uh, how is Sweden making climate adaptation plans, taking into consideration climate impact on mental health and depression? And... Uh, uh, I, I take it out the question, although it's not exactly related, but which groups are most vulnerable to heat waves in Sweden? Mm -hmm. uh, well, mental health has been um, in the climate and vulnerability analysis that I showed, is uh, an outcome that is considered in, all, in connection to all of these 17 risks that we've assessed. But we saw that there's a knowledge gap in uh, some of them and that we have to um, revise this <laughs> analysis and try to build more knowledge and as we heard Catherine said there a lot of has happened over the last years when it comes to the knowledge about mental health but it's included as other health outcomes uh, throughout the analysis and also um, then in the goals that we we consider men mental health equally important to other outcomes uh, if that was an answer. And then the vulnerable 
uh, groups for heat stress in Sweden are primarily the elderly people. In the 2018 heat wave, we saw that uh, the higher mortality, almost all of them were in the older population. <laughs> uh, but um, then there's people with disabilities or chronic illness. Um, people taking some medications that affect their um, ability to cope with heat and uh, small children and uh, yeah some workers as well outdoor workers mm. so it, it's basically the same uh, risk groups in Sweden as everywhere else and in fact um, you can see that the, the person living in the northern part of Sweden actually there are studies done by Umeå University, among others, that show that uh, the population in the northern parts actually are more vulnerable to heat than uh, the people in the northern part of the countries. So it also seems to vary on a geographical scale in the country. Are there the two online questions, Miriam? Yeah, actually, there are several more. Can I take another one as well? Or yes, sure. Others? Unless there is there, oh yeah, there is one in the audience. Oh, there's two. So maybe we'll take a couple from here and then up the back. Um, thank you. Just a brief introduction, your name and where you're from, please. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bujan. I'm a researcher at uh, University of Bern. And uh, I was wondering about uh, what, what kind of actions are being thought of with dealing with organizations that promote uh, unhealthy practices. Uh, in the example with uh, Qatar and the World Cup, uh, thousands of people died, and there seems to be no repercussions to an organization like FIFA that was promoting that. And I was wondering what kind of things that are being thought of on trying to prevent this type of action from happening again. I think that's the question for you, Hashka. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Happy to take those questions. Um, well, I think we talked yesterday about the importance, and hopefully we'll talk more today about the importance of uh, engaging with stakeholders that have a stake in the game, right? And so um, it's critical that we engage with all players and make sure that there's awareness around what's happening. Uh, but there was a direct risk to workers' health in Qatar, which is the reason that why ILO undertook this really intensive investigation with the best researchers in the world to try to set national policy. And it's all about that idea of having that rights-based approach, is promoting the way in is through safety and health, because it's really tangible. It's really something we can do. We can say, here's the maximum temperature, here's a risk assessment, here's PPE that is effective, let's use it. And at the same time, let's open that discussion about human rights and about workers' rights in the workplace. And let's use international labor standards to try to move the dial you know, as, as best we can uh, with these players. Now, when it comes to those large, those large organizations and corporations, I mean, the best thing we can do is awareness raising through the projects that we have there. Uh, but our focal points are really the national authorities, the competent authorities at the national level to make sure that they're um, promoting international labor standards and all the principles uh, that exist within them when it comes to workers' rights. Did that, that was an answer to your question? Yeah. I think also, what are the legal repercussions? Can we go down that path a little bit? The legal repercussions? Yeah, well, in terms of what we know uh, is the right to a healthy and clean environment yeah. now. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a really tricky situation, though. I mean, the one specifically in Qatar when you have different players, right, because it wasn't exactly, uh, FIFA wasn't the employer of any any of the workers, right? And so this is a really tricky situation that you have there. I mean, there the only thing we can rely on really is international pressure uh, and making sure that standards are uh, in line with what the global community is saying when it comes to workers' rights, et cetera. Um, and when it comes to repercussions, we do have a supervisory system that tries to see what's happening in the country and then bring those situations to light in order to develop those technical cooperation projects, and not only with the ILO, but other global organizations that are trying to promote health. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Hoshka. We're doing our best. <laughs> All right. Morning. I mean, do you mind if I follow up on that as somebody who's gotten some success there? If you introduce yourself. Yeah, Jason Glazer, Lays on Network. We work on occupational health. I think you probably covered some of our work. And uh, Andreas is here talking about in Qatar. 
I mean, with the guitar issue, I think part of the problem was a lot of the amazing recommendations Andreas made were not completely honored yeah. at all. And implementation is a huge problem. But the attempt is certainly there and the science is good. I think it, I think the problem with FIFA is nobody really went after him appropriately. There wasn't like a boycott. There wasn't like enough rage, frankly. And it was really, really frustrating. Rage is okay because it can get people to the table. Like when we got things going in Nicaragua, the rum company, I mean, we got it to the point using the media where, you know, bartenders were just dumping the rum down the drain and that hit their bottom line in such a way that they had to act. So if we're worried about some of these things, I'd really look at the top of the supply chain, look at the brands. They're so sensitive to the marketplace. You don't, as researchers, I know that makes you nervous, but sometimes you have to work with the NGOs who can provide that pressure so you can get to the table and offer the solution. And that's okay. <laughs> so I hope that's a helpful answer. <laughs> like you don't, we don't have to be scared about getting change and, and it's not kumbaya. It's pretty much like real politic and economics. So the brands source the commodities that cause a lot of this harm. And the construction companies are a little trickier, but I do think there's avenues there as well. Thanks, Jason, for that comment. C a couple more questions online. Are there, Miriam? Yeah. And another question there. Yeah. Yes, so uh, we have another question for Halska online. How is the ILO considering different location-specific heat thresholds when working with workers' health? Are there any tools at international level available to define threshold? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, no, we don't, we technically, we don't have right now a technical tool that looks at that, um, but it's very specific to the variability of the sector and the tasks that are being conducted in that sector. And it's not just about temperature, of course. It's about many different uh, climactic issues that are happening at the workplace. And so it's really a case-by-case -case basis. And so that's what we're seeing is um, having some good practices, regional good practices, but then adapting them to the national and not always just the national, but the sectoral realities because there are different physically demanding tasks. So construction is very different than agriculture, than tourism, than manufacturing, than indoor, than outdoor work, et cetera. And so there are all of these considerations to take into account. So we have the regional examples and then we adapt to the specific uh, realities that are at the ground level. Is there another question, or should we leave? If the other questions for the other me the other member members of the panel will go for that. But if it's again for Helshka, I feel like you're being pummeled with all the questions. <laughs> Please, we have questions for uh, panel as a whole as well. Wonderful. So uh, one of the online participants is asking: Air condition can regulate heat stress at the office, but can paradoxically increase climate change. We should investigate other forms of environmental friendly cooling methods if possible. Any opinions on how this could be solved? Either or Alexander. Um, I can start up. I'm, I'm not sure I have a solution, but uh, uh, at the end of my presentation, I mentioned uh, a new initiative that we are trying to work together with other authorities. It's the Swedish Road Administration, the Board for Housing, and the Environmental Protection Agency, a lot of sectors that meet in order to find the co-benefits and the synergies between different actions so that they won't... Uh, the actions we take don't uh, fix other problems <laughs> or create other problems that will fix the problems uh, together. So we don't have a solution ready, but we're trying, and also we're trying not only to work uh, together at the agency level, but also to invite researchers and uh, other stakeholders in Sweden that work with environment and health to find the, the sustainable solutions that actually fix several problems, the health problem, the environment problem. And uh, so we have four years now <laughs> uh, on our mandate to work on this in a more networking <laughs> way and to, to find uh, a bigger solution on the problems. Thanks, Ida. Alexandra, do you have any comments on that one? Yes, on, on air conditioning, that uh, takes me back about uh, 13 years when I was a researcher uh, in, in Manchester and, and looking, among others, at the behavior of the office workers, uh, how they were managing the temperature. And oh boy, that was just amazing because some people were sticking things into the air conditioning units or they were putting on the fans. Some of them were trying to open the windows and, and so on. It, it was chaos. So so air conditioning is, is, is indeed maybe not the most... Uh, effective even even solution for for cooling 
And we know that, for example, the more traditional measures such as shading on avoiding uh, sitting in the south-facing office, uh, in, in fact, the, the, the office buildings, the sort of steel and glass uh, style that was uh, coming up from the 70s uh, onwards, is, is not really sustainable anymore. So, so using things like you know uh, reflect, reflective screens uh, in windows can just reduce the sort of the, the insulation and maybe reduce the use of of air conditioning. But it's something that it needs to be, I think, tackled on a case by case basis, uh, depending on 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 the building and. Um, its orientation, construction, and so on. It points to the importance of that multi-sectoral conversation, doesn't it, between health and all the health-determining sectors, whether they're energy or agriculture, urban design. Uh, there was a question up the back. There you are. Yes, please. Um, hello. Thank you um, all for yeah, your presentations. It was very interesting. I'm not a researcher. I just finished my master's. <laughs> And I have one question for you, Hashka, as well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, you mentioned that 60% are working in the informal sector. Um, and I was wondering, like, it's nice to see that the governments are implementing national policies that are also in line with the ILO um, guidelines. But how is it possible to monitor um, that these national policies are, or the people in the informal sector are also benefiting from the national policies? Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a really important question because it's 60% of the global workforce that's in the informal sector, uh, but in certain countries it goes up to 90%. <laughs> so it's a huge problem. Um, and it's something that has always been on the agenda of the ILO, knowing we have to get to those most vulnerable workers that are suffering from really the social justice inequalities. And I think we've done a variety of things in, um, first of all, simplifying our messaging and making sure that there's just the most basic solutions to safety and health. I'm not just talking about heat stress, but all the other potential uh, exposures that happen. And so what we do is we really develop uh, materials that are use, that are useful at the field level. So making sure that they're easily interpreted, that they're translated to local languages and making sure that we have those entry points that are at that informal level. So not organized workplaces with an informal employer, et cetera. We work really closely with national and local workers organizations uh, that are working with that even that informal sector. And when there's not organization, because in many places there aren't this, um, organizations for workers, there's things like cooperatives or working through uh, community members that are directly working with the workers that have contact with the workers or with the industry or with the um, broader um, sort of situation in the local community when it comes to the workers. So it's really about making sure the language is simple of the interventions to implement, but making sure you have that interlocutor that's at the local level that's able to be in contact with the workers. And we're, it sounds very difficult coming from Geneva to say that, but we've been at the field level and making sure that those most vulnerable workers are impacted and we're able to get to those local levels because of that direct link we have with workers' organizations or with communities. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's just a very difficult situation, but it, it is. it's always with the informal sector um, and in any, like, workers' rights and stuff, that they are upheld. And then maybe I wanted to make two more comments to what um, Alexandra has said. Um, so first, maybe also because the mental health um, aspect was mentioned before, I, wanted, I wrote my master thesis on ecological emotions um, and climate anxiety was also a big topic, but it's important also to, um, because I was focusing on young um, climate activists, maybe important to note that it's um, not just anxiety, there's a lot of people who have lost a lot of hope <laughs> and they're now just sad. So yeah, just maybe for other researchers if they wanted to work um, with that. And the second comment was about the education. So um, I studied health economics and management and we had one module um, on environmental and health economics. And I think it's also important to not only have education, but also to ensure that the quality is high and that the people are trained because in my experience, I would say it was not too <laughs> good. Um, I didn't feel like I learned a lot. I mean, I'm very interested in it, in it so I knew before mm. about planetary health and sustainable healthcare. Um, but if the quality is not 
the best and I think it drives more students away because then they were like, oh, it's not the biggest issue in public health. Um, so yeah, just another comment. But thank you for the presentations, it was very interesting. Any response to those comments or take them as comments? Oh, please. No, I just wanted yeah. to add more about the informal sector because I just think it's it's really important that we touch upon that to give you another concrete example um, of of how we try to make sure that, that that sector is reached. So recently we were working in, in Kenya and working with the local OSH outreach officers that are coming from the different specific municipalities where they're conducting informal worker training. So what they do is round up groups of workers that are usually what we would call shop stewards or the ones that are responsible also for then communicating to the other workers and giving OSH trainings um, in the local context, but also doing really practical measures, making sure that those workers that are pulled out from work for that day for trading get 1.5 the rate of daily ra wage so that they're not losing their wages when they're coming to do these kind of safety and health trainings. So just to give you a practical example of some of the work that's done to try to impact the informal sector. Thanks, Hashka. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Are there any more online, Miriam, or any in the room? I have one question. Oh, that's two. Okay. Yes. Uh, oh. Jerome from Karolinska, and I have a question for Ida. So with the change of government uh, in Sweden, uh, how can you keep on going your agenda on climate change and climate change denials within Sweden? Yeah. I expected <laughs> was the question, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not easy with politics, but I, as far as my agency and our mission, we can't see that this will change how we work. Uh, we have the mandates to do this and uh, we'll do. Um, but uh, I agree that there's uh, the basis for doing the actions and making the differences that the political level is uh, uh, on the same track. So um, we discussed about this yesterday, and I think, uh, well, time will show that this isn't uh, something that is you have either work on or don't. You have to work on this, even as a politician. So if you just have to be patient, I think, too. But uh, now this won't change how we work with health and climate change adaptation in Sweden, as far as I can see. <laughs> Excellent. I've got reflections maybe for another time about how we've been shifting in Australia. We've had the climate wars and we have not seen the progress we've been needing to see. Um, so politics definitely plays a part in our um, national progress. And one more question. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ida Persson and I'm a um, pediatrician from Örebro, Sweden. Um, I have a question for um, maybe both Ida and Hashka. Um, well, I'm aware that this um, session is about adaptation and I really appreciated all of your presentations. Um, I, I feel I'm worried sometimes um, on a personal level when we talk about climate adaptation and we don't mention the root causes. Um, so um, why are we meeting these, uh, these health risks and, and on what level will the health risk be in future? Um, so. I'm, I'm wondering, in, in your organizations, what space do you see um, for, while addressing uh, health adaptation or climate adaptation for health? Uh, can you s also uh, um, raise, raise awareness uh, for, for the root causes? And I know in the, there are some um, labor organizations where they're really engaged um, individuals or, or groups that, that drive this kind of just uh, transition movements. And, um, but, but from a top-down perspective, what, what can ILO do or what does it do? Maybe primal in the global north to, to raise awareness. Um, and for, for Ida, I'm wondering, um, well, in, um, I have read some of the publications that uh, you have printed of Folkhälsomyndigheten and then some of them are really good at showing what are the risks but I think the communication to the public and the communication to the health organizations in within the country should be much clearer and need to be much clearer and there's a uh, there's a lack of information there's a lack of showing the urgency of cutting down emissions as the root cause of climate change. Um, I think that's a terrific question for all the panelists to now make a closing statement on the balance between adaptation and mitigation from their own perspective. So um, if we take it with mm. Ida first, thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, and um, I 
agree that we need to have a good communication about this and that is a lot of synergies between uh, climate change and climate change adaptation and environmental work and health. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and that we need to find uh, clear messages about this in order to make a difference. Um, and as I said, the problem, we work with mitigation, we work with as not only climate change, but we work on these environmental quality objectives that I told you about earlier in the presentation. And uh, uh, this is an, an obligation for the whole society to work with environmental goals and uh, the public health sector is only one sector. <laughs> so it's very important that we meet and discuss solutions that um, um, that we, um, the mitigation, for instance, the infrastructure and uh, are handled with from other sectors. So it's important that health is a priority for them when they do um, mitigation actions, that when they try to reduce traffic or uh, electrify the infrastructure. So our mission is to help them to uh, consider health in their actions as well. And we work with this in um, according to the environmental health objectives. Thanks, Ada. Yeah. Just quick reflections from... Alexandra and I, I would say that in the in the European uh, universe, mitigation is about 15 years ahead of adaptation in terms of policy and action. And for many years, working on adaptation or even mentioning adaptation to climate change was seen as admitting defeat that we cannot do anything on, on, on mitigation. So, you know, it was a bit of an ugly word. Why, why adapt when we can mitigate? And I think that a few years ago, the, the realization came that even if we are on a really strong path in Europe to mitigate greenhouse gases emissions, we will still be hit by, by climate change. And that's why now adaptation is coming to the, to the fore. Having said that, we have uh, much stronger policies on mitigation still, Fit for 55, climate law and so on, they're they setting very firm targets for mitigation. We still don't have those targets for adaptation. We have very strong policy instruments for air quality, for example, now getting also stronger, uh, given the uh, WHO guidelines on, on air quality. So I, I think that there is no chance in a way that the adaptation would in a way uh, block the view for, for, for mitigation and, uh, and then uh, the issues that um, burning of fossil fuels is causing for, for, for human health. We are still just catching up. That's, that's my impression at least. Just a super quick response, Halshka. Yes, sure. You're between morning tea. Okay. <laughs> um, so mitigation. The, the, I think the the advantage of of being able to work with the ILO is the ability to have that direct link to the employer, so the industries of the world along supply chains globally. And we have an entire department that's dedicated to the promotion and implementation of green jobs. So green jobs also mean green industries. And so we see that if we can make that argument that safety and health goes hand in hand with increased productivity and greening workplaces and greening those supply chains is going to not only protect workers, but help the company increase productivity, but also have, as we already discussed, that important reputational advantage, it's only a win. And so the ability to promote those green jobs globally has been something that has been really leading the efforts when it comes to, to the mitigation effort, efforts for the world of work. Um, and on just transition as well, that's a whole other area of work uh, in protecting workers as we move through this process and making sure that also the mitigation efforts aren't harming the workers that are losing their, their livelihoods. Uh, we can make sure we follow along um, in these processes, supporting both the employers and the workers to make sure that uh, we can we can get to some place that's fair and equitable for for everyone. Wonderful place to leave this panel discussion. Thank you, Halshka. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Ida. Please join with me thanking our panel this morning. <laughs> and I think we've got morning tea, and then back here at eleven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
I hope everyone enjoy your coffee break and uh, have some kind of uh, interesting discussions. So next, so we're going to have a wonderful uh, symposium, Belmont Symposium. So first, Christine is going to give you a short introduction. What is Bel Belmont? Yeah, please, Christine. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I will f start with pronouncing or telling the full name of the NBEL project, which is behind this conference, because I'm not sure everyone is aware of that. It's a long name. It's a, a short for Enhancing Belmont Research Action to Support EU Policy Making on Climate Change and Health. And as we introduced yesterday, the NBEL project is a networking activity where we are gathering a lot of different climate change and health projects. And some of these projects are funded by the Belmont Forum, and uh, in this session, uh, we will hear from six of these uh, projects that are funded by the Belmont Forum. Um, the Belmont Forum it was uh, established in 2009, and it's a partnership of funding organizations, international science councils, and regional consortia committed to the advancement of transdisciplinary science. So in Benman Forum, the members, forum members and partner organizations are regularly issuing international calls for proposals. They're committing to the best practices for open data access and providing transdisciplinary training. Uh, since the startup, uh, the Belmont Forum have issued a number of calls on different uh, topics related to environment, climate change, uh, but in uh, 2019, uh, the first climate, environment and health call was issued by the Forum. Um, and in this session, you will get a taste of uh, some of the work that has been done under this uh, call, this, these projects. Uh, so we will, um, as I say, six different projects will be presented. And I suggest we just start with, uh, um, with the first one. Um, and that is uh, Jakob Egelin, uh, Egeling. Uh, he's from the Lund University, um, and he will present uh, the project Award APR, which is an abbreviation for addressing extreme weather-related diarrheal disease risk in the Asia Pacific region. Please, Jakob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, hey, Alihopa, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, today I will be presenting the work of uh, my supervisor, who unfortunately could not be attending here today, uh, Shuan Sigao, but I will do my best to present in his stead. And what we want to do is to introduce to you some of the early warning systems that we have had a part in developing. So the topic of today's talk is climate change and health risk early warning systems. And this presentation uh, is inspired uh, by the Early Warnings for All initiative that was proposed by the UN at the COP27. So the initiative calls for the whole world to be covered by an early warning system by the end of 2027. And this work is also co-led by WMO and UNDRR. So according to the UN, the definition of an early warning system is an adaptive measure for climate change, using integrated communication systems to help communities prepare for hazardous climate-related events. And if successful, this can save lives, jobs, uh, health, infrastructure, and support long-term sustainability. And it can also be uh, assist, uh, used to be assisting officials and administrators when planning and then also protecting economies. So people-centered early warning systems, they rely on four elements of foundations. So first of all, we need to have a proper understanding of what is the risk. Are we aware of the hazard and the vulnerabilities? Then we also need to be able to properly monitor and have a good warning service. So are we monitoring the correct parameters? Are we having a suitable resolution, both spatial and temporal? And then can we also provide warnings in a timely fashion? And then this uh, third one is, as I would think, the most tricky part. 
are we disseminating and communicating in a proper way? We can physically or digitally provide the warnings, but do the users trust the warning? Are they aware of the risk? So we really need to build a trust and build an information uh, level that is high enough so that the people are aware of what is the risks. And then we also have the response capability. So we need to that the communities and the individuals that they are able to actually react to the warnings as well. So different climate hazards and warning target groups, they require different monitoring variables. They require different thresholds and also leave times. In addition to the spatial levels, the early warning systems, such as heat health early warning systems, uh, they also require further development and personalization. So today I will introduce to you some of the early warning systems that we have had a part in developing. So the first one is within the Belmont Forum. So it is the seasonal to subseasonal diarrheal disease early warning system, which was developed in the Belmont Award APR project. Second is Climap, which we developed in the EU Climate project. And finally, it's the Climate Maternal Child Health Early Warning System, which is developed in the ongoing EU High Horizons project. So in Award APR, what we wanted to do was to quantify the relationship between climatic exposure, such as extreme heat, precipitation, but also different phases of ENSO and the risk of diarrheal diseases in the Asia Pacific region. The goal was to develop a seasonal to subseasonal diarrheal disease early warning system that will generate risk maps at subnational levels. Um, the practice behind this is applying time series neural network models that is able to predict diarrheal disease risks. And this is based on epidemiological epidemiological studies on historical climate and diarrheal disease data from Nepal, Taiwan, and Vietnam. And this is the product that we delivered. So here, with several months of lead time, officials can get the predicted diarrheal disease case rate for different regions. And with this, they can get the possibility to perhaps mitigate, but also prepare different measures. Second, we have Climap, and Climap was about translating climate services into personalized adaptation strategies to cope with thermal stress. And what that is, is that we wanted to integrate weather forecasts into heat balance models. And with other words, that means that not only looking at the weather forecasts or the weather that is prevailing, but also what is the person going to do for activity and what kind of clothing are they wearing? Because that is crucial when it comes to predicting uh, the heat balance of the body. So to do this, we have different thermal models and indices. So wet bulb globe temperature, predicted heat strain, predicted mean vote, IREC and wind chill. And as these covers various uh, climatic exposures, Climap has the possibility to app be applied on a global level. And finally, we have the early warning system for heat and maternal health that is being developed in the High Horizons project. So this is building on Climap, where we are monitoring specific parameters. And what is interesting in this pro uh, project is that we're also focusing on different target users. So we have several vulnerable groups that we are working with. So it's pregnant and postpartum women. It is newborns and infants and also healthcare workers. And these three different groups, they will be exposed differently to the thermal environment. And what we also want to do is to include, the ambition is to include different individual factors, such as for pregnant women at the bottom here, we could include what trimester they're in. Because if we find in literature that the trimester has an effect on the heat exposure, then we can include this in the early warning system pathway to provide proper warning for the pregnant women. So to conclude, 
it is important that the climate and health early warning system, they require sound evidence so that we can select proper variables and indices for the health risk assessment. And apart from the general population, we really want to focus that early warning system has the feasibility to integrate individual vulnerability factors so that we can provide personalized health risk warnings for vulnerable groups. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. If you're interested in this topic or the projects, feel free to talk to me uh, at the end of the day or at the breaks or come with questions at the end of the symposia. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
uh, degrees, especially disaggregated data on GDP and uh, WB, uh, and heat stress. Using the historical data in 2010, uh, we find that um, uh, African nations, as shown in the red bars in the bar chart, um, are, uh, are, are dominates uh, in the list uh, for which are mostly highly exposed to the heat stress um, uh, relative to different income groups. Uh, on the uh, on the other side of the pie chart, it shows the share of the uh, extreme heat stress by di different income levels. Uh, as we can see that Sub-Saharan Africans uh, are ha having the most extreme Gini index around 0.79, uh, which indicates extreme inequality uh, of heat income level. Uh, it suggests that 88% of the, expo uh, of the heat is exposed to the most lowest income level. Well, on the contrary, for Western European countries, um, only 45% of the heat is bared by the low income uh, population. So from our assessment, we find that um, there is a substantial variation uh, in heat exposure across income level among countries. So what are the determinants of this inequality um, uh, uh, of uh, exposure to the heat? Using historical data in 2010, uh, we implement a serious um, uh, uh, econometric, econometric analysis on correlating uh, GDP levels on the uh, heat income Gini index. Uh, we also uh, at WBGT and uh, a series of uh, demographic uh, features of the nation uh, into the regression. And we, in the end, find a significant inverted U-shaped relationship between the heat income Gini index and GDP as shown in the diagram uh, over there in the corner. So um, from this graph is kind of uh, this diagram just indicates uh, for, for illustration. But what it means is that uh, as economy starts to grow, heat inequality tends to rise uh, until a certain level. And this perhaps um, can be explained by the countries with low GDP, uh, which often has insufficient in infrastructure for cooling protection. And therefore, as GDP grows, um, they, they have rapid urban expansion, but without proper efficient planning, um, which perhaps leads to this urban heat island effect. And this could potentially increase the inequality within the nation. And uh, uh, beyond the threshold, um, there potentially be explained for the wealthier countries who has efficient uh, resources and awareness uh, on the planning uh, for the growth with, for instance, the green zones and the heat adaptive designs. And also, they may also uh, have more efficient policies to reduce heat stress, including uh, health warning system and regulations to protect labor forces uh, from expo exposure to the heat. So far, we have examined the present uh, heat disparities using historical records. But how will this evolve over time? So we also did the similar uh, computation for this exposure uh, disparities uh, over decades, you following different uh, SSP scenarios. Uh, the figure from uh, left to the right shows the share of the within country inequality the share of between country inequality, inequality and the global heat income Gini index. A good news from the last figure, we can see that the global heat income uh, disparities are decreasing over time, which is mainly driven by this um, decreasing between uh, country gaps. So, which means that the world has become more equal uh, exposed to the heat. But what we noticed that there is a remarkable increase uh, in the within country inequality. Um, and uh, this um, is quite, uh, I mean, uh, uh, deliver a 
quite important message here, uh, and which indicates that um, this, uh, where the wealthy people might be getting better access to the cooling situations, um, but the po poor population might be left uh, more exposed to the heat. So the last figure for my presentation I would like to show is that uh, on the top row, you will see the projected heat exposure uh, in 2095. Uh, but I would like you to focus on the second, the, the second row, um, which shows the change of uh, Gini uh, index uh, of heat exposure from 2010 to 2095. The red color denotes the growth of inequality and the blue denotes the decrease. Uh, several key takeaway message from this figure I would like to address. First is that countries like China and India are going to have a surge in heat inequality. And this kind of confirmed that they're locating in the lower section of this uh, reversed U-shaped curve. But also interestingly, interestingly, Western European and um, Northern America regions are also uh, predicted to face rising disparities in heat stress. And uh, this potentially suggests a shift in this relationship between GDP and the uh, heat exposure disparity. So to conclude, uh, from our research, we find that wor the world exhibits considerable inequality in heat exposure across different income levels. African countries experience the highest inequality in heat income distribution uh, in the current date. There is a significant uh, inverted U-shaped relationship between this heat income Gini index and GDP level. And in the end, for the long run, this disparity of heat exposure persists uh, in which climate change will actually play a very important role on increasing the within country uh, heat income disparity dramatically. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lillian. And uh, there will, of course, be opportunities for questions. Uh, we uh, do that after the talks. Uh, so please note down, these are very different talks, different topics, so you have to write down your questions and uh, your comments, uh, also on, online, of course. Um, so let's move to the next, and uh, we have two presenters uh, for the next uh, talk. Uh, that's uh, Christina Jakobsson and Erik Hansson, both from the School of Public Health and Community Medi Medicine, Salgrensk Academy of the uh, University of Gothenburg and also linked to this uh, La Isla network. And they will be presenting um, the PREP project that we have already heard about at this conference. Uh, PREP stands for Prevention, Resilience, Efficiency, and Protection for Workers in Industrial Agriculture in a Changing Climate. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, what we are going to present is the scientific part, the scientific evaluation in the PREP project. And some of you saw uh, a documentary from uh, um, Ingenio San Antonio, that is a sugar mill in Nicaragua where this project and this work was performed. Um, my researchers from different universities in collaboration with the La Isla Network. So, what is actually the problem? It is a problem of chronic kidney disease, which is on rise uh, all over the world. Diabetes and hypertension uh, are important factors for uh, an increased risk of chronic kidney disease, but there are others. And what has been uh, den denoted chronic kidney disease of non-traditional origin is disease which is not related to diabetes, not related to hypertension or other well-known risk factors. And it's usually observed in young persons, laborers in hot climate. This leads to thinking that heat stress may be an important driver 
um, easy to talk about that in this audience. But there may also be other factors behind this. And here I show you a map. Uh, most evident are areas uh, in green, yellow, and red, where the red areas uh, re re represent a higher incidence of chronic kidney disease. And as you can see, here is a map from Central America, but I could have shown you a map from, for instance, Sri Lanka, that it is unequally distributed. But there is another layer in this map, uh, and it is a layer about sugarcane production at high temperatures. And if you could have seen it clearly, in some of these uh, spatial points, these uh, red and sugarcane production areas coincide, in others not. Down here is Costa Rica, and Costa Rica has had a good mortality registry for many years. And if we look closer to the national data available, it was national data for creating this map. But here we can see that in a certain region, uh, the discrepancy between kidney mortality has increased over time, only in males compared to women in the area and compared to men in other parts of Costa Rica. And what could be behind this gap? Well, is it increased research and surveillance? Is it climate change? Uh, could it be that in this area, agriculture has been industrialized and subsistence farming is instead monoculture or sugarcane and production in peacework? But behind these uh, graphs, behind national statistics, there is suffering. A household socioeconomic study in communities depending on labor in the sugar mill in Nicaragua that you've seen uh, was produced in the documentary clearly show that if you have a family member with kidney disease, it affects not only that person, if it, it affects the household, it affects the community. And this kind of investigation is one part of what we are doing in PrEP. If heat stress, if hard work in heat actually is a driver of disease, then it should be possible to prevent. Uh, and that was and is still uh, the aim uh, of the Adelant and the PrEP project, to look at how to prevent heat stress in a workplace condition. And we were using this living lab, this sugarcane mill in Nicaragua. Access to water in the workplace is, of course, necessary. If you are going to drink water, there is a need for safe sanitation. But our experience is that maybe the most important thing is to have regulated rest in shade. Because if regulated rest in shade is part of the work day, it is part of your job to take a rest when it gets too hot. It's not avoiding job, it is part of your job duties. Then it is possible to fix the water, to fix the sanitation. But this is a mindset that needs to be incorporated at all levels in the workplace. For the workers, for the managed top management, for those who have to pay, and for the middle management who actually has to make this doable. And very clearly, even if the high temperatures are rising, it's nice and cool in the morning, but already after a couple of hours, then it's too hot to walk. But we do know that if we have regulated rest in shade with access to hydration, it is possible to keep the core body temperature uh, below 38 degrees, which is some kind of, of tipping point when it comes to harm. You can see here the pattern where the rest periods actually decrease the body temperature. So, it's obvious 
that working bodies become hot before the environment gets too hot. And it's possible to regulate that. So what has our research in PrEP in Atlanta been about? It has been about trying to look at what is actually happening, to get figures, to document, uh, and with a uh, focus on what workload means. But it's also trying to understand what is happening in the body, um, what are the mechanisms, what are what's actually happening, because we have to actually um, talk with the scientific community, with the medical community, and really um, give good, good evidence what heat actually makes in the cell, in the kidney. Uh, because to find uh, markers of kidney disease, markers of kidney injury, that could be used in the field with low uh, resources, and, and thus being able uh, to prevent individuals who are more susceptible, for instance. But maybe the key thing to make this work uh, came from the voices from low and middle management and the health promoters at this factory. Uh, an interview study with them, actually those who had to change their work tasks and change um, what they were doing in order to enforce this program. After a few years of this, they were very clear that it was a worthwhile struggle, and they were proud over the changes that they could see at the workplace. Uh, they were very clear about uh, the need to actually uh, find what they called, a, what could be summarized as a culture of care. And equally clear that a culture of, of care had immense tensions with the culture of production, which had been their form, former main goal. And this is also, and, and they said very clearly, to get this going, there is a need of formalization. You need to have indicators for production. They are already there. You need to have indicators uh, of work force health in order to actually being able to say that we are balancing. So that was the voices from low and middle management and health promoters in the field. And you can have a look at the poster if you uh, would like to have more details. But with this, I want to, uh, to go on and leave for and give you some more details of what actually happened. So, thank you, Christina. Yeah, so I will present. My name is Eric Hansen. I'm I'm used to be uh, Christina's uh, PhD student, and um, I um, have I will present some data from the evaluation that we have done at uh, Ingenio San Antonio. Um, so um, the, of this intervention. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> an illustration of this. So, so to summarize um, what the, the findings from the PrEP um, project is that quite, I mean, they're somewhat sim simple, but might, might be very difficult to actually implement at the workplace. But the concepts are pretty similar that mandated hourly rest, break, uh, rest breaks in the shade and that the shade is close to the workers and that they get uh, access to hydration and and also in this case electrolyte solution um, that that led to an improvement in their health outcomes and also they, they, they increased their productivity while doing this so there's not there's not really much research reason not to not to do this the company has a return on their investment and they preserve the health of their workforce so that's that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Christina and Eric, for this uh, very interesting 
presentation of this project. We move to another part of the world and another topic. So next speaker is Marta Oguna, Oguna from University of Washington, Kenya. And uh, the title of her talk is The Chamna Project, a behavioral change intervention to reduce adverse health impacts of heat on pregnant and postpartum women and neonates. And Chamna, that's an abbreviation for climate, heat, and maternal and neonatal health in Africa. Please. Thank you very much for the great introduction. Um, I want to present this great project that was done um, in Kilifi, Kenya. Um, and uh, a special mention to some of the colleagues in the consortium, especially special thanks to Sari and Matthew. So this was a consortium of different um, universities. Um, and this was a project that was done both in Burkina Faso and Kenya. So I'm going to present the one from Kenya. So this will be the structure. And so we'll start with the overview of the project. So we wanted to understand the experience of pregnant and postpartum women in extreme heat and their coping strategies and to co-develop an intervention with the community, then to understand the feasibility of the intervention. So from the literature, we see that high temperatures increase risk of preterm birth congenital abnormalities, still baths, hypertension and preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and in postpartum heat can reduce duration of breastfeeding. So when we go to the findings of the qualitative research, uh, we see that uh, women continue to do a lot of heavy work in extreme uh, heat and especially when there's conditions of drought. So we, these women are expected to continue to do household uh, chores during pregnancy, even when the temperatures are high. So we realize that there's physical exertion in the heat that leads to exhaustion, and it is perceived to cause miscarriage. So women in labor uh, often find it difficult to push in the heat, and uh, quite a number of healthcare workers uh, perceived that uh, caesarean sections um, was on the rise or increased as a result. So the drought usually makes uh, women walk very far uh, and some have to go with their babies because they don't have anyone to care uh, with them. They're strapped on the back to search for water and of course with drought uh, where they go to get water is quite far. Uh, and even if they leave the babies at home, uh, there's no one to tend for them. So the heavy workload also, we see that uh, it compromises the time that the mother tends to take care of the newborn, including breastfeeding and bonding. If the baby is strapped on the back, then you find that uh, uh, having time to put maybe like water down, firewood down, to start tending to the baby is quite difficult. Or even though they left the babies at home, then the time that they walk for bonding and breastfeeding will take time. So generally we saw that the knowledge of the effects of heat on the growing fetus and on pregnant and postpartum women was very limited in this community. So the intervention design is that uh, we co-designed with um, a number of 22 uh, people, which included pregnant and postpartum women, uh, stakeholders in the community, uh, including the chiefs, religious leaders, the health facility workers, NGO representatives, and the male spouses. Also, we included the officials from the Ministry of Health, Environment, Housing, Gender, and Agriculture. So we had guided discussions to select priority interventions for testing, and then eventually identified uh, potential opportunities and barriers to implementation. So when we go to the intervention, is that uh, we see that one of the interventions, we included the mothers-in-law and male spouses who play a very key role in the communities when it comes to um, helping the women so we had a one-off workshop 
uh, where we showed them videos and photos of women having heavy workload uh, while, you know, working during heat. And, um, you know, just to see what reaction they will have uh, in this and just to pledge that they will support the women with their daily tasks. Uh, the next is that we had um, a three-day workshop with the pregnant and postpartum women, uh, where we also showed them the videos and uh, photos and trying to tell them that uh, they can task shift, they can do it differently, uh, work uh, during uh, less uh, heated times. And so the healthcare workers also provided information on these effects of it in the pregnancy. And so these discussions mainly was to task shift, whereas instead of going to fetch water, fetch firewood during the heat, then they can do the simple works during the day. And most of this um, heavy workload, then they can do it either early in the morning or, or late in the evening when at least the sun is down or the heat is less. So the next was the gatekeepers and influencers, and this play a very key role in the communities. They're very uh, influential. And so uh, we encourage them to make public pledges, especially with the chiefs where uh, when they go to give their talks in what we call the barazas or, or a sitting, is that to include uh, health effects of heat and the need to help women during pregnancy and postpartum period. So the researchers, uh, we held two meetings with the community health units and uh, community health volunteers who usually go to households and communities and the religious leaders uh, just to include these hit messages. And as well, uh, we've had um, very great uh, meetings with the chiefs where more than 200 uh, people attended these meetings and had um, uh, these key messages about the importance of giving help to women uh, who are pregnant and postpartum and to just be able to know the effects of heat. So after the, this intervention, then we had the community health workers going to the communities uh, to follow up and to see whether the women were able to task shift if maybe they were fetching water during the day when the heat is too high, then if they were able to task shift and do some of this work during the morning hours and some do it uh, during the evening hours, and if they received any help from the mothers-in-law and male spouses and maybe the support system that they have within the household. Um, then we were looking at any challenges that uh, they really were experiencing during this time, even as we had talked to their uh, support system and to see whether this really worked. Um, so the evaluation of this project is that we had a baseline and an endline survey, uh, which was administered to these pregnant women and postpartum women, uh, which measured the perceptions of climate change. Did they know anything about climate change? change and its effects? Uh, did they have any knowledge, awareness of any heat-related risks? Uh, their behavior in breastfeeding and hydration? What are their coping mechanisms while in heat? The workload and any social support they are receiving from uh, the community. So the results for this is that one, we realized that women and their support networks reported really an improved understanding of heat effects uh, on pregnant and postpartum women and neonates. Uh, the next thing is that uh, quite a number of women reported that their mothers-in-law and male spouses had now begun to assist because now they understood the effects. And so uh, they were even able to disseminate this information to other households and to other neighbors uh, of the same uh, message. Uh, the next is that these women uh, say that um, uh, with the, the ones who have an unemployed male spouses and younger mother-in-laws tended to receive more help than those with employed spouses. 
or older mother-in-laws for obvious reasons. Um, most of the employed spouses will not really have time to help this mother uh, when they go out to, to do this work. And for the older mothers-in-law, they are not even able to do such hard work. Like, for example, going to fetch water, going to, to you know, to fetch firewood and uh, so on. Um, yeah, and some of these women also reported their spouses really found it challenging to perform some of these activities, considering that majority of these communities consider that uh, there's some work for men and there's some work for women. And so uh, it's very difficult sometimes to, you know, especially the peer, people would tell the man that you're not man enough, cannot be doing this work for a woman, so we don't expect you to do, be doing this. And so they fear the stigmatization, even in as much as they wanted to help from their male peers. And then finally, uh, we saw that women uh, reported at least an understanding of the coping strategies in the heat and uh, remaining hydrated during this heat uh, period, uh, reducing their workload, uh, even breastfeeding frequently and not really uh, layering the newborns with heavy clothing. And uh, finally, the conclusion is that we see that communities' approaches to support pregnant and postpartum women during periods of heat are really feasible, but shifts in behavior really take time. Um, it's also feasible that uh, training the key community influencers is really key and must in, be included in the heat health messaging, in, in their work, in their community work, in their meetings. And also more research is really needed to see whether it's sustainable uh, to repeat these trainings, just to be able to keep informing them of these key issues in the community. And finally, we see that the future heat adaptation interventions focused on maternal neonatal health should also really consider factors such as employment, age, gender roles, and support networks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Marta, for this uh, enlightening presentation. We move over to the next one. That's uh, Nana Rose Diakite. Uh, she's from the University of Côte d'Ivoire, and there is a more French name of that department, but I don't think I can <laughs> pronounce. Uh, so, but uh, anyway, so um, uh, Rose, uh, you will be presenting the um, SNCC project in uh, Belmont Forum, and that's an uh, abbreviation for Integrated Risk Mapping and Targeted Snail Control to Support Schistosomiasis Elimination in Brazil and Cote d'Ivoire under Future Climate Change. Yes. Thank you, Christine. I, I am Rose from Cote d'Ivoire, happy to be at this uh, conference to present our work on the biological traits variability of schizosomiasis intermediate or snails from three climatic zones of Côte d'Ivoire. This project, this work, it is a part of the Belmont Forum project entitled Integrated Risk Mapping and Talking Snail Control to Support Schizosomiasis Elimination in Brazil and Côte d'Ivoire under future climate change. This work in Côte d'Ivoire is funded by the, the Passeres. And our work we present today is the first objective of the Belmont Forum uh, project. And uh, we, we, we want to, to, to know if there is a, a variation of the, the, in the climatic change. And in this work, we have to, to present the risk of this change. Where we are, we are several teams are working in this project from Africa, from Europe, and from America. And we are the team of the Côte d'Ivoire in the University Félix Oufé-Boigny and the Centre de Recherche Océanologique CRIO in Côte d'Ivoire. Why schistosomiasis? Unfortunately, schistosomiasis is a debilitating parasitic disease and we know that 78 countries are infected 
and also 2,000 million of persons are infected in Africa. Why schizosomiasis and climate change? When we look to this uh, cycle of transmission, we see that the parasite need two hosts, a vertebrate host and the intermediate snail host. The parasite from the human back to the, go to the snail, and uh, from the snail go to the to infected pupil, infected pupil. Also, when we look for the free stage, the parasite larva, the eggs and the intermediate host, all are aquatic. And we think that climate change can have the, if the, can, can influence this uh, larva, and these intermediate or snails. So climate change, global warming, and uh, can have an effect on the biology and the ecology of these uh, intermediate or snails. And also, we think that these intermediate or snails are very risk for the population. So our study, we intend to, we intend to to answer to, why, to this question, what is, the influence, what is the influence of climatic factor on the life cycle parameters of the intermediate osnes of schizosomiasis in Côte d'Ivoire? Côte d'Ivoire is located in West Africa. And when we see in this map, we see that we have schizosomiasis, schizosom uh, hematobium and schizosom mansonae where, uh, where have a high, a high prevalence in the western part and in the south part. And unfortunately, we have the, these two species in Côte d'Ivoire, and people are suffer from this disease. We are working in three bioclimatic zones. In the, we have in the, in the north, in the north, in the center part and in the southern part. In the north, we have two seasons, a long dry season and a short rainy season. In the preforest part, in the central part, we have two seasons. And in the southern part, we have four seasons, two rainy seasons and two dry seasons. And so we have collected Bellunis truncatus in the north, in the center part and collected also Bionfalaria in the center part and in the southern part. Our experimental design is presented here. We collected snail from the, from the natural population and we rearing them in the laboratory. So we use the first generation to do our work. And the monitoring of the live story tray was the size the growth, the fecundity, and the survival. What we obtain for the survival curve, we, we, we saw that Bionis truncatus mortality was significantly higher of the snail population in the center in red and in the north in blue. For the Bionfalaria, we see that there is no difference in survival between the center in green and in the south. About the growth rate and the reproductive output of two populations of Bilionis truncatus, we notice that for this, we have two discriminatory traits. We have the size and the number of eggs at the first reproduction. So we, we notice that the snails in the north are more robust than the, the snail of the center part. Also, for Bionfalaria feferi, we notice that the discriminatory traits are more. We are the size at the, the size at the first week, the size at the seventh week, and the size at the first reproduction. The number of eggs at the first reproduction, the number of eggs per capsule at the first reproduction, and the average of the number of eggs. What we learn in this experimental 
experimental study. This study highlights the variability according the, to the bioclimatic area of survival, somatic, growth, and fecundity collected in three bioclimatic areas of Côte d'Ivoire. Firstly, Bilinus truncatus population for the northern, more arid climatic zone exhibited higher survival than those of the central Côte d'Ivoire. And for the Bionfal area from the south, these snails were larger, maturate faster, and higher fecundity than the population from the central part. We think that in the future, we want to, 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 to go on, on this study. So for this study, I did it to assess whether the OSWEB heterogeneity in the life story traits are an adaptation to different climatic zones or simply the result of genetic drive for seasonal population fluctuation. And uh, this work can help us to understand the variation of basic life story trait of medically important snails across different ecozones. Firstly, to provide valuable information to improve our understanding of snail population dynamic associated with present and future climate regime, and ultimately improve effort to control and eliminate this disease. Finally, I want to acknowledge the lead of this project, Belmont Former Project, Professor Gulio, for his warming and uh, amazing collaboration. The PI of this uh, local project in Côte d'Ivoire, Professor Goran, and the other colleagues. Thank you for your attention and merci. Thank you, Rose. Very interesting presentation about a horrible disease linked to climate change. Uh, so now we are moving over to the last uh, project. Um, and it's going to be a bit different than uh, the traditional presentations. So I'm ex as excited as <laughs> you may be. Um, so um, uh, this is a group of people from the Norwegian Public Health Institute. Uh, it's uh, Sonja Myra. Steve French and Oni Gobi Nathan, uh, and they will present some work they have been doing within uh, the Belmont Forum project CCCEHN, one of, not one of the <laughs> best abbreviations. It stands for Community Collective Action to Respond to Climate Change Influencing the Environment he Health Nexus. So please, uh, you might yeah. need some time to rig yourself. <laughs> so maybe we have time for one yeah. question for the previous speakers in case um, or are you ready are you uh, if you're ready yeah can you then we take all the questions at the end the floor yeah. Is yeah take a seat yeah Thank you for that introduction, Kristen. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to share this work. Um, so today, our presentation is going to highlight the development process of four films that showcase the impact of climate change on the community of Toko, and also aims to capture the diverse perspectives from local community members. Uh, so as Kristen mentioned, this was work that was conducted as part of a Belmont-funded project. Uh, I won't go through the CCC, but it, uh, EHN, but it focused on collective community action, climate change, and health in the coastal communities of Trinidad and Tobago, and also in Sitka, Alaska. So today we have the pleasure of discussing these films with our colleague, uh, Uni uh, Gamatten, and our, our senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And unfortunately, our uh, partner in Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Michelle Scobie, uh, she's a law professor at the University of West Indies, was unable to attend. Uh, but I really want to acknowledge that uh, these films, these were her idea, her ambition and dedication that led to the creation of these. Uh, so we hope to bring her spirit into this discussion. Uh, so anyways, we, we're trying to uh, format this more as a discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to join Uni. Um, so without further ado, um, can you describe the background and the project motivation in making these films? 
Thank you, Sonia. Uh, so in our uh, research, we did observations and we had interviews with members of community organizations, volunteer-based organizations that in Toko, which is on the northeastern tip of uh, Trinidad. Uh, it's quite a small village, so like 1,500 people only. Um, we deal with different social and environmental problems, and we increasingly will be dealing with climate-related impacts. And when we heard, uh, we looked at all this data, which we call data because it was qualitative data, we saw that they co contain powerful narratives, stories that we wanted expressed in a way that regular research articles can't. And really, Michelle pushed this idea of let's do some videos which can serve as an important medium for these members to channel their experiences from a comfortable space on their own terms, with their own words, of how, of how climate uh, influences lives and livelihoods. And this also gave them an opportunity to talk about more entrenched problems like poverty and un unemployment that intersect with climate-related impacts as well. Which, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so thank you. So, that, so we wanted to take this opportunity to, to show you some of these clips. And so the first clip is showcasing the impact of uh, climate change in, in Toko. So go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that um, you're seeing evidence of sea level rise. Um, like in the case of Granny Bear, there's a rock on the beach. We call the rock Buntu. It's at the end of the beach. And you could have gone down the beach, walk around the rock, and there was like about 40 to 50 feet of sand between the rock and the sea. Now the rock is in the sea. So in my lifetime, I have seen the sea come closer to land. Yeah, so I, this was just one yes, clip I, of I many that, I'm, seeing uh, that really showcased this dramatic impact. Um, so could you, could you tr describe more on what you think the primary message of Len Peters was in, um, what was the message he was trying to convey? So I think from this video and others, we, we kind of heard that two points became evident. One is that coastal communities like Toko have over generations experienced that climate influences live and livelihoods and the idea that the climate can shift is something they have a history of experiencing. At the same time, uh, the accelerating rate of climate change means that individuals are witnessing different impacts. Some subtle changes like the ones you heard here but others are more severe consequences for livelihoods like fishing or farming within their own lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with that, uh, that's the perfect transition to the next two clips that we wanted to showcase. Uh, and of course, being a coastal community, uh, the livelihoods of fishing, farming, and tourism play a huge part. So we have two clips we wanted to share with you. To a few years ago, we had um, lots and lots of seaweed on, came up on the coast and it, um, it hampered the, um, the turtles from being able to lay and blocked off the beaches and it was hard for fisher people and uh, for people to enjoy the, um, for regular citizens to enjoy the, uh, the beaches. To a few years. Last 10 years, uh, most people who get affected with the weather are the fishermen fishermen. Sometimes they are caught um, unprepared with the change of weather pattern and their boats will be out in the ocean and they will get some of them will get their boats damaged. Yeah, thank you. So that the first clip actually alluded a bit to the the turtle ecotourism there and then the second of course is alluding to, um, to fishing. Uh, so how do you think the community members experience the impact of climate change with regard to their livelihoods? So uh, what we got to hear a lot was how people's lives and livelihoods in talk are intimately connected with the environment and its vulnerabilities. And they're able to, we're able to make clear connections in different ways between how climate affects uh, lives and livelihoods. For example, the, as we heard, a negative influence on fishing, which can lead to changes in availability of seafood or effects on um, the turtle nesting, which is kind of uh, one of the attractions of tourism, leading to eff negative effects on income, which leads to other social problems. Um, 
And at the same time, I think it's important to stress that uh, these community are agents, uh, part of solving these challenges to the extent they are able to at that level, harnessing the deep local knowledge to adapt and sustain livelihoods amidst these challenges, using adopting new technologies or predicting weather changes so that they can do fishing in more uh, uh, less uh, burdensome conditions and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in this project, one thing we also noticed and wanted to uh, really uh, elucidate was these dots that are connecting livelihoods to health. And so in the next two clips, uh, what we're looking at is uh, the direct and actually indirect impacts on health. So we have two clips here, thanks. If I look at a third health challenge, it would be probably lifestyle in terms of diet. In terms of diet. Um, you would think that because we're living in Toko, Toko people eat a lot of healthy things. They may have. If I look at a third health challenge. If there is an emergency, we have to traverse 29 miles, whether it's for maternity, whether it's for whatever else. We have to traverse 29 miles. By that time, the person might die, the baby will be born on the way. So, uh, I think everyone in this room uh, has heard that WHO has pointed out that climate change is the biggest threat to health facing humanity. Uh, so with that in mind, how do you think community members are aware of how climate change is directly or indirectly influencing their health? So I think um, as individuals, and that goes for community members, but I think that it goes for all of us, that we experience and feel what's immediate and close. So that's the poor roles that have disrupted access to medical care or poor access to healthy food that leads to bad diets. But people often don't necessarily think about the more preceding or upstream distant causal factors. And I think we, and this includes us as public health scientists or researchers uh, dealing with these questions, are still learning how to express this connection between what people experience in a, a close sense or a day-to-day -day sense and these more global drivers of climate, global drivers influencing these factors like climate change, uh, but also other, other more macro social uh, trends. Mm. Yeah, and um, we're going to share one last clip, which is on the uh, community members' perspective on policy making. What happened most of the time is that we are forced internationally to sign policies and sign treaties. So we sign those things internationally. And then we look at what we sign internationally, and then we adopt something at a country level and say, this is we country policy, right? Coming off of the international thing that they force us to do. Really and truly, what's supposed to happen? Is that policy supposed to be developed from the ground? So I think this is a really compelling clip on how things play out on the local level and the lack of engagement that might be experienced in some communities. Uh, so can you comment on how local communities uh, can be involved in designing policy and do you think the locals' needs are neglected? Yeah, I guess I first head on should acknowledge the irony in that we're sitting here and trying to represent what's being said very far away, but uh, notwithstanding that limitation, uh, I think what we heard here and also in our in the research which we tried to convey through our articles is that plans decisions are made about these communities and these communities are at the front line of uh, responding to the effects of climate change but at the same time decisions and plans are made without their involvement to a large mm -hmm. extent and this absence of community rep representation but also absence of thinking more active or methods for Achieving that is, a, I think, a major gap in how uh, policies are formulated for climate change, but also for other issues. And this perspective, important perspective we learned from TOKO is that what people experience uh, concerns about might diverge from what's driven, kind of driven from global or national agendas. And an effective solutions uh, for them cannot separate, cannot, effective solutions cannot separate uh, climate-related issues from the more immediate social, economic problems that they're facing. I think that um, 
we got to learn and we discussed this a lot in our project that those concerns are often underplayed mm. uh, including by us as scientists because we are we narrow in on a certain part of the challenge they're facing yeah. uh, the last thing i want to say before we close off is i want to acknowledge uh, michelle again i think she's listening so michelle if you're listening i hope we did <laughs> some justice to your work um yeah, and yeah, just to conclude, I think that both Uni and I really felt privileged to be a part of this project and again to acknowledge all of Michelle's efforts and our other partners. Um, I think it was a really unique project and at least for me, especially when we in in um, being involved a bit in the this um, these videos and this it's there's a series of four as I mentioned, uh, but just to see the power of um, of hearing voices, seeing these emotions, their expressions, and in the context of their community, I felt that this is this is something quite quite powerful, and that we it's difficult to achieve when you're writing a scientific article. So that was one point. And then also, I think a little bit unexpectedly, we found uh, um, that uh, maybe learning about the community experiences were a bit what we maybe weren't weren't expecting so the value and the importance of getting these local uh, perspectives and making sure that those are very much um, heard so that's um, that's the conclusion just to say that if you are interested in the the series um, they are available on youtube there's four of them and welcome any questions thank you so much thank you thanks a lot so now we have been exposed to the vari variety of uh, some of the Belmont Forum projects. So we have some time, not very much, I'm afraid, but we have 10 minutes for Q&A. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, I'm sure there is, yeah, there's one down there. Hi again. Sorry, I asked too many questions. I know. Um, I have a question for Christine. Christina, you showed a, a map of an, uh, of areas with a uh, lot of sugarcane and uh, overlapped with um, uh, areas with high kidney uh, incidence uh, or prevalence. Um, and uh, I was wondering. Um, in Nicaragua, it was also um, two areas, and one was in the red and one was in the green. And I was wondering if you took the opportunity to do an ob observational study to see if there's any particular differences between the two areas and why uh, both areas were in, in high temperatures uh, and, and one had kidney disease and the other not. Perhaps there were already uh, other natural um, practices that was, were going on in, in the one area versus the other. That was my question. Okay, um, thank you for your question. I didn't quite hear, was this in a specific area or in general? Like you said some name of some area or no? Well, um, in the, the map you showed, yeah. uh, in you did your work in Nicaragua. Yeah. Uh, the one was in the red. I presume you did most of your uh, living lab work in the area with the yeah. high kidney uh, disease yeah. frequency. Yeah. Um, but there was also uh, an area just, just to the... Um, uh, the east of it, where there wasn't this high uh, uh, frequency. So, uh, to me, that would be like the, the perfect opportunity to do an observational study, not an experimental study, to see if there were particular differences in the practices, perhaps already practices practiced in the area without the kidney disease versus. But it could be many other uh, environmental uh, factors as well. I understand. What What you actually are pointing out is that this kind of visualization of already existing data opens up for just what you are saying, to find places where there are specific patterns and patterns that might be different. And as you are saying, uh, this kind of visualization of identification, uh, which will show you what you know and what you don't know, uh, that would give indications on where we have to actually do our research. So thank you for pointing out the power of this type of reuse of existing data with the new tools of geographical information systems and the possibility to overlayer different types uh, of information on geography, on climate, on population, etc., etc. I can add to the specific of Nicaragua and to the to the east of that area. It's more of a highland country with coffee plantations and. That's the same in all of these five countries, that there is also highland coffee growing areas where there's no CKD, so, and it's not so hot either. So that could be one 
at least in the uh, paper that we discussed as one possible difference, yeah. Great, thanks. Are there more questions? And please introduce yourself, even though you have asked questions previously, maybe we don't remember. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Claudia from the Norwegian Red Cross. Uh, I'm not a researcher. Uh, we are trying to uh, get our programs running as we have conflict and the war is burning for many other issues. And I have a question that I can actually apply to any of the presenters. Um, we started the conference talking about universal health coverage. Uh, we know that PHC primary health care is the foundation towards it. Um, it will be very interesting to see how do you see integration and health system strengthening in everything that we are talking. And do you think that it's a threat that some of these hazards would also become vertical programs? We have learned a lot uh, before from the management of uh, verticalization of diseases, TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS. And we have learned that we need to integrate and we need a health system strengthening approach. So we hit a hit is all over. Uh, we are creating a lot of knowledge, but how do you think we can integrate that and how we can in ensure that at the end, the practitioner that is in the field doesn't need a nap for every single hazard that we are following up or that the health worker uh, can have an integrated approach uh, to, to the exposures that, that they have to, to face at the end. So I think it's open and I think it will be valid for any of the projects that we presented. Thank you. That was an interesting question. I'm sure it's relevant to several of you. Anyone who would like to uh, address the question, uh, how uh, health workers, maybe back to Christina, you are, or... <laughs> Maybe the question was too difficult to try. And then we have a go here. <laughs> All right. Uh, forced to answer this. Um, from my perspective, oh, yeah. So, from my perspective, I would focus on trying to provide as much information as possible with as little cognitive uh, force on the user so that they don't have to think too much about the information, just intuitively understand what they need to do with, for example, the warning from a heat perspective. That, that is my perspective on the matter. But yeah, including these uh, risks uh, when it comes to conflicts is out of my expertise. But perfectly, I have a savior here. I, I, I don't think I'll come with the convincing response, but uh, working since we work in a national public health institute, we kind of what we try to do in our any collaboration is that we try to integrate what we do in the kind of routine functions of a country, whether that's surveillance or preparedness. But yeah, I think you're right. There is always this risk that when there is this issue that gets a lot of attention, it it wants its own vertical focus. So in some cases, it becomes its uh, you know self-serving prophecy. Um, uh, I think in, the, in one sense, it, climate change and health is needs to be integrated in health systems. In other ways, it's much bigger than health systems. It's, it's about society at large. And I, I, I think we're seeing probably the beginnings, definitely in the, in the, in the at least in, from the National Public Health Institute perspective, this is increasing priority. And I don't know, Tony, if you want to say that, I think you, <laughs> okay, you work on this more than me, but uh, uh, from that perspective, the goal is full integration but whether that will be the case in every country, I don't know. And I guess you, you have probably observed things that suggest otherwise. So maybe you can counter response. Thanks a lot. We have a, actually an online question. So uh, Gunnel, you will convey this. Thanks. We have uh, three questions from three online participants. Um, one is, uh, how, how do you define heat stress in your study? This is to Linma. And uh, do you take into account differences in heat thresholds between countries? The second is for Jakob. How do you investigate or tailor the personal factors in climap? And then there is one for Chamna, which is, um, do you have uh, any had any interest from stakeholders in other countries? If you have any plans for scaling up or the project. 
So maybe you'll have to repeat, but we'll see. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so just to be a uh, clarify, so in our study, uh, we just used this uh, WBGT uh, defined as the uh, heat stress, but definitely there are lots of measures that could be used to, to uh, check the robust of the results. Um, and to um, um, uh, refer on the or, or to have the comment on the uh, on the second question regarding to the benchmark of different countries uh, regarding to different uh, heat stress levels. Um, for now, um, uh, to be honest, we don't have very good data on this thing, um, but. I think to some extent, uh, from our econometric uh, analysis part, we're uh, relatively controlled for the location, the climate zone, which to some extent could represent the threshold of this heat stress for different countries. Uh, so which kind of like uh, introduce um, a heterogeneity, a fixed, a heterogeneous fixed effects uh, on this uh, uh, heat stress threshold for different countries. Thank you, Lynn. All right, so I think the question for me was about how we tailor the individual factors in ClimbUp. Uh, so in ClimbUp, we want to know the anthropometric data of the user because that is important when it comes to heat fluxes. Uh, and then it is a question about balancing the cognitive load of the user and also the accuracy of the models. So for example, for, he, uh, for activity and clothing, we have different levels that the user can select. So for example, clothing, they can select between um, summer clothing, um, business suit, and then winter clothing, for example. But if they're more interested, then they can also try to personalize this even further by adjusting if they have the expertise to do so. So it's about, yeah, the cognitive load, but also the accuracy of the models. So it's a tricky question. and. Yeah, a very tough uh, task for a researcher to try to reach out to the users that are not as in-depth as we are. And Thank you. And Marta, would you like to share some? Um, I guess the question was, uh, is there chances to scale up? Maybe you can repeat the question. And sustainability. All right, there has been uh, conversations on this, and definitely scale up would be one of the greatest uh, interest we would, ha we would be having. And this would be interesting to have to see whether this can be done in other countries, in as much as that this was also done in Burkina Faso and uh, Kenya. Uh, but I was presenting for Kenya. But it would be interesting to have other countries, especially the African countries, being able to to do this kind of work and see the comparisons, yeah. Thank you, uh, Christina, we have some is it question or comment? Uh, so. I have a question and it's uh, actually not to Jakob, it's a more general question. Uh, and it is about early warning systems. They are created within uh, projects, they are happily launched. And then the program is over, the money, is gone and there is no structure for updating for simple things like updating data and for more complicated things how to actually get this uh, uh, to, be, to, to become of societal value and to me it is a problem that we lack this uh, sustainability of what we actually are creating Thanks for sharing that. That goes to all of us. Frustration about funding that's ended. Would you, would you like to say anything? All right. I'll try to jump on this horse as well. Um, I could definitely say that it is a struggle within the project that you try to develop something and then that takes quite a lot of time and planning and then you have very little time for actually doing evaluation of the um, product and then you want to implement the product, and then you're supposed to evaluate the implementation as well. So I think that we would actually need several more years in order to just get the product evaluated before it is implemented. And this is a huge problem, I would say. So. 
thanks a lot. Um, time is up, so I think we have to uh, close the session. And I encourage every one of you to follow what's going on in the Bedmond Forum projects. There was a new call recently, so there will be a lot of new projects starting up next year. So uh, please have a look at what uh, is coming out of that. And thank you for joining this session. Uh, we're going to start uh, at 1.30 in the afternoon. See you later. Enjoy your lunch. So, uh, welcome to this session on health impacts of heat stress. Uh, we have uh, six splendid speakers today. Um, and we will start off with Malcolm Mystery, who is at the LSHTM. He will speak about regional variation in the role of humidity and city level heat related mortality. Please, Malcolm, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, it works. Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for joining over here and not going somewhere else. Uh, so this work is um, quite a wider collaboration work. As you can see, there are lots of co-authors and we still have more people from the multi-country, multi-city um, collaborative network over here that I've underlined. So basically this is a network of researchers uh, based in different countries around the world and uh, not only doing research, but also providing a lot of important data for um, environmental epidemiology. Uh, this work is led by one of the PhD students in the University of Tokyo, who's actually just completed his PhD. And uh, I'm taking the honor to present it, but it's also a big component of my Marie Curie research work that I'm currently uh, doing. Right, so without wasting any more time, what is this work about? By the way, this has just recently been submitted to Science Advances, so um, I can't uh, show you all the results in this uh, short period of time, and unfortunately, I cannot even guide you to an online version of this paper, so hopefully you will find it published uh, somewhere in the coming months. Right, uh, so the background, um, and the research objectives is how I will begin with this presentation. Then we'll move on to the data and the methodology. Um, I'll focus a bit more on the results part and the key summary and conclusions from this work. Right. I think uh, I can at least see there are quite a lot of environmental epidemiologists in this room and probably some uh, people from uh, working on the human physiology. Um, so I don't need to spend too much time to probably highlight that humidity uh, plays a crucial, relative humidity rather, plays a crucial role in the way our body sweats and uh, controls the core body temperature. So if you're in an environment where it's hot, but it's also the relative humidity is quite high, you feel a lot more um, muggy in a way, uh, sticky, and it, it makes it more difficult for your body to uh, reduce the temperature. So humidity does have some importance in regulating our body mechanism, the temperature mechanism. Now, it's also been published in uh, recent years and widely cited that the humid heat stress is uh, projected to rise. So this is a very famous paper from 2017 that shows that the combination of high ambient daily temperature and uh, relative humidity 
is projected to exceed what is called as a lethal stress level. So I encourage you to have a look at this paper if you're not aware of it, but then there are others as well that show that we are entering in some uncharted territory where you are likely to have severe threat to human survivability. So what is the motivation of uh, this present work? Well, physiological evidence suggests that humidity is an important factor along with the ambient temperature. Uh, in some form of, or the other, in some way or the other, which is typically modeled using heat stress indices as combinations of temperature and relative humidity, and sometimes even uh, radiation and wind. However, if you look at environmental epidemiology, there's still sort of a lack of evidence that um, humidity plays a role. I'm referring here to mortality, so let me be very clear. There are many other health outcomes, but human mortality. So there's still a bit of disconnect between the physiological evidence and the environmental epidemiology. And this forms one of the main motivations of this work. Um, there are also more than 100 heat stress indices. So it's also difficult to say which one is better and whether it works for all locations. So there's no one size that fits all. And the other motivation is also this sort of heated debate that was also published just recently um, about why the environmental epidemiologists especially are unable to pinpoint um, specifically under what con conditions humidity starts playing a role. So this is one of the key research objective of this work. So it's not about trying to say that the ambient air temperature is not important. What we are trying to identify over here specifically is regions where humidity can have some impact in terms of uh, heat-related mortality. Now, most specifically, we are trying to identify these location level uh, characteristics where these heat stress indices exhibit um, a more uh, predictive uh, capabilities compared to just air temperature when modeling mortality. OK, so this was about the motivation and um, the key objectives of the work. What we use, data, and we need quite a lot of data if we are working on global scales. So firstly, we, the climate data, uh, it comes from the ECMWF RFI reanalysis data set. We utilize hourly um, meteorological variables from era five at local time uh, exposures. So we convert them to local time. And the time period is from 1980 to 2019. And these are the variables that we utilize in our work. Uh, the ambient near surface day temp uh, the near surface temperature, dew point, solar radiation, wind speed, and uh, surface air pressure. The mortality data, which is the daily counts of all cause or non-external causes, comes from the wider MCC collaborative network. And for this study, we have 43 countries and uh, about 740 cities, um, which is the database is slowly expanding. Uh, there are, however, some limitations in the data. If you observe, you might notice that we do have a gap in mortality data covering uh, large parts of Africa, even Southeast Asia. Uh, so most of the data indeed comes from the temperate regions of uh, Europe and North America, but we believe that the locations are well spread out with uh, different climate regimes to capture this kind of uh, what, what is required for this study. And uh, we also have some other variables from this data set, including socioeconomic, uh, demographic, and so on. Uh, this is a very quick uh, map of what the data, the key variables, the humidity, uh, annual mean relative humidity on the right and the annual mean uh, temperature, air temperature. And it gives you a sense of what these levels are. Uh, so we have 
uh, some high levels of annual average temperatures as well as the relative humidities. And this gives you the geographical sort of breakdown of the locations. So as I mentioned, North America over here and Europe, when put together, has the bulk of the uh, representation of the data. Sorry. OK, so what about the heat stress indices that we are using in this work? We are using, uh, first, we use the air temperature itself because we are comparing, in a way, the skills of other heat stress indices relative to temperature. So that's our first uh, heat stress index. And the others include, in different ways, how humidity relative humidity and air temperature interact. So they have a sort of different sensitivity and how much of uh, the relative humidity is a component in that formulation. And I'll come to that in some time. Now, this is just one example. Uh, this is the wet bulb temperature. So it gives you a sense of how relative humidity is part of it. And we focus on the warmest six consecutive months for each location. In our study, in our in our study, and we focus not only on the daily mean exposures but also on daily maximum exposures. But the reason I underline here mean is because I'll be showing you the results of the daily mean exposures, which largely also are equivalent to the maximum exposures. Methodology: um, This has been widely published in the MCC uh, studies. So broadly speaking, it is based on this. Uh, distributed lag nonlinear model framework, uh, which allows you to not only model the lag relationship of the exposure variable and mortality, but also the nonlinearity in it. And it also accounts for uh, the, the trends in the data and the time series, so you can control for seasonality as well as for uh, short and long-term trends. And we use a, a Poisson model to uh, basically the outcome over here is the daily counts of mortality and of interest is this over here, which are the individual heat stress indices that I showed in the previous table. We control for the time component, seasonality, and some other confounding variables. So um, we use what is called as the quasi Akaike information criteria to do the evaluation of the model fit. So essentially, the lower the QAIC, the better fit. Uh, is the model for that specific heat stress indicator. OK, I'll just move on a bit more quickly now to the results part, which is a bit more interesting. So first, over here, I'm showing you the spatial diversity of the best fit indicator. So we use this DLNM framework to with each of this heat stress indicator as the exposure variable and fit the model. And then we find that there is spatial heterogeneity depending on which part of the world the location is. And the, then depends on that where your heat stress indicator is uh, the best fit indicator. So in this case, the color scale, the more darker it gets, basically it means that location has a higher, <clears throat> excuse me, a higher weighting of relative humidity in its, uh, in its formulation. All right, so this is the breakup. We find that actually for, oops, this is, this is the breakup. We actually find that approximately equal proportion of locations have a preference for dry heat and humid heat, and by uh, humid heat mat matrix. So basically, if we categorize these heat stress indices as humid heat, and then we get about 231 locations where these, one of these indices uh, performs better than air temperature. And what we then do is we fit, a, uh, we, we, we use these uh, characteristics, this 12 city features in a random forest model to try and understand which of these features is important in, in telling us where humidity matters. So to do that, the, what we end up getting is basically the most important feature out of this random forest is the correlation in the air temperature between the air temperature and relative humidity. So to put very simply, wherever you have 
the expected negative correlation, because as the air temperature rises, you would expect the relative humidity to be lower. So wherever you have this negative correlation between the two is also where you tend to have uh, the air temperature performing as the best predictor. But in some places where you have either a weak positive correlation or no correlation between air temperature and relative humidity, that's where these heat stress index indices that are weighted towards uh, humidity starts playing a prominent role. So this is one of the key findings of this work. And I think this is an important finding. This is uh, essentially showing you the same, so I can just skip over it. But this is, I think, a key finding, because for the first time, we are, we are able to start pinpointing across locations where we have mortality data as to whether humidity plays an important role, and if so, what are the underlying reasons for that? Um, how can we take this research further? I think it can start, uh, when, you, when you think of uh, location-specific uh, heat alert warning systems, you can think of a potential application of these heat stress indices as an exposure uh, variable. So this is one of the key applications of uh, this work. We, however, uh, do not find uh, large differences in the number of excess deaths, whether you use the air temperature, whether you use heat stress indicator uh, at a um, regional scale. We don't, find, we don't find any large differences between the two, which tends to suggest that the daily air temperature, the daily mean air temperature, continues to remain the preferred variable for climate health impact assessments. OK, and with that, I'll uh, end and just to acknowledge the data providers, uh, the wider team of the MCC, and uh, the grant that I'm funded by. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Malcolm. I wish we could have even more time for each talk, <clears throat> but we'll need some time for questions sure. as well. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thank you. So we just move directly over to the next speaker, Esme Essers. There you are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working at Barcelona Institute for Global Health in Spain. And the title of uh, your talk is Ambient Temperature Exposure and Fetal Size, Fetal Growth and Birth Outcomes in Three European Birth Cohorts. Yeah. Yeah. There. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Esme Essers, and I am a predoctoral researcher. Um, I work at IS Global in Barcelona and also Erasmus MC in Rotterdam. Um, and I'm excited to share the results from my project on ambient temperature exposure and fetal size and growth using data from three European birth cohorts. So I don't think I have to warn anybody about climate change here. That's why we're all here. But I do want to highlight that Europe has emerged as a climatic hotspot. Um, so doing this research in these three European birth cohorts is even more important. So previous research looking at temperature exposure during adolescence and adulthood mainly focus on mortality and morbidity. Um, and research focusing on temperature exposure during earlier life or pregnancy focuses mainly on birth outcomes. So for example, here you can see an overview. Um, outcomes are preterm birth, stillbirth, and birth weight, where it's really clear that most of the studies are identifying um, an increased risk, risk or an association with adverse birth outcomes. And most of the research is done in uh, heat exposure and less so for cold. So the biological mechanism between temperature exposure and fetal growth is still largely unknown. Um, but what people think is that um, as a result um, of temperature variation or temperature changes, there are a, a slew of mechanisms that happen in the pregnant woman. For example, inflammatory uh, responses, oxidative stress, disruption of blood flow. This can all ha influence the thermal regulation within the pregnant woman and also uh, disrupt the placental formation. And that all combined might influence fetal growth um, and size throughout gestation. So while a lot of research focuses on birth outcomes, uh, they fail to look at fetal size during pregnancy and fetal growth uh, during pregnancy, which is important because possi possible deviated growth across pregnancy um, might have an influence um, during childhood and adulthood, for example, an increased risk in cardiovascular diseases. So the aim of my project was to evaluate the association between ambient temperature exposure throughout pregnancy and fetal size and growth in three European birth cohorts. 
Um, and I'm also trying to see if I can identify specific vulnerability periods, periods throughout gestation. We use data from three European-based um, population population-based cohort studies, um, INMA from Spain, of which we used four regions, um, Generation R from the Netherlands, and the Born in Bradford cohort from the UK. Um, after excluding um, mothers who didn't have the data that we needed, we ended up with almost 19,000 subjects. For the temperature exposure, we had to take three steps. First, we had to select the spatial domains where the temperature would be modeled for us. These are 30 by 30 kilometer uh, domains, and we place them based on the geographical location with the maximum number of geocodes throughout pregnancy. So one above, or one above Rotterdam, one above Sabadell, etc. We sent these domains to a company in Belgium called Vito, and they used their HerbClim model, uh, and were able to model hourly air temperature data at a very high spatial resolution of 100 by 100 meters. Um, and this model has also been validated in various European countries, including uh, the UK. Lastly, when we received this data, our GIS technician uh, had to couple the hourly data to our participants. Um, so we coupled the data to addresses of the mothers um, and also included the fact if they moved throughout pregnancy. Um, and this way, we obtained residential level data. Um, and for my project, we converted the hourly data into weekly mean temperatures during pregnancy. So for every pregnant woman, we had temperature from week one of pregnancy all the way up until birth. For the fetal assessment, we looked at fetal size and fetal growth. So for fetal size measures, these were collected during ultrasound measurements, uh, visits throughout pregnancy and at birth. I used data from uh, during mid-pregnancy and late pregnancy, and also outcomes at birth. The metrics that we used were estimated fetal weight, head circumference, and femur length. At birth, it's birth weight, head circumference at birth, and birth length. Um, and what's nice about the measures during mid and late pregnancy is they were harmonized as part of the athlete protocol. So they were converted into sex and gestational age adjusted standard deviation scores. Um, and th that was harmonized between all of the cohorts. The measures at birth were also converted into SDS values, but this was done in each cohort separately using their own reference curves. And then we also calculated fetal growth measures, which is the change in fetal size between mid and late pregnancy. So just as a summary, for my outcomes, I have fetal size at mid and late pregnancy of the three metrics in standard deviation scores, and I have the fetal growth from mid to late pregnancy in either grams or centimeters per week. For birth outcomes, we also looked at birth weight because a lot of, a lot of the studies look at birth weight, um, and we did include head circumference at birth and birth length. However, the Bradford cohort did not have this information, so it's a different sample size. Uh, here you can see the time series plot of the temperature data um, in the different cohorts, where it's really clear that Spain has the hottest temperatures, specifically the Emma Valencia cohort, and the UK has the coldest temperatures in the Bradford uh, cohort. Quickly, some population characteristics. Um, mothers were on average between 26 to around 32 years of age. And importantly, the SES is quite different between the cohorts. The Bradford cohort on average have parents with a low education level, for example, uh, INMA, a medium edu education level, and Generation R, a high education level. Um, so, um, oh. oh, I'm missing a slide. Oh, okay. There's supposed to be a slide explaining my statistical methods. It's not here. OK, I'll, I'll see if I can explain it without the slide. Um, so as part of the data preparation, we took multiple steps. Uh, we did imputation of missing covariates, um, where we imputed any missing potential confounding variables. We included information, for example, um, on maternal smoking and alcohol use during pregnancy. And we adjusted for seasonality, for example, by including the month of conception. Um, we also performed inverse probability weighting um, by using information that was available from the full cohort at baseline and calculated a weight per subject. This is trying to um, account for selection bias. Uh, then we uh, did generalized additive models and we plotted the association between exposure and outcome to see if the association between exposure and outcome was linear or nonlinear. 
We expected it to be nonlinear because we expected cold and heat both to have an influence. Um, and because we did conclude that it was nonlinear, we used distributed lag nonlinear models, which was just explained by Malcolm, so that's nice that I don't have to explain that. Um, we used DLNMs to um, plot the cumulative associations, uh, and we did that in a two-stage approach. So we did a DLNM in every single cohort separately uh, to look at the association between temperature exposure during pregnancy and all of the outcomes. Um, and then we combined that into a meta-analysis, and we included a random effect for cohort, so that instead of having all of these plots, we had one plot for each outcome. Um, and we also looked at lag-specific associations, so looked at the association during every single week of pregnancy. But when you see the plots, it might make more sense. <laughs> Um, so for fetal size, we only saw um, one um, significant association since we also corrected for um, multiple testing on the outcomes. So we saw that exposure to cold as compared to um, a reference temperature, which was set at the median temperature exposure around 14 degrees, was associated with a smaller femur length at late pregnancy. So any of the metrics at mid-pregnancy, we didn't see any significant associations and also not for estimated fetal weight and head circumference. However, oh, no, this one first. Oh, yeah, so this is the lag-specific plot. So we zoomed in, and we looked at the association between exposure to cold um, and femur length at late pregnancy during every single week of pregnancy, 1 to 28. Um, here we saw that nothing was significant, so we found no susceptible periods. For fetal growth, we saw associations with all three outcomes. Uh, we saw that exposure to heat as compared to the reference temperature was associated with a slower estimated fetal weight growth. Exposure to heat was associated with a faster femur length growth. And exposure to cold was associated with a slower head circumference growth. So again, we zoomed in to look at the lag-specific associations for these three outcomes, and we found some susceptibility periods. For example, at the top left, you can see that uh, weeks 1 to 3 and 16 to 18 during pregnancy uh, was associated Exposure to heat during these weeks was associated with a slower estimated fetal weight growth. Um, on the top right, you can see weeks four to five was associated with a faster femur length growth. And at the bottom, um, exposure to cold was associated with um, a smaller, slower head circumference growth uh, between weeks four to 11. Interestingly, uh, for birth weight, we found no significant associations, and also for head circumference at birth and birth length, we found no associations. So some strengths strength of this study is that we have a really nice study sample in varying climates. Um, we also have quite high resolution temperature data, not only spatially, but also temporally. Uh, and we're using a quite advanced and appropriate model for the delayed relationship between exposure and response. Um, and DLNM can model the association non-linearly, so you can take into account both the cold and the hot trends. But there's always limitations. For example, a really big one is a possible measurement error in temperature exposure, because we couldn't take into account um, factors that might influence individual exposure, like uh, air conditioning, heating, time spent outdoors. Um, you also have the phenomenon of temperature acclimatization, when someone gets used to being exposed to a specific temperature. Um, and DLNM also does have some limitations. For example, it's very sensitive to parameter changes, um, and there's no specific guidelines on which model decisions you need to make. Um, I did test a few different um, model specifications, and the global curves generally stayed the same. So what does it mean? Um, so overall, we identified fetal size and growth changes throughout gestation when cumulatively exposed to either hotter or colder temperatures during pregnancy. Um, and this might highlight how optimal fetal development is disrupted during gestation. For example, in the introduction, I mentioned that temperature changes might cause a disruption in blood flow, which might influence nutrient ex exchange between mother and fetus or oxygen exchange, and that might influence the fetal growth. However, we do need to interpret these results with caution since we found no associations at birth, so that might lead us to believe that we're seeing some sort of recovery or the effect is just not big enough. Um, so future studies should explore these associations further and try and replicate this study, um, including populations as well in different climatic regions with varying temperature distributions. Um, and that might help to provide a basis for developing strategies uh, to mitigate impacts experienced by these pregnant women amid this escalating climate crisis. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I specifically want to thank all the mothers that participated in Bradford Generation R and Emma, because without them, this research is not possible. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, Esme. A very interesting study. <clears throat> so uh, we move to the next. Uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> you're over there. Laura uh, Ger Grané, how do you say it? Granes. Granes. It's difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's Spanish, <laughs> sorry. Uh, also from Barcelona Institute of Global Health uh, in Spain. So please. Okay. Um, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Laura and I'm a medical fellow at the WBJ Research um, Institute and also a PhD student at IUS Global. And I will present this project that is the first project of my PhD. So, well, again, you don't need me to explain that. Uh, as we all know that uh, temperatures in Europe and well, globally and also in Europe have dramatically incre increased in the last uh, years. But I would like to hi highlight that also cold temperatures uh, have negative effects on human health. So if we talk about temperatures and neurodevelopment in children, we know that both extreme cold and hot temperatures have negative impacts in, on children's mental health and cognition. Uh, both heat and cold uh, has been associated with seeking medical advice due to the exacerbation of anxiety and depression symptoms in young populations, also with an increase in ag aggressive behavior in children and adolescents, and especially heat with a uh, decrease in academic performance in students. And there is also evidence about long-term effects of early exposures during pregnancy or early life and the effects during the adulthood. But the potential brain alterations that are behind the association between temperatures and cognitive outcomes or mental health remain unexplored. We know that psychopathological symptoms and also cognitive outcomes are related with the brain structural connectivity. And when we talk about brain structural connectivity, we are talking about the wiring of our brain, how our brain is connected. And this is defined by the white matter um, microstructure. So as a optimal brain structural connectivity means that we have a poorer white matter integrity or a poorer white matter um, microstructure. So the aim of this study was to evaluate the association between cold and hot temperatures during early life and white matter microstructure in children, identifying periods of susceptibility. We use data from the Generation R study, which is a population-based birth court in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. They recruited more than 9,000 women and their children that were born between 2002 and 2006. And then when children were between 9 and 12 years of age, they were invited to participate in a magnetic resonance imaging assessment. And uh, the total sample size at the end was 2,681 children. Uh, for the temperature assessment, we also use the Earth clay model that my colleague Esme has explained. Uh, so the output of the model is the ambient temperature hourly for all the study period 2002-2014 at a high spatial resolution in two domains of Rotterdam. And then this data, we assign them to the participants considering the, the residential address. And we calculate these specific time windows, in my case, is the monthly mean temperature from conception until 8 uh, 0.5 years. So for each child, we had 111 temperature values for all this period between um, before the MRI assessment that was between 9 and 12 years of age. For the outcome assessment, as I said, we use magnetic resonance imaging, uh, specifically a technique that it's called diffusion tensor imaging. And this technique uh, gives us information about well, two parameters that are mean diffusivity and fractional anisotropy. I will try to explain, this is not easy, but I will try to simplify uh, how we interpret these um, parameters. So this technique, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, gives us information about the water diffusion with, within the white matter in our brain. So if we have a well-organized white matter, the water diffusion has a clear directionality in the axons of the neurons. And then we have a higher values of fractional anisotropy. Uh, while if we have a less optimally organized white matter, water has not a clear directionality, so the diffusion is in many different directions. And then we have higher values of mean diffusivity. So the adverse uh, health outcome is having high values of mean diffusivity and lower values of fractional anisotropy. Uh, we also use different covariates related with the socioeconomic status, uh, lifestyle, and also the month of conception to account for seasonality. 
Before the analysis, we also perform a multiple imputation of the missing coverages and inverse probability weighting to account for selection bias. And yeah, the third presentation, same. Uh, we also use the, the distributed like nonlinear models because these are models you now appropriate to study the delayed effects and nonlinear effects of some environmental exposures. And in my case, you can see here an example of a, th a three dimensional plot and the two dimensions and also the overall cumulative association that we can obtain uh, from the, the LNM. I will show specifically the um, predictor specific association for heat and for cold. But before that, uh, I wanted to show you uh, the, this plot, the monthly variability in the monthly mean temperature at the participants place of residence for the, uh, for the study, study period. And you can see that even if it's in the same city, there is uh, variability in, in the monthly temperature. So here um, you have the plots, the lab response for uh, the outcome mean diffusivity. And remember that the bad outcome is to have high values of, of mean diffusivity. You can see that the monthly mean temperature of 2.6, which is the percentile five of the uh, distribution, is associated with higher values of mean diffusivity compared to more moderate temperatures. And specifically, the period of susceptibility goes from the third month of pregnancy until around one year of age. And there you have an, a specific example for one of the betas at six months. And for heat, we have a longer um, period of susceptibility from the ninth uh, month of life until 2.6 years uh, for a monthly mean temperature of 20.2, which is a percentile 95. But for fractional isotropy, we did not find uh, uh, these susceptibility windows. Then uh, we decided to perform a follow-up analysis, a stratified analysis with mean diffusivity, and we stratified by neighborhood socioeconomic status. And you can see that the per periods of susceptibility only remained in the children that uh, were living in low uh, socioeconomic status neighborhoods for, for both cold and heat um, effects. And then also we certified the analysis by maternal, maternal national origin. And here you can see that for cold, the effects are only observed in children of non-Dutch non mothers. But for heat, we can observe these effects for both children of Dutch and non-Dutch mothers. So the main findings are that uh, susceptibility periods to cold and hot temperatures form in diffusivity were identified at uh, pregnancy, infancy, at toddlerhood. And this is important because this period is um, a period where the, um, when the um, white matter is um, developing really fast. But we, don't, we didn't find this association for fractional anisotropy. And cold exposure seems to affect only the more vulnerable populations, uh, while heat exposure uh, was associated with negative effects in both, uh, both groups. The mechanism that can explain these findings could be related with the activation of the HPA axis and also with systemic inflammation. And it's important also to consider a mediation role of uh, sleep because thermal discomfort can reduce sleep efficiency. And sleep is really important in, in children for the, in general for the brain development. So as the strengths, uh, I would like to highlight the large sample size considering the outcome that we are working with neuroimaging data. Also the high temporal and spatial resolution of the exposure, the prospective birth core design and the uh, methodological uh, approach. And then the limitations mostly related with the exposure assessment because we didn't have data about the indoor house temperature or temperature at school. Uh, we didn't have information either about uh, housing conditions, heating, or air conditioning. Uh, as as may also said, um, the, the lack of conventions in the DLNM, but we performed several sensitivity analyses also for that, and that we cannot um, discard the residual confounding. So, as conclusions, uh, cold and heat exposure in early life seem to have negative impacts on children's white matter development. A specific periods of susceptibility from the third month of pregnancy until 2.6 years of age were identified, and this is a crucial period for white matter development in children. 
And health inequalities have been observed in the effects of cold and heat exposures during early life. And this is important because if we want to design um, public health strategies, uh, we, we, we need to think about focus on these more vulnerable populations. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for attending. Thanks a lot for this talk. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've never heard about white matter, I must admit. <laughs> so that was really interesting. Uh, so now we are moving from, um, from uh, Europe uh, to India. Uh, the next speaker is Jeron de Bont. He works at Karolinska Institute, a medical university of Sweden. The floor is yours. Yes, good. Uh... Afternoon, nice that you are all joining, even like such a big space and less people, but it's still nice to be here. So I will uh, show today the results of the Chair India project, which is the Consortium for Climate, Health and Air Pollution Research in India, which is uh, like a group of long uh, researchers from different groups like around the globe that we have gathered information on air pollution and temperature on health. And today I changed slightly the title because there has been some changes in the last month and I will focus on extreme temperature, heat waves and health in India and uh, uh, with a comprehensive multi-city study. So I know we are here in the climate change and I think all the introductions are a bit the same, but overall we know that uh, heat events occur more frequently and also with more intensity and also we are known to have more heat wave. So heat wave is like a prolonged or an abnormal excess heat, heat exposure. And here actually there was on uh, last summer that on the same time we had very extreme heat events like in Europe, this is in Texas and also in, in, in Middle East, uh, where we have uh, extreme heat events and, um, and are known that these are like this extreme temperatures are one of the most important uh, weather related mortality uh, factors. And uh, it's not only happening here, but it's also happening in India. As we see in most of the studies, uh, actually the map from Malcolm was very nice because uh, MCC includes a lot of studies except uh, in India. And uh, we know that they have extreme events and it has also increased during the last uh, year. So you can see like there's been extreme events from 2060, 2023, even before, but there's almost no study evaluating the effects of with the relation with health. So that's a big issue. And why do we say India? Well, nowadays we, uh, India uh, um, overpass, surpassed the population of China. So it's the most populated uh, country in the world. Uh, it's also mo has one of the most polluted city. I will come back to that. And also, so they have this extreme weather events with combination of uh, unplanned urbanization, poor housing conditions, and many other factors. So it makes it so important uh, to study in India. And as I said, also the Indian uh, government has seen like that uh, extreme heat events will occur in India. So it's a really important place to study. And also the, um, that most uh, previous studies have focused mainly on specific regions or, or cities. And we know that the socio-demographic and socio-economic uh, characteristic of each city uh, varies, so we need to include more multi-comprehensive studies such as the MCC study, but also in India. So the aim of today is I will evaluate the association of high temperature and heat waves in daily mortality in India. And the abstract, if you see, it's only on temperature because when uh, after submitted we change all, we focus on heat waves. So I will show a bit of the temperature uh, association, but also related to heat wave, which is uh, what we have submitted right now. So what data do we have? So this is India, uh, according to some of the Schopenhauer classification, and we have quite a variety of cities, as you can see here, with quite a different time points, but overall the biggest cities like Mumbai, Chennai, Delhi, like the biggest cities, we have like quite a long period, and also we include the, big, the six biggest cities in India. Then we have linked daily mean temperatures using the ECMMWF, we are currently developing uh, a one kilometer grid daily uh, temperature model. We also have modeled uh, air pollution model for a whole India at one kilometer grid that we are also uh, working on. Uh, so, but nowadays we still have only the, the ECMWF, but the correlation is really high with the meteorological stations. 
So I will first, so first uh, focus on temperature, just to say that it's really preliminary results and uh, I didn't have the time to apply fancy DLM models, it's just a weighted average. Uh, but we are now currently working on DLM models. And so we applied this, like the typical approach, so first city specific association, then we meta-analyzed them, and then we, for now we have the, we done the five day average temperature and we compared um, the minimum mortality temperature with like the lowest risk of mortality with an increase into the 99th percentile. And we also, as we have air pollution, this will also be the next step of the analysis, is to evaluate some interaction that also was shown yesterday in a really nice presentation by Alexandra Schneider, I think it's her name. So we also evaluate what's the effect of temperature on low, medium, and high levels of air pollution. So this is just to say what temperatures are we talking about, so it's not uh, Europe. Uh, we have like mean daily averages around uh, 30 degrees, like in Chennai and Manila, so really high uh, temperatures, and then also some lower with Shimla, which is like uh, pre-Himalayan uh, small city. Then we have uh, like pulled as like meta-analyzed, and we can just see that we have for now very strong association on heat, like around. 28% change, so it's ratio of 1.28. And also very large variability, like we have seen like very high levels of Ahmedabad and Varanasi. And Ahmedabad is really known to have very hard heat waves. Even in 2011, there was a strong and there's a really nice paper about it. And we also have that time period in our data. And then you also have some smaller cities, uh, like also big cities like Mumbai and uh, Bangalore that have uh, lower effects. So it's a lot of variability across the cities. Uh, but just, just so for now that we, uh, we find very strong effects. And then also when we look at uh, temperature, uh, we can, uh, and the effect modification, we can see a really strong, like we can see some increase, like the uh, confidence intervals are overlapping, but still we find some trends like with high levels of air pollution to have strong effects on temperature. And this is something we will develop in the next coming year, in the next year, but uh, the preliminary results look this. So now I want to focus a bit more on heat waves. So uh, this is this arm normal uh, event where we have extreme levels of uh, temperatures. And um, so again, we applied this uh, city specific and metanalyzed association, but there's no current uh, measure like in, to define a heat wave. So this is not uh, the most, like everyone in academia and research has applied different ways to analyze it. So for example, identify for one, two, three, five consecutive days above the 95, 97, and 99 percentile. So we all included that. The initial idea was to use the definition from uh, the, the Indian Meteorological Department. But first, it is using maximum temperature that we did not have for all the, day, the, the points. So we did uh, sensitivity, and we almost find the same results. And also, uh, uh, it's based on absolute values using maximum temperature and also according to the historical levels of temperature that we don't have. We only have five years or 10 years. One thing that you might surprise, I use one day uh, also as a heat wave definition is because in India, one day can be defined as a heat wave definition. So we simulated in a way to include that. For our main purpose, we have defined like a main heat wave definition. It's not that the one to say this is better or the other, but just to have uh, like a more a better story uh, in the presentation, which is like two consecutive days above the 97 percentile. And then we also had estimated attribute of fraction, and also we identified like how intense were the heat wave, what was the duration. So we have many factors that we evaluated uh, here. And here you can see um, like a small summary, just to say if we use our definition that I told you before, we have around 168 heat waves during our period. So it's around three per year to, uh, because we have different time points and everything. And then we can see like some cities have every year like quite a lot, like four or 4.3 according to this definition. And also we have different lengths. So for example, in Chennai or Shimla Vailas, it can take up to five or more days. And then also the intensity. So the intensity is like, what is in my 97th percentile and what was the mean temperature of that heat wave? And we estimate as the percentage change because we have so many different baseline measures. So here you can see like the highest was in Shimla, which is this uh, city in the, um, in the north in the Himalayas. And also in Delhi, we have quite intense heat wave and also uh, quite long ones. 
So uh, here are just the meta-analysis results, and here you can see I uh, classify them by the percentiles and then uh, also the consecutive days. And here we can see that if you use our definition, we have a 14.7% change in mortality com comparing heat wave versus not heat wave days, which is quite heavy. Then also we see that there, there, there's an increase in effect size uh, estimates for daily mortality using heat wave definition with higher percentiles of cutoffs and longer definition. So we have stronger effects using higher percentiles and also using, long, using longer definitions. And then when we looked at the effect um, at the attributable fraction through this heat wave, we found the other way. So first we found around 160 deaths annually uh, in all the cities due to the heat wave definition that we use uh, just to ask, uh, do as an example. But when we look at uh, the number of deaths, we actually see lower number of deaths of attributable death related to heat wave when we use longer duration and heat wave definition using higher percentile thresholds. So is this both sides what we need to think about is which percentile definition do we use for heat wave, but also what impact it might have. So this famous curve uh, that you see, if you switch a bit more, it affects more the population uh, rather than uh, using really high, which is not which occur very rarely at 99 percentile, for example. So overall, we observed like uh, high temperatures are, and high heat waves were associated with uh, mortality, and that we observed that longer and more intense heat waves are linked to an increased mortality risk, where we, when we use shorter and less intense definition of heat waves, resulted in higher burden of heat wave related deaths. So this is from a more uh, policymaker point of view, like like both definition of heat waves and the burden associated with each definition should be incorporated into planning and decision making processes for policymakers to effectively prioritize public health intervention that address the present and future health risks associated with heat waves in India. So there's both sides. So just to thank you all the collaborators, it's uh, I just had a conversation uh, with um, Gaspar and I say, how do you get the data? And I say, uh, it's super hard to get the data, but we got some data, so I want to thank all the partners that have provided the data, and if you want more information, just contact me. So thank you for your time. Thanks a lot. Uh, fantastic work. Uh, let's move on now to Kai Wang from University of uh, Edinburgh. So hopefully you can find your slides. By... Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, there we are. This is the one. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Kai. Um, I just submit my PhD thesis to the University of Edinburgh, and I'm joining London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine from next Monday. Um, so I'm going to present my work on um, integrating shared socioeconomic pathway informed adaptation into temperature-related mortality projections and uh, climate change um, with a case study in Scotland. So I think I don't need to talk more about um, the impact of temperature on human health, but why Scotland? Um, so Scotland has a cool climate. It has an annual average temperature of around 7 degrees Celsius, but it has been warmed for 1 degree Celsius um, because of global warming as well. And also, um, for example, there was a heat wave occurred in Europe um, in 2022, and it extended to Scotland, reaching a record-breaking temperature of 35.1 degrees Celsius. It may don't sound very extreme to many of you, um, but because Scotland has a cool climate, so people there are less acclimatized to heat, and also society and infrastructure are less adapted to heat compared to warmer locations. So therefore, um, it is uh, important to study uh, locations like uh, Scotland, um, especially uh, considering the impact of adaptation. So to project um, future mortality burden attributable from heat and cold, um, there are three important factors um, the first one is temperature um, and the climate change. And also the population, including population distribution. So whether the heat 
uh, heat wave occurs in an area where it is where there is human populated, and also population size and aging. And um, there's also vulnerability and adaptation. Um, it affects how people are susceptible to the impact of um, temperature. So previously, um, papers that estimated future mortality burden attributable to temperature mostly um, considered temperature only. Um, so this study uh, incorporates adaptation. So the data include historical temperature and mortality data, uh, which was used to uh, investigate the historical temperature mortality association. And then uh, future temperature data uh, was obtained for uh, RCP 2.6, uh, 4.5 and also 8.5. And then there's also population data um, in historical and future periods. So in the future, um, the how, how society develop in the future is uncertain. Um, that's why we have scenarios of um, how it will develop, um, such as the shared socioeconomic pathways. Um, so the Main method, uh, firstly, I investigated the association between daily temperature and mortality in 26 um, annual rolling historical periods from 1974 to 2018. So that is, for example, the first period is 1974 to 1993, and then the second period is 1975 to 1994, and then etc. So I get the risk function of um, temperature and mortality uh, in the historical 45, peer, uh, 45 years. And then based on that, um, in the future, um, we constructed three adaptation scenarios. Um, so, and it is also uh, constructed in line with the uh, projection of the SSPs. So, um, we assumed an increase in the adaptive capacity to heat and cold under SSP1, that's the sustainable development scenario, and also no change in the adaptive capacity under SSP2 and 5. 2 is the, um, um, like, continue the historical uh, development. So it's easy to understand that we assume no change under SSP2, but under SSP5, it is the fossil fuel development scenario. So under this uh, scenario, um, it is assumed that the economy will develop fast, but also there is a lack of focus on environment and also social cohesion. That's why uh, we assumed overall no change in the adaptive capacity under SSP5. And finally, we assumed a decrease in the adaptive capacity under SSP3 and 4. Then based on historical risk functions and the three adaptation scenarios constructed, um, we assumed, uh, we applied the risk function in the historical period with the lowest risk to SSP1, and then the risk function in the latest period uh, to SSP2 and 5, and the risk function in the period with the highest risk to SSP3 and 4. Then based on these risk functions and the SSPs, uh, we combined it with population projection and the SSPs and uh, temperature uh, and the RCPs. Um, so combining all of this data, we projected temperature-related mortality and the combined RCP SSP scenarios. So we considered five SSP RCP uh, SSP RCP scenarios. Um, so you can see it ranges. It has a range of uh, low temperature increase to high temperature increase, and low. Uh, challenges to adaptation to high challenges to adaptation. And uh, the population also varies under these scenarios as well. So um, the population size is indicated by the size of the circle. 
and population aging uh, is indicated by the color of the circle. So orange circle indicates higher population aging and blue circle indicates a lower increase in population aging. And then here is the um, temperature projection under the RCPs. So you can see that under RCP 2.6 um, in Scotland, the temperature increase is just below 2 degrees Celsius increase. And then under RCP 4.5 and 6.0, um, the temperature increase is around 3 degrees Celsius. And under uh, RCP 8.5, the temperature increase is above 4 degrees Celsius by 2080s. And then uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, this shows the uh, change in the percentage of cold and hot days. So cold and hot days are the days with a daily um, temperature beyond the 10th and 90th percentile of historical annual temperature. So you can see that um, uh, there is a larger increase in the percentage of hot days than the decrease in the cold days. So it indicates um, a larger increase uh, in the heat risk potentially. And here is the result of the 26 annual rolling periods uh, in, his, in the historical 45 years um, for cold in blue and uh, heat in red. So it shows the relative risk uh, for cold. It's, it is the relative risk at the first percentile of annual temperature against the 10th percentile of annual temperature. And for heat, it is the, um, re it is the mortality risk at the 99th percentile of annual temperature against 90th percentile of annual temperature. So uh, it shows the relative risk of extreme temperature at the same extreme level. And you can see that there is a decrease in the cold risk in the last decade in Scotland. And there is, in general, um, little change in the heat risk. And then the figure below shows the uh, relative risk um, or the temperature um, mortality association under the five SSPs used for the uh, future projection. And here shows the main result. Um, the left figure shows the estimated annual deaths um, in two historical periods. So one is 1980 to 2000, and then the second one is 2000 to 2020. And also for the future in 2060 to 2080 under five RCP SSP scenarios. So you could see that um, in the historical period of 1980 to 2000, there is a automatically. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me see. Oops. I think it should be just. Uh... Um. Ah, Miriam. <laughs> Is that yours? No. Oh. Um, it is. We'll open it again. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have a pen drive, maybe. Hmm? They sh it should be here. It's a oh, okay. This is in one file. No, it's a file, I think. So, pop and dance while we go through it. So, you'll have a quick repetition. <laughs> <laughs> And if the people online also have some problems, so then they maybe they can get your whole presentation. <laughs> Sorry about that. So while you see this, you can think about questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
No, no, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Coral Salvador. Uh, I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vigo in Spain, and I am currently working in the Climate Change and Health Research Group at the uh, Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine at the University of Bern. In this session, I'm going to talk about a recent study, which uh, it, it hasn't been published yet, about the effects of droughts of different duration on a specific cause of mortality in South Africa. This study is the result of a collaborati collaborative effort of researchers from different institutions, University of Vigo, uh, University of Bern, um, the South Africa Research Medical Council, the University of Johannesburg, of Pretoria, and uh, from, uh, of Cape Town. Uh, to start with, with a brief introduction, um, as you know, climate change is currently considered the greatest threat to, to human health through increasing the exposure and vulnerability to extreme weather hazards, such as heat waves, droughts, uh, and floods. Uh, particularly, droughts is the most complex uh, phenomenon. It causes negative impacts on the environment, economy, and society, causing uh, more deaths and human displacements than any other natural hazard. However, uh, the implication of droughts in the public health field remains unclear. There is limited evidence about the, the, the association between droughts, exposures, and specific causes of morbidity and mortality, which is uh, a pressing challenge. Especially if we see the figure um, one, it is expected an increase in the duration of magnitude of drought events in the future due to climate change in several parts of the world, including South Africa. The um, estimation of the impacts of droughts on, on human health impacts is a, is a challenge due to different aspects. The first one is because there are different types of droughts. Basically, droughts is uh, gener generally uh, originated by uh, the deficit of precipitation during a prolonged period of time that is propagated across the hydrological cycle, leading to different types of droughts depending on of, of the uh, system or sector affected. And different, uh, each type of drought can impact human health through different pathways. Additionally, there is not a physical variable to measure drought uh, severity, and there are multiple droughts indices to, um, to measure this phenomenon. And finally, the impact of droughts on uh, human health uh, is, uh, are essentially indirect and accumulated over time, which makes more complex uh, the, this history. But now, how droughts impact human health? Well, there are different uh, pathways through which drought can impact human health. Through the uh, reduction uh, of quantity or quantity and quality, the reduction in the fat production, intensifying heat uh, or um, air pollution events, uh, causing severe economic losses or altering the transmission patterns of vector bone diseases. And this can lead to an increase in the risk of water and vector bone diseases, food insecurity, malnutrition, cardiovascular and respiratory uh, diseases, mental health disorders, and ultimately mortality. Additionally, the effect of droughts on morbi morbidity and mortality uh, depends, largely depends on the uh, characteristics of the event, uh, for example, uh, duration and uh, uh, severity, the exposure and vulnerability. The later is, uh, is uh, dependent on the susceptibility and the adaptive capacity of the population. But there is a limited evidence about um, how characteristics of drought events, including the duration, and also how demographic or socioeconomic uh, variables, including sex or age, can influence the drought-related morbidity and mortality impacts. Um, the uh, setting of a study uh, involves the uh, 52 district municipalities in South Africa. Uh, South Africa is an ideal region to, uh, to um, assess the impact of droughts uh, on human health because um, there is a high exposure to this phenomenon and the population has limited preparation and ad adaptive capacity. The objectives of this study are to estimate the effect of drought events of different duration and specific causes of mortality in South Africa between 2009 and 2016 and to explore the structure of the population at risk based on sex and age groups to identify vulnerable groups, which is, uh, is essential to, to cre um, create adapt adaptation uh, measures. In, in this study, we used weekly time series. The outcome was mortality. Particularly, we focused on all causes mortality, and uh, we selected a specific causes. 
uh, including certain infectious and parasitic diseases, endocrine, nutritional and metabolic uh, causes of mortality, circulatory mortality and respiratory mortality. The um, daily uh, time series of mortality were provided by Statistics South Africa, and uh, this data include uh, information about the sex and age. As exposure variable, we use the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, or SPEI, which has been extensively explored in the literature, including epidemiological assessments about drought-related uh, mortality risks. This uh, index is based on a climatic water balance through the difference between precipitation and total evapotranspiration. Um, this water balance can be calculated at different time scales that represent the periods of water deficit, or in other words, different durations of, of drought events. Particularly, we uh, calculated the drought index using the SPEI packets in R uh, at 1, 6, 12, and 15 months of accumulation to identify short-term, uh, medium-term, very uh, long-term, and very long-term droughts. Um, to calculate the SPEI, we use temperature and precipitation data uh, that were obtained from the uh, era fibular reanalysis. And we obtained the uh, district uh, specific uh, weather um, data through conducting an average of the um, temperature and precipitation uh, information of the grid cells that intersect the, the, the each district municipality. Basically, uh, I saw you a figure so in uh, an example of um, the, the drought index, the, the exposure variable. The drought index is based on um, a standard normal variable, so it can calculate both. We can identify both dry conditions, which correspond to negative values on the index, which are represented in, in red, and also wet conditions that correspond to the positive values of the index that are represented in, in blue. Um, according to the, the mean analysis, we conducted two stage time series analysis design. In the first stage, we apply quasi Poisson regression models to estimate location specific drought related mortality associations. We um, use the threshold function to um, model in the exposure um, response curve, assuming a null risk for uh, values of the index above 0 0.84 in negative. So, I mean, the, basically, the positive values that represent wet conditions because we wanted to focus on on dry conditions. And we um, we also assume a linear, a linear function for uh, values of the index up, uh, below that threshold, as in other paper. Basically, we consider that the, the values between minus 0 0.84 and 0 uh, are close to normal conditions for the reason we used as that threshold. In the second stage, we used uh, we applied meta regression model to combine individual estimates and obtain pool risks for uh, South Africa as a whole. Uh, the estimation was expressed by relative risks using as uh, reference values the, uh, the 0 0.84 uh, um, in negative value. Uh, we conducted a vulnerability assessment for all causes mortality, basically certifying analysis by sex and these uh, five age groups. Here I show you the, the main uh, results. Uh, the relative risks of death, uh, um, of all causes of death and specific causes of death, across the population groups in South Africa related to different types of drought. So uh, basically from left to right, uh, associated with short-term droughts, medium-term droughts, long-term um, long droughts, and very long-term droughts. Sorry, because I realized, oops, sorry, I realized that I I didn't put the specific names of the specific causes of um, death. Uh, I have indicated the, the codification according to the uh, International Codes of Diseases. But basically, from top to down, A00 to B99 corresponds to uh, certain infectious and parasitic diseases. E00 to E90 corresponds to uh, nutritional, endocrine, and a metabolic um, cause, causes. Uh, I zero zero to I nine nine to respiratory causes and the last one, uh, sorry, uh, the I zero zero I nine nine to circulatory uh, causes and the uh, last one to respiratory causes. Well, if we uh, saw the results in black, uh, we correspond to the total population. We found that drought increased the all cause mortality risk in the total population regardless the um, the time scale, and uh, we found larger risks for very uh, long term droughts. If we uh, focus on the uh, results in orange, uh, we also found that droughts increase the risk of, of, a, um, of a specific uh, causes of mortality, uh, and particularly for respiratory uh, mortality, that is the, is the last one, and for very long-term droughts. 
Uh, particularly, uh, we found a positive and robust association only for circulatory and respiratory mortality. According to the endocrine metabolic and endocrine diseases, uh, we found a positive and robust association um, only for medium-term droughts, which are corresponding to agricultural droughts, and also for very long-term droughts. And regarding the, the results um, associated with um, certain infectious and parasitic diseases, we found an imprecise association, but it was positive for uh, medium-term droughts and very long-term droughts. Um, we also found that uh, if we focused on the results in green and, and blue, that droughts increase the risk of uh, mortality uh, uh, across all population groups, depend, uh, regardless the, the time scale. We uh, didn't find substantial differences across population groups, but we can see different interesting patterns. For example, if we focus in, in the first column, that uh, uh, these are associated with the results uh, related to um, the shortest drought conditions, we found that the younger adults seem to have larger risks of uh, all-cause mortality compared to the oldest, eldest one. This pattern was opposite for medium-term droughts and uh, long-term droughts, in which we can see that uh, the middle of uh, older adults, the risk seems to have uh, seems to be larger compared to the uh, pre-adults and younger adults. And children were particularly vulnerable to uh, very long-term droughts. Well, this <laughs> okay, thank you. This study has some strengths and limitations. The, the first strength is that for the first time we conducted a national assessment um, of drought-related mortality in South Africa. We include specific causes of death. Um, additionally, we explore the role of different, the duration of drought events on, on the impact. We use the robust drought index that um, take into account of the influence of temperature uh, for the, uh, the estimation of uh, drought severity. And we also uh, use robust uh, study design and model. As limitation, as uh, we um, use aggregated weekly data, we can't extrapolate the results at individual level. We, uh, can't, we couldn't stratify analysis by uh, sex and age by specific causes of death due to uh, statistical power issues. I have included here another limitation is that we couldn't uh, stratify analysis by other socioeconomic um, variables. And as conclusion, we found an increased uh, the risk of all unselected specific causes of mortality associated with droughts in South Africa. The magnitude can differ uh, depending on this, the, the duration. Spe specifically, we found larger risks associated with very long-term droughts and respiratory conditions. Uh, it's needed. Um, to um, further evidence on the role of social and demographic conditions as drought-related mortality risk modifiers. And uh, the evidence obtained in this study can be useful to create, uh, to improve the adaptation plans and uh, it can be translated to preventive measures to reduce vulnerability and risk related in, in droughts in, in a country highly vulnerable to, to this phenomenon, as, such as South Africa. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Carol. Uh, um, very interesting talk. Um, so we have five minutes for questions. Um, so uh, please go ahead. There is a question behind there, yeah. Um, yes, thank you for the presentations. My name is Ida Passion. I'm a physician from Sweden. I have a question for Ger Jerome. Um, I, I was curious of, uh, maybe you didn't, but, but, but did you look at the age um, um, disaggregated uh, results in India? Because uh, in, in Europe we see the high age as a risk group, but the demography in India is quite different, I think, with a quite young population. Do you know anything about this from your study? Yes, that it was not possible. We have only occult mortality for everyone. And uh, it's already too difficult to get the data and stratify it uh, would be even better. But hopefully in the future we can do it because it's really important, yeah. 
So thanks. congratulations with even getting all cause mortality data. <laughs> well, thanks to all the people who worked on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there other questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, you have a mic on. Oh, yeah, yeah, it works. Um, so I have a question on uh, relative humidity. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you get the mic. So in your study, the effect of humidity on temperature mortality uh, varies by the correlation between temperature and relative humidity, right? Um, so, but relative humidity itself has a component of temperature, and then you study the correlation between temperature and relative humidity. I also wonder, uh, have you considered using humidity rather than relative humidity? And you also cited the recent paper by Baldwin. Uh, I think they advise uh, using humidity. Specific humidity as well as Absolutely, yeah. Um, so that's a good question. I don't think we looked at, um, when we did the random forest, we had 12 features. And uh, we had relative humidity in that, along with latitude of the location and um, GDP, for example. And uh, the among those 12 features, it was the correlation between the temperature and relative humidity, which essentially tells us that, as I mentioned earlier, where we find negative correlation, as we expect in relative humidity and temperature, in those places, it appears that the air temperature is accounting for the, the diurnal variation, and therefore the air temperature itself is a good predictive variable. But in those locations where this correlation is very weak or even slightly positive, it appears that temperature on its own is not good enough to account for this combined heat stress. Uh, if the paper comes back for uh, revision, and I'm sure <laughs> that will be possible, I think uh, we can try to look at even the location specific, um, specific humidity, absolute humidity to include in the random forest model to see if that makes it. But that's a good suggestion, thanks. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, my name is Nikolaus. I'm a medical doctor and master's student in public health at Karolinska. And my question is also to Jeroen, but all everyone um, basically involved in this talk. So uh, super nice to have some data, which we've probably all been waiting for from India. Um, and my question is on how can we improve data availability and quality in low and middle income settings, as we all know that heat waves are already affecting those countries way more. And even though those countries have been exposed to heat over a long, longer period of time, and uh, heat is generally a problem there, and people are more adapted to it maybe, uh, we have seen in the projections from yesterday and even today that uh, these countries will suffer from heat much more. Um, so um, I have worked myself with uh, cancer and cancer registration in sub-Saharan Africa. So I know that this funding is scarce and people need to like really do the work and extract from files. And it's like really tedious work compared to like electronic data collection etc in Sweden for example um, so I know about the the difficulties but when it comes to like environmental epidemiology what opportunities do you see thank you so uh -huh. I don't know if I have a clear answer for that but probably the first one will be funding no to increase funding uh, for some charity yes actually a Swedish format funding that uh, allows to to do these studies in India, so try to get more collaboration in this sense. And uh, also there needs, to, for example, in the case of India, more political will because it's they have the data in their in their registry, in their census, but they, it's really hard to get them there and they're not willing to even open it because it's a really sensitive topic, especially there. So there must be also some other will that we can hopefully 
with pressing these studies in India that we're getting the first results, like saying there's a problem with air pollution, with heat wave, that it, there can be more general knowledge and that in the future it will be more accessible, hopefully. If I may just uh, add to that very valid point. Um, so I originally come from Mumbai, from India, and mm -hmm. I know how difficult it is to gather this uh, data, even from my city. I've spent a lot of time trying to convince them the health authorities who have this data. Uh, I've explained very clearly what is the motive. I think the timing was a bit wrong in my case because it was the end of COVID period. So they were pretty much reluctant trying to see that I'm trying to criticize their response uh -huh. to the COVID. But in spite of explaining that this is purely related to climate side of things, um, it doesn't work uh, very easily. I think one way to circumvent this problem um, is to get sort of uh, local heat action planners or somebody like that involved in the project because they seem to be having this access to the data and if there is a way to get them involved in the study through funding as you rightly said um, then there is potential to expand uh, studies to these uh, uh, regions um, but there's no clear answer there's no easy answer unfortunately for this at least from my point of view Great, thanks a lot. I suppose uh, this difficulty with data is on two levels. The countries do have data but don't want to share and there are other regions that they don't really have high quality data at all. So that's even more difficult. So this is something to work on to, to uh, encourage uh, countries and health ministries, etc., to uh, collect data and uh, make it show that it might be useful in, uh, in, uh, for their own benefit. So uh, with this, I end this session. Uh, thanks a lot for those of you who attended and gave uh, nice talks. So a big hand to everyone. Can, can I have attention, everyone? You are going to hear a very calm and soft voice. I have not had no voice since morning. I've saved it, saved it for now. That's why you did not see me for the entire day, not being on the stage, uh, because somehow these special guests, they are invited by us to be present with you. You've been listening to probably the um, Anvil project and what all different research and innovation we are all doing. But here, all of us together are present to give you a very different approach that European Union also has envisioned along with the kind of wonderful work that we all do together. And I have the privilege of sharing with you all uh, the panel session, which is called Health Impacts of Climate Change, a way forward with the Climate Health Cluster. I'll introduce the cluster, then you'll have the honor of listening from each project coordinator for around three to four minutes. We are challenging ourselves to be prompt as we like our students to be and try to keep the time so that we can give you as much possible in the little one hour we've been given. So we are a cluster uh, where, let's say first why the cluster has become a cluster. It's a Horizon Europe cooperation, six European Union projects, I think the biggest thing is to address climate change induced health risks and health preparedness and also promote synergies. This is who we are, six projects together, 114 partners, 30 countries. This is what we together represent in front of you. This has not been a simple fleet. To coordinate us all together, we ID Alert, I have been the past coordinator for this, October 22nd until June 23rd, June 2023, given the task to set us all up the operationalization. I think we did well, and we handed over it to Klimos, which is currently now doing. So this is the six projects, Catalyze, High Horizon, Loop, Blue Adapt, Trigger, ID Alert, Klimos. And together, we are working on some of the objectives that probably are not so straightforward, but somehow are pretty straightforward as well. And it would be 
bringing the evidence-based decision-making that you've been trying, that we've been trying, the health impacts, the capacity building, which probably is another way of looking at what we're working, and one health perspective. This cluster is a bit strong on that perspective. And I'm not sure how much I've been able to emphasize on that, but somehow you will hear about that as well. And on top of that, maximize the communication and dissemination. <clears throat> Overall, we want to provide scientific evidence and policy-related advice to contribute to a more resilient Europe and beyond. And I hope in the next three and a half years that are left for us as a cluster, we are able to build some things together. We divide ourselves in these working groups, and each project has given two to three members to each working group. You've been listening to different IPCC reports to different kind of countdowns. This is another countdown that EU has started for climate health. And we've done th quite a lot of work together. Just have a look. Working groups were initiated. Deliverable means lots of work that goes together from a working group. Communication and dissemination strategy. When you don't know each other, when you have a lot of different agenda, but you have to still bring it together, that gives a lot of um, burden on certain way of thinking. And we've done that well. By the end of one year, together we have five deliverables. We are very active on social media. And I can tell you we were here 15 minutes before uh, on the podium, smiling and ready to be in front of you, which also means a very collaborative space where we are running together. This is our cluster website. If anyone gets curious, please uh, visit. You will get all the information that's going to come from these six projects together. And with that, I will also like now to bring us together in the projects so you hear about them, you can listen what they are all about, and then we will have a small q and session from our coordinators to uh, get something more out of that. So may I now um, invite uh, Mark Newman from Blue Adapt to please share your presentation. Thank you, Raman. Welcome, everybody, to this afternoon's session. I'm briefly going to present the first project, Blue Adapt, which is centered around the health risks in coastal zones. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the climate change impacts on coastal pathogens and how that in turn affects uh, health of humans, animals, and the ecosystem at large. We've got 12 partners in Blue Adapt, from uh, academia to national institutes of health and climate and SMEs. This is the uh, project flow setting the scene where we conceptualize health according to a One Health uh, framework, where we speculate on the social, demographic and economic drivers and where we compile the climate data, climate information, and where we're doing also some dedicated uh, climate modeling. Then below that, we have a natural sciences work package with the first block on experimental work, where we look in the lab laboratory how various climate drivers, such as temperature uh, changes, salinity, pH changes, can impact bacteria and viruses. We do this in more uh, artificial settings and then in more uh, natural uh, environmental settings. Then this is fed into models of high resolution transport uh, uh, modeling of transport in coastal zones. And then we go into more application uh, based aspects of case studies where we illuminate different uh, issues into evaluation, health impact, risk assessments, into tools for early warning systems, and then we take this into policy, advice, training, and dissemination. We've got eight different case studies uh, illuminating different aspects. You see some, the first two at national level, that deal with early warning systems for pollution in coastal waters, really real-time forecasting. 
Uh, then we have some looking uh, at algal blooms and shellfish uh, impacts in the Eastern Scheldt in the Netherlands. We have two case studies in Italy uh, concerned with uh, pathogen spreading and sampling methods. An economic case study in the Baltic uh, coast looking at how effectiveness of information changes behavior in uh, beach use. And then two more wider case studies on adaptation in general and uh, on in, in one, the last one that I show you here, where we'll be de developing uh, a living lab on the northern Spanish coast, on the Basque coast. And so you see here, we're bringing it down to ground where we go in, into this, these uh, uh, villages uh, close to Bilbao. Uh, it's quite a small catchment, but it brings together all the different pressures that we're interested in. You see, you have a wastewater treatment plant there, a hospital, squid fishing, an artificial reef, a lot of uh, pressure of tourism in the summer, and a river catchment, you see there at the bottom, uh, with a lot of livestock activity in the catchment. So this becomes, this whole region or catchment becomes a living lab where we uh, ground uh, the theory that we've developed before. And here you can find some more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, with that, can I invite uh, Catherine for catalyze, please? Um, so I'll just say uh, a few words to give you an overview of the uh, scope and activities in the Catalyze project. Uh, the website is listed there where you can see much more detail about the project and particular some of the case studies um, <clears throat> in, that were um, developing in the, in the project. Um, essentially, Catalyze aims to answer three questions. Uh, firstly, how to optimize health in climate change mitigation and adaptation in Europe how to close the knowledge to action gap to accelerate climate change action, and how should European health systems adapt to climate change and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, on, uh, on this slide, you can see uh, a sort of flow uh, diagram of the main activities in, in the project. Um, we have a consortium with 21 partners that includes uh, research institutes, universities, SMEs, uh, government agencies, particular meteorological agencies, and, uh, and HEAL as our main civil society partner. Um, and to give you a bit of an idea of the sort of main activities in the Catalyze project, there's a strong focus on uh, indicator development. Uh, some of that work is linked to the Lancet Countdown in Europe, which I, uh, I mentioned yesterday. Um, but there's a lot of additional indicator work uh, going on to map out what are the most important uh, things, that indicator areas that we should be looking at in terms of climate change and health in Europe. Um, and how do we develop the, the uh, novel data streams to uh, enable those uh, indicators? There's a very strong focus on the health co-benefits of climate change mitigation. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work at sort of uh, economy-wide uh, mitigation and then uh, much more deep dives in specific sectors, for example, in buildings, transport, uh, and agriculture and food systems. Um, we're developing a number of early warning systems and uh, uh, predictive models to, uh, as novel surveillance um, that are covering uh, a, a range of topics, uh, so heat health, but also things like active travel utilization in Europe. Um, there's a very strong focus on knowledge translation. So how is evidence on uh, climate change and health used in the policymaking process? How do uh, things like communication and framing of different messages around climate change and health uh, promote engagement and behavior change at the individual and institutional level? Uh, and then we have a work package focused on health systems, uh, specifically uh, adaptation, um, what, what adaptation strategies particularly focused on vulnerable groups like outdoor workers, uh, as well as uh, mitigation in the healthcare system and developing training uh, for health professionals covering uh, these topics. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Catherine. Um, Susanna, would you go please? Thanks. Um, 
so I have to change. Okay, all right. So I'm going to present the project Limos. This is this is our complete title. Uh, the, our project is centered about uh, around one vector, and uh, which is sand flies, and then sand fly borne diseases. So different diseases that that sand flies uh, spread, uh, and this is essentially the, the 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 main idea and the four main uh, parts of the project so the first one uh the uh, what we will do is the, the that we are doing actually throughout the project is, is sanify uh, and pathogen surveillance uh which is um, um a systematic uh big field work that is uh, going around in 12 countries uh, and there is a list of countries and i would just uh, told today that uh, we are going, we are doing trapping, so we are doing sand fly catching in over 200 sites uh, in these countries. Uh, we are going to do that systematically over two seasons. So this year was the first season, and then next year is going to be the second season. And then uh, all the partners that are doing trapping, they're also going to do uh, the the identification of the pathogens, but we also have that in, in, identifications put together in three reference labs. One is for Leishmania parasite, which is in France, and then two for Toscana and Sicilia flavoviruses, which are in, in Italy and France. And then in this part, we are also going to do canine and human sera surveillance, vector competence for pathogens examinations, and also we're going to develop some microcrement and trapping devices during this process. So then the next part of the process is uh, early warning system development, or what you called data analysis modeling and digital tool development. And in this part, you're going to have an open database with all the past pres and present data of the sand flies, pathogens, diseases, climate, environment, and socioeconomic variables that we are going to collect. The we are having three modeling approaches to one health and climate, which are env environmental niche and species distribution modeling, then using ML and AR for data mining, and then a time series analysis for, for cross-correlation modeling, and then uh, while producing the early warning system, which is actually going to be, I mean, it is actually a climate service, we are we're going to have a three forecast time horizon for sand fly risk, so the one of the, that is like present with a few days, and then for the next few months, and then with the climate change. And also, unlike other projects that are dealing, you will hear a lot with the de developing indicators, we are not doing that, but what we are going to do here, we are going to develop ontologies, so machine language for the for the central borne diseases uh, and the climate and then we will have a part that we include the social and economic sciences approaches to helping assessment and here we are going to do a look into the impact of future trends or our on our early warning, early warning system with a steeped analysis and then co-develop scenarios for health impacts and then one uh, we will do economic uh, assessment of the economic costs uh, with uh, assessments of productivity loss and disability adjustment life year calculation and affected number of people, and then at the end, cost of benefits analysis. And finally, we are doing all this in co-creation with end users, and um, the most important end users is actually our three partners that, that are three national health, health ministries of Italy, Turkey, and Israel. So we have them already within the project so that we can try to not only co-create with them, but also try to... Um, uh, see the adoption of our methods and our knowledge into their uh, uh, inner systems and through their inner system, hopefully also to the inner system of the World Health Organization. And then we have stakeholder engagement of various other levels. And also we are going to do co-creation with affected local communities at the sites where the trapping is being be performed because we have this, this large field service going on. So this is most, I mean, this is the the scheme of the project and then this is us uh, or part of us we are quite a big project we have 29 partners from 60 countries we started in the preparation phase with 90 researchers we now have more than 100 researchers and uh, just last week we were having a first annual assembly so we are now entering the second year of our third year project thank you so much <laughs> Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, sit down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for still being here towards the end of the two days. Um, 
I will be uh, introducing the High Horizons project, which is the Heat Indicators for Global Health. Uh, I'm the project lead, and um, we also have the uh, deputy um, project lead, uh, Deborah, who will speak a little bit later. And so the um, High Horizons project is actually a consortium of 11 institutes. We have six um, European institutes, actually three from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, one from uh, the UK, and they are separately funded through UKRI, um, and WHO is also one of our partners. So with three African institutes in our consortium, we have a substantial amount of our uh, implementation and project also focusing on uh, the Global South. And this is my last slide. So the project um, High Horizons is uh, centered around the effect of ambient heat um, and how that affects pregnant women, postpartum women, children and health workers. So these are really our four sort of target uh, populations. So the project has um, uh, five objectives. Um, so the first one is actually a new objective that we attracted through a separate application process called the HOPON. Um, which is an initiative from the European Commission to also engage uh, partners from the widening countries. And so in our case, this was um, uh, the addition of a, a Greek partner, University of Thessaly, um, that we added this objective. Um, and the Greek partners are really uh, sort of investigating the biological and thermophysiological uh, pathways on how heat affects um, pregnant um, postpartum women and children. And so they are setting up a, a birth cohort of 500 uh, mother-infant uh, pairs um, and assessing a whole range of um, biomarkers related to, uh, to heat and better to understand how heat impacts the health of uh, women and children. So our second um, objective um, is around the development of an um, indicator, again, for um, uh, how heat affects or impacts on um, maternal and child health. Um, so we're working very closely with the World Health Organization, who have set up an, a WHO uh, expert group who will be selecting these indicators, and we are providing them with uh, data out of systematic reviews, um, as well as analyzing large data sets um, from Italy, Sweden, and Greece, as well as from the Global South in South Africa and Kenya. So our third um, indicator is the development and testing of an um, early warning system. And some of this work has already been presented earlier today, um, which is the um, CLIMAP MCH. Um, and so to develop this, we are at the moment um, trying to develop the messages and working in all these different settings in uh, Sweden, uh, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Uh, the messaging uh, with these early warning systems will need to be extremely different. Uh, we're also working in different settings in South Africa and in um, uh, urban setting and in Zimbabwe in a rural setting. Um, so the fourth objective is um, focusing on health workers, where we are developing an integrated adaptation and mitigation intervention. Um, so we're co-designing and adaptation interventions with health workers. Uh, we're currently doing thermal sort of simulations, thermal modeling of health facilities um, um, to better understand uh, the heat environment that health workers are working in. We're also measuring carbon emissions um, at these health facilities and uh, have been working on a, uh, a modeling tool that we have named Carbomica, which is a, a resource allocation tool for uh, making choices around these mitigation uh, interventions. Um, and then lastly, we have um, an objective around um, supporting global and EU uh, climate policies and uh, activities. So let me leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you very much. Um, can I invite you, Jan, for ID Alert? Thank you. Thanks, Rahman. So I'll be presenting ID Alert here. Um, this is what it stands for. Um, it's a project that's actually based in Emeo, and the concept here is where we like to use the one health approach, where we're trying to look at animal health, human health, and environment health together to look, get closer to that risk assessment, and we would like to frame that into the IPCC concept of um, 
vulnerability exposure and 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 hazard the framework that Jan presented earlier from IPCC it's the way that that we look at uh, climate risk from this IPCC framework and you can see that the panel on the right <clears throat> illustrates the climate hazard and then you have this exposure and vulnerability that modulate that risk and then you end up with the risk at the very bottom and in fact this is um, the reference for the paper that Pooja mentioned uh, yesterday in fact it was just published a couple of um, a couple of um, uh, months ago in Lancet Regional Health and so this is the framework that is that, that's the way we want to look at it and the the um, approach that we have decided to take here is to develop in oops develop indicators um, for the Lancet countdown that that Catherine presented uh, yesterday and we uh, develop these uh, indicators with modeling and we, we rely on virological data entomological data illustrated here on this panel up here on the right where we use citizen science where people mail in photographs of mosquitoes and we use machine learning and image recognition trying to classify what these kind of mosquitoes are um, so um, machine learning and ai as you can see here and then we also develop early warning systems and this one here is an early warning system that alexandra mentioned uh, this morning the vibrio tool that gives forecasts for bacteria that live in marine environments and we would like to improve that um, um, early warning system with sub-seasonal forecasts and then we rely on surveillance data to monitor um, 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 the current situations for these type of early warning systems and we would like to tap into citizen science data as well with a focus on on health inequalities and then we have six different case studies and um, one case study is based in Bangladesh where we look at dengue fever we have a case study in Heidelberg in Germany where we look at the expansion of Edus albopictus at the potential risk for arboviruses in in Heidelberg we have a case study in Greece where we look at West Nile fever <clears throat> we have one in the Netherlands where we look at Zutu virus and West Nile uh, in Rotterdam we have two case studies in in Spain in Girona and in Barcelona where we look at expansion of Edis albopictus and we're trying to intervene in an urban environment by trying to eliminate habitats for mosquitoes by retrofitting drains storm drains in the city by eliminating the water so we are basically retrofitting this Drains, so there's no water that that accumulates in the drains, so those mosquitoes can't breathe in urban settings. And then we have um, <clears throat> um, a case study here in Sweden that's headed by Anna here in the National Veterinary Institute, looking at ticks. And in this case, we are also using citizen science, where people can ma mail in uh, photographs of ticks, and we are particularly interested in invasive uh, species of ticks, like Yoloma uh, ticks that have now shown up here in in, in Sweden because um, the potential um, impact of public health of these different uh, tick species. And so then the idea is to weave. Uh, together these different streams of the indicator development for these climate sensitive infectious diseases and we, we um, uh, take these four different streams um, to feed into the policy uh, process to make these type of, of data available uh, uh, available for the policy makers because as you know in Europe we have the Green Deal EU for health and the EU adaptation strategy again that uh, Alexandra mentioned uh, this morning and ID alert is planning to provide data for these policy frameworks to improve our preparedness and and um, um, uh, response capacities in Europe for this uh, infectious disease threat events in Europe and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Um, can I have a last speaker, Silvana? Trigger, yes. Like, uh, like <laughs> always, you're the last. <laughs> I'm always the last. Anyway, um, as a, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, you saw, and uh, we will complete uh, the round table here on how six projects responded to the same call, okay? So it was a competition, we won the competition. Basically, as you will see, there are common elements. And it has been uh, also instructive for me to see how my colleagues uh, have addressed uh, the problem. And now we are here together to see, after the competition has gone, how we can take the best of our project and work together. Because we have a common problem here. I'm. I'm coming from the climate sector, not the health. 
Okay, so uh, as you can see, and uh, I will go in a moment uh, to illustrate uh, trigger, um, the approach might be different. Someone, uh, uh, when uh, my colleagues that preceded me talked about risk, started uh, from the vulnerability. I would start from the other, okay? So this is already fascinating. And this dialogue is uh, something that probably in the future uh, will uh, enhance uh, our way of tackling a common problem. It is really, truly interdisciplinary. Coming to us, the interpretation from, you know, from this side of the world, although we all have uh, different experts, uh, medical doctors, epidemiologists, uh, uh, data scientists, uh, climatologists, etc., etc., is the solutions for mitigating climate-induced risks. Okay, what it means? <clears throat> well, this is uh, everyone did their own work uh, that put us to be successful, uh, and our interpretation is that. Uh, if we talk about a system, we need and uh, we would like to really advance the science evidence. There is not one way and there is not one route to do it. Okay? Our interpretation is uh, first of all, uh, disentangle the major elements of the problem. And this one side, the climate, one side is the, the uh, health and the policy actions. They need to go together. But we have four years, three, from three to five years, to work together and advance what? We could study air pollution, uh, UV exposition, and also uh, our, uh, uh, our key element for the diseases is a cardiovascular. Uh, diseases uh, and also respiratory diseases uh, attached to what? To extreme events. So for us, uh, for instance, the target is uh, to really understand what a heat wave means uh, at personal level. So to go from the major projection and to customize uh, the tool at uh, uh, personal level. How do we do that? Of course, uh, it has been already mentioned, this is not my area of expertise, but we adopt in, uh, uh, in um, uh, trigger the actual uh, framework with all the elements. So uh, an important component uh, that uh, in investigating then the effect of extreme heat on uh, at personal level on the health condition is also to target the health life the, the lifestyle and then in the end we would like also to provide guidelines for uh, the usage of the environment where we are. And this uh, uh, environment uh, the, that uh, we will uh, study, uh, this, uh, I don't have time, so there is uh, the website uh, if you're interested, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, we have five clinical studies at a three different level, uh, including patients, normal citizens, but also there are retrospective studies, epidemiological studies, where we try to understand if there is a predisposition from the DNA according to a revisitation of what happened to the history of uh, the various uh, uh, people in the, uh, the exposure they had during their life. Anyway, too many things, but this is the last. Uh, I try to, uh, there are lots of things we cannot, there are here, uh, as uh, in uh, the previous uh, project, there are more uh, than, uh, let's say, around 100 people also working on this. So uh, we have three elements that will, ask, will help us to uh, anticipate, to estimate uh, the impact, and also to formulate uh, some uh, mitigation actions. So the project will really work to give a recommendation to how to adapt and how to have a better lifestyle through a series of elements uh, that goes from uh, laboratory, let's say, testing, numerical models, and also the design of tools. Again, what uh, is different and uh, in integration with what you heard before is uh, that uh, for us, the structure of the city 
uh, where a, a certain uh, group of people work is uh, rather important. So in the, in the investigation of the vulnerability, we take into account also the granularity or the distribution of vulnerable people within a certain latitudinal zone. So this is, uh, the, our cases is, uh, are placed in Crete for Mediterranean, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and Finland. So try to cover uh, different latitudinal band, but also different uh, uh, hazard, uh, let's say, different uh, hazard that will be uh, different in a future climate and also different uh, socioeconomic uh, setting. That's it. And I really thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, we are here. You will hear from us. And next time, probably, I hope that we will uh, uh, present some study, some advancement, some scientific advancement yes. that is the result of uh, the integration between us. Really, thank you. You can, you can keep this. Thank you, Silvana. I did not in introduce them properly because they would introduce themselves. So now that they've done that, we are going to do a little Q&A because I have some questions that I want to ask. Probably those could be the questions you would have wanted to ask as, as well. So it wasn't just like giving them the idea that we present. Um, it is a difficult space to be when as a collaboration you have to find out your commonalities, also work on your synergies and create next steps, what we can prepare. And I think Silvana said very nicely that hopefully next year we can present what work we are doing together and not just how we are trying to find each other in our commonalities. With that, I would like to ask first question, <clears throat> um, probably to you, Susanna, not that you're sitting closest to me <laughs> somehow. Um, what is expected from this cluster of projects on climate change and health? And where does CLIMOS contribute most? Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I have to tell you that, uh, I mean, uh, this morning I was thinking about this and then I wrote it down together with my friends and colleagues from, from projects that are sitting here. And our coordinator who is facing there, Carla Maya, because I'm just one of the co-coordinators of the project. So I wouldn't like to improvise, so I will read it to you. And then, of course, we can discuss. It's a short one, but but anyways, like not to miss anything because everything is important. So the Climate and Health Cluster is established to address climate change and use health risks and health preparedness and adaptation. To do so, the projects that form the cluster would collaborate to increase the excellence and the reach of its individual re research and innovation actions and broader as much as possible the societal and policy impacts of such research and innovation. And as you just saw, individual projects have visible similarities and outstanding differences in their approaches to problem of climate and health. And where they are similar, the path to reaching the multiplication of knowledge and impacts is almost obvious. For example, collating the modeling activity and early warning system development in each project can produce the best possible result for the European societies. Then similarly, the cluster can multiply the impact of the really phenomenal work of our individual communication teams to help us reach all possible effective individuals and communities and to spread our messages, recommendations and results to the broad spectrum of responsible stakeholders that need to take action. And finally, what I, what I think is really important, the differences that we have between the projects will reach with, enrich each individual project within the cluster by offering access to the knowledge and approaches that were origi originally not included in, into the project themselves. And in that case, in that manner, Climus, for example, can offer to the cluster its vast, vast database of new records that will come out of our two field campaigns that I just talked about. And the other thing that we can do, it can, we can also specifically contribute to the cluster's policy adaptation strategies by offering access to the three health ministries that are our partners and sharing our understanding of the needs of this specific and very important stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, interestingly, you said around the individual agendas and also how common we work together, right? So from there, I, I would like to ask you, Jan, uh, what are the most significant drivers of adverse health outcomes uh, in relation to climate change and how can we 
minimize their impact. A good question. So the question is, where do epidemics come from, right? So that, that is the question. And uh, particularly for the alert, the thing we're interested in are these infectious disease threat events in Europe. And we, we have looked at that empirically. We have used uh, epidemiologic data that's out there to assess the underlying drivers of these kind of events. And we know that 61% of epidemic events in Europe are caused by global environmental change. And so that's basically globalization, which is traffic and you know, air passenger volume, um, but also climate change, migration, and things like that. So we have hard data that documents that's what it is. Climate ranks in the top five of, of that, that hierarchy. So we know that globalization is an issue and we have experienced COVID-19 and that's exactly what happened in Europe, right? It was the importation from far away where these, these pathogens came. But then also climatic suitability is another factor that we're interested in in ID Alert. And we know that that is a driving force of the, the spread, the onwards transmission of not COVID-19, but other uh, pathogens that are spread as a result. So we are looking at global environmental change in general in the emergence of these uh, epidemics and pandemics. So I think that's fascinating. And I think with this, I also want to share, I'm a part of Idea Lot and Catalyze as well. So when we go to Catalyze, we'll ask a kind of maybe interesting, difficult question. Let's see. So for next, I want to go to you, Mark. Um, you talked about, you know, you have a very fascinating space for us in terms of marine, coastal, you know, uh, region that you bring. So what do you think is the special, like, spatial scale of research in this cluster, like local, national, global, and which environments are being studied in total? How do you understand that? Yeah, th thank you, Herman. The, the, the advantage of uh, having a cluster, working as a cluster, allows us bringing results together at quite an early stage and we're not waiting for all projects to finalize to be able to start also comparing and learning learning from combining the information we have and so um, this gives us the opportunity that we're studying if we take all the case studies we have which i don't know the total number if we sum them all up uh, we are covering uh, the space of europe uh, quite well and in addition, also, we're going beyond that with the case studies in sub-Saharan Africa and Bangladesh. So that's the, the domain we're looking at. And we're also covering quite well different environments. So I mentioned the coastal environment in Blue Adapt, and, uh, which also requires the connecting of neighboring environments. So in Blue Adapt, the open ocean with the river basins. And then in the other projects we're looking, uh, including uh, urban, peri-urban, peri rural uh, uh, environments. And then we also heard that what we saw that we are covering many different scales and that's quite important because different, at different scales we need different actions. So we mentioned also that we moving beyond uh, epidemiological views also into more physiological views. So where we're looking at impacts on uh, single individuals and so having that across different projects, across different uh, scales, we can learn quite a lot, bringing all this uh, knowledge together. Yeah, that sounds very well, because I think when we looked at, at least from my point of view, when we started to work together, it seems we have a lot to learn from marine spaces, because that's not something I'm at all aware of. So thank you so much for that. Um, with that, Silvana, to you. Which methods and tools being developed will support to estimate, anticipate, and mitigate the health impacts of climate change? <laughs> it's a difficult. Uh, you have seen already that uh, uh, all model, uh, all models, <laughs> all uh, project uh, has uh, development uh, of numerical models. You have heard already that uh, uh, several groups are working on early warnings, for instance. You have also saw that uh, we work on uh, sub-seasonal uh, also type of forecasting. What means this? That the idea is uh, that will be different tools. So different tools could be conjugated in apps, but also uh, platform, interactive platforms, for instance, uh, customized by user, 
So the typology of user will be very important because access to those tools need to be customized if one is a local authority, if one is a, a hospital, if uh, it's an emergency room, etc., etc. The idea is uh, to have before ahead and uh, in uh, um, in um, at the state of art and beyond uh, to push those models to be really usable by everyone working in the health system to anticipate what could be the danger in order then if we have this information uh, we can also prepare for mitigating the possible effect of course we cannot uh, uh, prevent uh, the occurrence uh, of a heat wave, okay? Mm -hmm. The climate change within the, the life course of the project will not, will go, will do what it has to do. Of course, what we can, we can do to be prepared to adapt, okay? In the meantime, have also an understanding of which mitigation we can do in terms of emissions, et cetera, et cetera, that goes together with the usage of the resources, and then uh, suggest according to uh, the various contexts that we cover in the project, specific suggestion for adapting to the uh, effect, negative effect on health. It's very broad. Of course, uh, this is a difficult question. Let's stay at a high level. And again, maybe we can have uh, one session only on this, uh, the yeah. next conference. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. Indeed, it is a difficult question. Um, from that difficult question, we move to you, Catherine, <laughs> to simplify a bit. <laughs> So how are we going to, through the cluster, be able to advance the science with all the big things we are talking on climate change and health? What's your point of view? Um, yes, thank you for that question. I think there's a lot of really exciting work that's going on at the project level, but what we're trying to do at the cluster is to um, sort of go be beyond that or add to that by um, trying to identify where um, together across the projects we can share cutting edge research approaches, methods, results um, to really identify um, important knowledge gaps and uh, and areas where we need methodological development uh, across some of these common uh, tools and methods and, and topics. Um, so we're uh, thinking about, uh, you know, in developing the scientific strategy for the cluster, how best to do that. We have uh, different approaches that we'll take, but some are um, focused on thematic workshops where we can come together as a cluster to uh, really uh, take a sort of deep dive into some of these more methodological issues. Um, so some of those will be at the cluster level, but hopefully in some instances we'll be able to sort of go uh, broader to the, the wider community because I think many of the things that are relevant here are of um, you know interest to a, a broader community as well. But um, it's really trying to focus on uh, you know where we can exchange uh, research approaches, uh, methodologies, data, and, and insights, um, as Mark was saying, before the projects are over. We can start doing this now, basically. Thank you, Catherine. I think that was a very um, nice, way of <clears throat> nice way of presenting. So I know I sound very funny, and I also know that I've wanted to do this for quite a long time with all of you. Sometimes when you have uh, thought of something, it all comes here. So yeah. probably that's what uh, <laughs> it's all about. And bringing them all here wasn't easy, guys. So having all these six or seven people, actually. So I'll introduce Tebra, who is together with San Stanley, the co-coordinator for Higher Horizon. And we have the privilege of having them both. We've never met before, at least Tebra I have met. So having them both here is another you know, thing for us at Anvil. So Tebra, you have a last question. Then we'll open floor. Yeah. What are the way? <clears throat> so, what are the ways in which the results of this work that we are working together be communicated? And is there anything different we will do for better outreach? Okay. So, is this on? Thank you. Um, I, I realized uh, that I'm actually the last speaker of this meeting. <laughs> um, so, first, I 
talking about communication, talking about policy space, I want to congratulate MBEL as a pathfinder for the climate and health um, uh, for policy action, both with this meeting and last month's uh, policy forum in uh, Brussels. So I wanted to thank them. Um, as everyone's mentioned, we are very large. We cover a lot of af geographic area, a lot of different topics. So that's sort of to start. But how do we come together um, thinking about policy? Um, and is really, we have three key words, four approaches, and sort of three processes. So I'm going to talk about those quickly. The three key words are translation, implementation, and action. So we want to see our research translated to policy and programs at the local, national, regional, and global levels. So you can see that we're not regional, not just regional Europe, but you can also see the nice view of the little, um, wherever that was, on Balbo, you know, very local approach to what we're doing as well. Um, the climate has to, we want to go belong, beyond those traditional deliverables of peer review and policy briefs and whatever. We want to do implementation and action. So those are our three key words, translation, implementation, action. What are our approaches? We have four. One is engagement. And um, I, if you were in the one of the sessions earlier today, you saw that Catalyze um, had major engagement in Catalonia across all kinds of stakeholders to develop a theory of change for to develop net zero health facilities. So engaging the, the stakeholders at whatever level we're working. Co-creation, we heard from uh, Jacob uh, this morning on our uh, Climap, um, MCH, and Stanley, and how with these completely different environments, we're going to have to work with the local mothers, the local communities, the local health workers to co-create the messages so if they get a little alert, tomorrow's going to be hot. We don't tell a mother who, you know, five miles away is, is water, oh, drink more water. That's not helpful. How are we going to adapt those messages? And we need to work with them. Co-creation. Indicators and monitoring. Um, I think that was something you saw through everybody. But, you know, for example, both ID Alert and Klimos are working on various um, monitoring of vector risks, mosquitoes, all of that, citizen science as well for co-creation. And finally, tools for action. And um, Silvana talked to you about some of the tools we're doing, but the key word there, once again, is tools for action, tools that would actually help people to act. Finally, we have our policy processes. Um, just to note that um, I'm an implementation scientist, and um, this is what you get when you have an implementation science scientists lead your policy strategy. Um, one, it's uh, we have a science for policy strategy, which will be posted probably by the end of the year, but we expect it to be a living document as we go along, changing it, improving it. Policy implementation, usual advocacy, education, legislation updates, but we're looking for multi-sectoral integrated approaches. And um, uh, my colleague and friend uh, Claudia asked in the morning session, well, is HEAP becoming a vertical program? No. We might have specific disease or exposure focuses, but we expect broader impact because we're all working on adaptation and mitigation. You know, so if it's zero, zero net, you know, net zero hospitals, or if you increase ventilation to reduce heat, you're also going to reduce um, indoor air pollutants. So that if there's, we expect our our implementation, our actual actions to cross all all fields. And finally, policy evaluation. Um, once again, using an implementation approach, what are the policy and program changes, no matter how small? We um, Remembering that we are working at global, regional, national, and local levels. And I always like, my one of my favorite phrases is, think global, act local. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And I think Deborah was prepared in a different way. Mm -hmm. We made her prepare differently. <laughs> so thank you so much for the way you've shared. Um, I have a surprise question for all of us. I'll want you to pick one thing. <laughs> so you should get some surprise, okay? <laughs> Not that we'll talk about it. When I've been moving around in different sessions, I heard um, somebody very profoundly saying that it seems uh, here, here in this conference, we are more talking about adaptation mm -hmm. and not about mitigation. Mm -hmm. So I want maybe ask each one of you where do you belong? Not that you have to say one or two, you could be both. But I just want to hear from you so that in this group we can share. It's not about this or that. So where do we stand? So I would start with you, Deborah. 
how do you say it? Are you adaptation or mitigation? Um, high horizons, we would consider both. As you heard, um, Stanley, our, what's one of our objectives is both um, adaptation, particularly for health workers adapting to heat, but also looking at um, net zero carbon in our health facilities. Thank you. So let's keep counting how it goes so that we don't go out seeing either on <laughs> catalyze. So in Catalyze, we're, we're also doing both, um, but I think with there's a very strong focus in Catalyze on mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. I know some projects are talking about mitigation of risk, um, but uh, and this is uh, really trying to respond to the policy landscape in Europe, uh, what's going on with the European Green Deal, uh, what are the, the targets in place for uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, and how can we really inform the way to get there that optimizes health, uh, mo health most effectively. Um, so both, but there's a lot of mitigation going on. <laughs> Lovely. Um, Mark, what would you say? Well, um, two parts. First, mainly adaptation. <laughs> However, as I showed in the presentation yesterday, and myself as envi environmental engineer, uh, the Royal Road is what we call source control. So, of course, we don't want to adapt. We don't want to be made or think to be adapting to a, a three to four to five degree world, but to a two degree world. So the main the main action is a rapid reduction of of greenhouse gases. So. I think that is for any adaptation study, that's the, has to be the starting point. Love you. Thank you. Jan? Um, I mean, for in, in, in public health, adaptation, the synonym term in publication is prevention, right? Adaptation and, and, and prevention is the same thing. And so for ID Alert, we're definitely working on the prevention part and trying to build early warning systems, better surveillance systems, maybe better response. So we are in the adaptation camp. You know, I wish that we in public health would have a bigger impact on the mitigation side of things to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but that's in a different sector, like the energy sector, the transport section, all that. We do public health, so it is prevention, it is adaptation. Lovely. Silvana. Uh, okay. Uh, similarly, uh, as the others, the two things, adaptation mitigation, I have to go together. What is, it, what, uh, uh, is important to understand is the scale. If you have five years in front of you, probably you could uh, do more on adaptation. This doesn't mean that... Uh, um, influencing the policy, for instance, because it is uh, to have uh, really a mitigation that uh, maybe in uh, 20 years uh, will change the climate, okay, because there is an inertia. You don't do things today, now, and will change tomorrow. No. <laughs> the, the, the way the weather and then the climate adapt is very long. So, at the same time, we work on urgency, that is adaptation. So Trigger works on that with an eye on mitigation by what? By, by introducing that change maybe through the co-design. We also have Living Lab approaches, co-design and solution developed with locally uh, according to the needs. Then. Uh, looking at lifestyle. Lifestyle that may have a limitation because you live in a city that does, doesn't allow you to do better. So, but in, initiating that, uh, how to use, uh, to reduce the carbon footprint. We use that word, the carbon footprint associated to the daily cycle of each people. So we, in, a, in a way we tackle also that. Thank you. We are counting, right? So maybe the good thing of having uh, two people representing one <laughs> project means that you can count yeah. <clears throat> it double. Um, but maybe just to sort of add is that I think what High Horizons is really trying to do is to have an integrated adaptation mitigation approach. Um, and I think, um, so this is really around health facilities um, uh, and for health workers that we are uh, thinking through, but also trying to find interventions that uh, could do both. And maybe creating some green space around uh, <clears throat> facilities um, where there may be some carbon offsetting, but also creating some space that keep uh, health workers um, some um, cooler. And so thinking about some of these co-benefits uh, of the various interventions, I think is really important. Lovely. Silvana. 
Well, I have to say, I'm absolutely sure, just adaptation. <laughs> I mean, I, I can think about theoretical arguments for, for mitigation, but actually the, the whole project is really systemic approach to actually preparing, mostly looking at One Health systems to uh, effectively and quickly uh, react to the vectors and vector-borne diseases that are not just coming, but are actually here. I mean, the, the central borne diseases are endemic in, in Mediterranean. And I have to tell you, yesterday, the taxi driver that was taking me in, in, in Frankfurt told me that his his young child uh, got a West Nile uh, virus from being bitten from a mosquito in Frankfurt. So we are not talking about Mediterranean anymore. So what we want with this project is uh, to try to do our best to help uh, health system and veterinarian system prepare uh, for, for the in, this, in our case, but generally for, for, for the vectors coming and vector-borne diseases. So yes, adaptation, absolutely. So even even if we prepared for some, <clears throat> some kind of relay, but this question was a surprise, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we know how many of us are adaptation <clears throat> and how many mitigation. We are more adaptation, less mitigation. But still, we are going to work together, which means it, we are working on it together, right? And that's going to be probably next, whenever we meet. So keep an eye on us. Are we fulfilling either or? Or we are improving either or? And also, I think I want to share that <clears throat> EU has given us this mandate. But I think we are taking this mandate as more or less some things we'll enjoy doing together. and. With some of the, Deborah very nicely talked about, and well, you know, policy conference and the science conference, we put this together as a way forward. Um, before I say thanks and we completely wrap up, any question we can take from the floor? Yeah. She was first. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for presenting your respective projects. I think it's it gives hope to see uh, so much, uh, such a big collective organized uh, effort in the right direction. So uh, looking forward to the next years. And uh, my question focuses on the, perhaps on the implementation side of your respective projects as thinking that this is a collective effort where in, if I'm not mistaken, in each one of the projects, there has been mention of developing tools, developing some form of guidance for healthcare workers, for example, or healthcare systems. And knowing, I mean, as a healthcare professional myself, I, I'm a, trained as a medical doctor. Uh, I mean, I know, and if, you, if there's other colleagues as well, you know, healthcare professionals are very busy. Uh, it's, it's increasingly difficult also given the situation of our healthcare systems to absorb more information, to uh, do more actions, right? Because the, the workload is so big. Um, but your respective projects and climate mitigation and adaptation are so important to include. So my question is, how can we, do you have an idea of how your respective efforts could act in synergy in order to optimize the effort of producing those tools and to make them relevant to healthcare professionals? If several projects are working on a heat, for example, uh, how can we not end up with three apps and um, different guidance for healthcare professionals on the same topics? Um, so yes, uh, looking forward to, to your thoughts uh, on this a little bit. Thank you very much. We basically try to put you out of work. So we are working upstream, right? So we're working with health departments and trying to stop people from getting sick in the first place to put you out of work. That's our intent. So we would like you to relax and come back on the vacation scheme next time when you're out of work because <laughs> our interventions have worked. So we would like to work upstream and put these tools into, into the hands of public health professionals so we can intervene early to prevent from people getting sick in the first place. That's the intent. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, although the question was, uh, uh, hope you would end up with uh, five apps, so uh, just or five tools. So the idea is to work between us in order to choose one direction. Of course, this is something difficult to to promise in the sense that each project is an individual project, let's say, that have a specific mandate and a specific uh, deliver. I mean outputs that has to deliver, we are trying to design from the beginning to not duplicate the effort so that if we go for an app, maybe we could find a consensus that is one app. If we go for, uh, let's say, a specific way of having early warnings uh, outputs, not because the model can be different. We have we try to give one recommendation on one product so that we don't generate confusion. The idea of synthesizing the outputs in policy briefs, it's it's this one. So we don't give recommendation. Each project gives his own recommendation. Okay. The idea, if you have a topic, heat or extreme cold or whatever, uh, we try to come up with a consensual response based on the work that we do in the specific project, hopefully. Yeah. Really? You can test us next year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay, I will be really short because my colleagues already said everything, but this is not a, a finished process. This is actually the beginning of the process. So translation of science to policy and practice, as it is called, it is going to be our next strategy goal for, I think, several years. And for this, we need like uh, the dialogue with, with health systems and everything. And also what is really important and what we need to do in, is inclusion of the social sciences because social sciences are going to be this uh, transferring uh, partner that are going to help us actually uh, make results, tools, and um, and messages yeah, that are yeah. actually needed by the people and also needed by the health systems. So we are just the start of that. This is great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nicolas. I'm also a medical doctor. <laughs> um, first, I want to ask all of you um, renowned um, environmental and climate scientists, can you really put us uh, health professionals out of work? I highly <laughs> doubt that, given the protections and uh, given that our governments are failing the Paris agreements. And this is basically mm -hmm. what I want to ask. Um, so a lot of people are talking about failure in leadership um, causing climate change and, well, making us breaking the Paris Agreement. Um, and we've talked about uh, projections and we've talked about uh, adaptation a lot, but I highly doubt that we will be able to adapt to an ever heating planet. Um, so my question is, how can these actions that you mentioned in your final statement um, be scaled up? And I think that health professionals are very at the core of any society and we are those that can lead. So how can these projects empower health professionals who are so many in Europe, millions in Germany, where I'm from, for example, how can your projects empower us to take leadership in climate action, both um, concerning mitigation and adaptation? So really scaling up, not only action, but scaling it up, multiplying it. Thank you. So if I could get back to that. So basically, in 2003, there was a big heat wave, right, here in Europe that kill, killed 70,000 people that we know based on, on XX deaths, right? It turns out that after 2003, a lot of heat health action plans were put in place in Europe, where a lot of cities in Italy prepared for the heat impact, a lot of cities everywhere in Europe. And so heat-related mortality went down. And then 2022 happened. And guess how many people died in 2022, last year? It was the hottest period ever recorded in, in Europe, and 61,000 people died. Nobody talks about that. How is it possible that 61,000 people die and nobody, none of the politicians address this issue? So I'm totally with you. We need your help. So I'm not trying to put you guys out of work. We need you guys. So these heat health action plans that have had a great impact in heat-related mortality are not enough. 
we are not having an impact. So I'm totally with you. We need everybody at the table. We need to take politicians. They need to take a leadership role to address this issue. <laughs> uh, may I add something? Uh, can I, Raman? Can I add something? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, this is a, important. Uh, we are uh, apart of the profession we do. We are citizens, no, and we have right to have a good planet, a good health, and this is very important that everyone is. Uh, in this agenda, talking about our project and how we scale up and uh, the challenge uh, we tackle as a scientist, most of us in, in the project, is to try to understand a bit better of the relationship somehow. When we talk climate change and specific diseases, do we have a hope that we understand a little bit better? And uh, then uh, the scale up will be done through multiplication of engagement and uh, of involvement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are many elements to scale up. Again, this depends on the uh, on on the sensitivity and also the capacity of certain uh, of our politicians to take. Uh, uh, on board uh, uh, and to set up the priority that may be different in country by country. So we, we need to continue and hope that uh, scientific knowledge, the more we understand, the more we spread the word, will uh, help in having a better informed society that might require that implementation. So. It's a, a process, will not happen uh, within a two, three years. It's, it's a process. I think we are <clears throat> hitting time. So what I want to suggest is <clears throat> maybe we should talk. I'm an oral health professional. <laughs> I'm a dental professional. Been in this game for 20 years in climate change for different reasons. I think also one of the trained who's done clinical work in lim limited in resources and how do we actually mitigate these things alongside adaptation? It's very different. So no one can put anyone out of work. We need to create and co-create our work together. So from this cluster, we are going back with hope, uh, hope of we all work together. So even if our medical professionals come, I think yesterday we discussed we, we are doing lots of things. We need to empower you. We need to empower ourselves. No. And I think we need to empower a younger generation more than just keeping things with ourselves and talk. So with that, I would like to thank each one of you. Please excuse my worst voice ever, but I think I held the show together with smiles on you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So may I hand over to you, Christine, or Hans? We are on the last ends. We want to thank each other. So please, Hans. Thank you. Luckily, I'm not the final one. Uh, I have a feeling we just started, didn't we, yesterday morning? And uh, it has been such a good two days, very efficient. Uh, you know, there is always very important to rem re remember something for the conference. Uh, I'm quite sure you remember the dinner and the folk dance. But uh, this is a scientific conference, you know. Not only having fun, but also getting to know something. And now we have a couple of exercises you have to do. Uh, first, you have to think about uh, what new did you learn? What could be the take-home message for you? So just think about one minute on that.
Uh, I didn't count if it's minute or a bit less, but in general, that was the first exercise. Now it's more complicated exercise. Now you have to think about what's the thing, what you will do on climate change and health if you get home. Uh, okay, and now comes the uh, most complicated exercise. Now you have to tell your neighbor what you will do, because then it will be more efficient. <laughs> Uh, okay, seem, seems there is a lot of things going on and you will work really hard. Uh, but just to remember, there is uh, another very important thing. Shh. Sorry, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. You are just really keen to work on the things. Uh, but I'm not sure if you mentioned one thing, and that's maybe most important, and that we have to do together. So that this conference on climate change and health wouldn't be the last one. So that's the thing we have to do in next year's, because that's a really important thing. And, and we can do that not alone, that we need everybody's contribution. And it has been such a good contribution from you, because it's not only us, it's the presenters, the people that, who come here and make it happen. Thank you. Okay, hey everyone again. Um, I think you pulled that exercise off pretty well. Um, that was good. Thank you, Hans. So um, on the behalf of the whole organizing team, I just want to thank all of you for joining the conference. Uh, you um, on-site people for getting here, sharing your work, important ideas, asking questions, and uh, inspiring discussion. And also, of course, the online uh, participants who have stayed many hours in front of the screen, hopefully very interesting hours, uh, but still, and working with the chat system to uh, post insightful questions and uh, contributing to the conference in that way. So, um, so this conference was on connecting health and, and climate change. And, and what this really means is that we are connecting people and, and project, right? And I think thanks to all of you, this uh, conference was successful in, in achieving this. So with that, thank you all for joining and making this uh, a really inspiring meeting. And uh, I will leave over to Christina for a few final words. Thanks. Thank you, Hans. So very few final words. I'm sure many of you are quite exhausted after these two long days. Um, I'd just like to say that I think it was a perfect ending for the last session with this climate and health cl cluster. It was really interesting to see your plans and your uh, 
objectives were really close to the NBEL objectives. So I feel that uh, you are actually kind of taking over the relay stick from NBEL because we are ending early next year. And I'm sure we will be in touch with many of you. So we look forward to collaborating with you, all the partners in the NBEL uh, project. Um, Hans, you touched upon it. Was this the this is the first health and climate conference. This is the last one. I'd just like to say that uh, from all the enthusiastic uh, messages we have got during these two days, um, we will work really hard to make this be not the first and only, but uh, to have some kind of continuation. I think this is uh, this has been great. Uh, success we think that and I hope that you agree with us on that so we will work hard to make this continue I need to extend many thanks to a lot of people <clears throat> Hans and the team of students uh, from Tartu uh, and uh, Henrik Junven and Raman from uh, Umeå University they have been leading the organization of this uh, um, conference here in Stockholm um, and we have a great technical team uh, Elizabeth I use only first names now because we have been there for two days so I hope that you have uh, met each other and we have a uh, Charlie and Anders uh, back there uh, helping out with the uh, digital things Jocelyn other colleagues <clears throat> helping out on the technical things uh, we also have, I uh, would like to extend my thanks to NBEL partners um, and advisory board members who have participated in the organizing committee and in the scientific committee behind the conference. Uh, coming from CISRO, I really also need to thank my colleagues at CISRO, Miriam, Gunnel, um, and also uh, Eric backstage in Oslo. He has done a quite uh, invisible to you, but a really big <laughs> thanks to Eric as well. Uh, and Sigri, so we are the, what we call the NBEL management team. Uh, so thanks a lot for being such good colleagues, um, making it much easier for me as a project leader. So uh, finally, I also would like to extend my thanks to the EU Commission through the Horizon 2020 program who has funded NBEL project. So with this, um, I also have some practical things, uh, the abstracts from the different talks, they will be available at the NBEL website. Um, and um, finally, very practical, those of you with the poster, you need to go into the poster room and pick up your poster quite soon or immediately after we end now, because they will clear the room. And by that I say thank you. Um, it's been a great two days and thanks so much for your contributions in all kinds of way. And Goodbye and safe travels back home.